Ah, thank you. Ah, I don't hear anything from the index funds. Where are they? <laughs> it really feels good to get back and be doing this in person. We've, it's been three years, and uh, uh, it's a lot better seeing actual shareholders, owners, partners, and uh, we, we uh, Charlie, Charlie and I are now a, a combined, uh, we've been around for fractions, uh, the two of us are 190 years old, and, uh, and I really think you're entitled if you're the owner of a company and you've got two guys, 98 and 91, running the company, you're entitled to actually see them in person. I mean, <laughs> I, 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 it, it, it really shouldn't be too much to ask that, uh, I mean, for example, if we had a, we had a manager someplace that was 98, I might want to send somebody by occasionally to see whether he was cutting about paper dolls or something. <laughs> so so uh, we probably do things that are a lot more foolish than cutting out paper dolls, but, but, uh, but we're having a lot of fun doing it, and, uh, and we really have a lot of fun uh, when you come visit us. At, uh, uh, actually, uh, we had uh, to go back a few years, We've had a couple, uh, a couple of managers that uh, that suffered from dementia. Probably many more, but I mean, I'm just a couple of known ones actually. And <laughs> and, and uh, uh, there was one fellow that Charlie and I really loved, and uh, uh, he, he ran a business for us. Charlie was out in California. Charlie would see him occasionally, and I, I didn't see him, but. Everything seemed fine, and, and then we found out that he'd really been suffering uh, uh, from dementia for quite a while, and, uh, and he really was a wonderful friend of both of ours, but, but the business had done fine, so that's become our, our test, really, is that <laughs> for new businesses. And we, we, we try to find something that a guy with Alzheimer's can run, actually. And, and, uh, <laughs> uh, and, and you don't have as much competition for businesses like that. <laughs> guy sitting there cutting out paper dolls, and you know that's our man. <laughs> uh, I'd, I'd like to uh, introduce uh, two fellows who really work at Berkshire. On Charlie's left, Greg Abel, who runs all the uh, operations outside. Yeah. Next to him is, uh, I, I ran the insurance business for about 15, 15 years unsuccessfully, and then fortunately, the fellow on the far left came in one day, I don't have written about it, but he came in on a Saturday, and, and I was opening the mail, and uh, he said that, uh, that he'd be happy to run our insurance business. I said, have you ever run an insurance business? And he said, no, and as I mentioned, I said, well, you know, I never won one either, so I'm not doing so hot, so <laughs> give it a try. And, uh, you know, he tr transformed Berkshire Hathaway, and a G. Jane is here with us. <laughs> what we'll do today, and I have to remind myself from time to time that the people here, of course, saw that movie and everything, but of course, we're, we're webcasting, the, so I'll probably make some references to the movie or something that'll puzzle <laughs> millions of people out there, but you'll get it, so. <laughs> We're going to uh, talk for uh, a little while about uh, what's happened uh, uh, in the last quarter and bring up a few other things that you might be interested in. We will then, uh, whenever that's finished, uh, we'll go on to uh, questions, and we will take the questions until noon. We'll break for an hour. That's uh, Midwest time for those of you who are watching in other time zones. We'll go on until noon, and uh, uh, we'll break for an hour. And then Charlie and I will come back, 
and we'll take more questions uh, until 3.30, and then we'll convene the shareholders meeting at 3.45. We'll take a break for 15 minutes, and, and, uh, and then we'll do the shareholders meeting, and when that's done, we'll all uh, go our various ways. Uh, I do want to report, incidentally, that uh, uh, you've been doing your part in terms of the room we have adjacent to this uh, location, uh, where we've been yesterday for five hours. From noon to five, we had 12,000 uh, shareholders come and just spend money on everything we could think of to solve them. At, uh, <laughs> We brought in 11 tons of seized candy. Uh, and uh, <laughs> if we don't sell out, Charlie and I get the rest. So, uh, <laughs> but, but you did your part. She's, she's sold more. They set a record yesterday for the Friday afternoon meeting. And, and it's, uh, it's, pre it's pretty heartening, yeah. But, uh, incidentally, I've got a box of seized candy here, and uh, uh, it's very, it's, it's sort of interesting. On this uh, cover, which I hope you can see, um, there's a picture of a woman who was born in 1854. And today, she probably gets her picture seen more often than just about any any woman in America in terms of uh, a, a commercial product or something of the sort. So we've got our picture up in over 200 stores and uh, uh, on every box of candy. That's Mary C., born in 1854. A lot of people think this is me in drag, but that is not true. I mean, uh, uh, there's, there's a certain resemblance, but uh, it, it's just not... Uh, these rumors are started by our competitors. Don't pay any attention. <laughs> well, that's our schedule for the day. And what we will do, we like to give all, we like to give shareholders, uh, owners, uh, partners, we like to give everybody the same information at the same time and preferably do it when stock markets aren't open. It seems to us that that's, everybody ought to be on the same playing field. It's very interesting. Uh, we don't know how many shareholders we've got. They've changed the, the rules over time as to uh, registered holders and getting stock certificates and all that sort of thing. So, so we can't keep track of it like 50 or 75 years ago where we had an actual shareholders list. But we're told by the people who mail out our information uh, it's a firm in, I think, New Jersey. Uh, uh, let's see, Broadridge. Uh, and they pretty well do this for a very significant percentage of American corporations. So they, they actually mail things out for us, and they bill us for three and a half million accounts. I'll take their word for it. I mean, the more accounts they bill us for, we pay them by the account. So, you know, I, I, some days I feel like I'd, I'd like to count. But that, that, is a, that is a lot of, a lot of people that trust us. And, and they've rightly, in my view, overwhelmingly feel that they're our partners. Uh, and some of them will like reading the financial information they've given us, uh, that we give you. Uh, but most, a, a great many of them just say, you know, we've saved this money and we trust you and Charlie. And that's a great motivator, this trust. And, uh, you know, take care of it. And, and I'm not gonna learn accounting and try to read all those statements or anything of the sort. But we do believe that for those who do use the information we release, they should all get it at the same time. And we have a few institutions that even though in the third paragraph of my letter every year, I uh, refer to the fact that um, we want to have 
everybody get the same information and that we don't feel that anybody's entitled to special meetings. We can't hold three million special meetings with our partners. And, uh, but we like the fact that everybody gets the same deal. Everybody gets the same information. Up this morning, uh, on the internet, we put up uh, our 10Q uh, for the uh, quarter, and I'd like to uh, take a few th through a few comments on that, and uh, and a few other comments, and then we'll get to the questions. When we get to the questions, we will alternate between those mailed in by shareholders, which uh, Becky Quick at CNBC and, and people who have helped her have sort of curated to <laughs> get what they think are the most interesting questions from shareholders. They're not from, the, from CNBC itself, but they are from shareholders, owners. And we'll alternate the ones from sent in versus the ones that come here. And we don't get the questions ahead of time. And we enjoy getting surprised by, and I'd say, almost all questions. And we will keep doing that, like I say, with a break for lunch until 3.31 we'll have the meeting. So I would like to uh, start by putting up the uh, first slide, which is Q1. And there we have it. That's what we published this morning. And there are really no great surprises in terms of the quarter. I mean, there, there are always some companies that are doing very well, and there are some companies that aren't for one reason or another. And in the end, as you can see, we prefer to use something called operating earnings. Now, that is after depreciation and interest and, and taxes, unlike other companies that prefer to tell you anything but what they earned. We have a, but we do separate out capital gains. Now, over time, as I've said, over the next 20 years, I would expect us net to have more capital gains than not. But, you know, who knows? I hope you, you know, I, I'll report to you in 20 years whether that's <laughs> happened or not. Uh, but as you can see, we made about $7 billion in the first quarter. And that's real $7 billion. I mean, we, the, we basically have that in, in cash when the quarter's over. That isn't true every quarter exactly, but, but uh, we are talking about $7 billion of, of real money in that. And those managers who the people here saw in the movie, they're the people that work with your money to uh, accomplish what Charlie and I never thought would, never really planned or anything to happen, but it just sort of uh, came about. Uh, uh, was sort of putting one foot uh, in front of the other. Uh, now, obviously, the last two years in particular, including the first quarter, there have been all kinds of unusual things happen in our various businesses. I mean, it, uh, uh, when we had the meeting, uh, two years ago, in the, roughly the start of May of 2020, we didn't know what was going to happen with the pandemic. We didn't know what was going to happen with the economy. And, uh, and everybody that thought they did has gotten all kinds of surprises since. But here we are in 2022, and, and Berkshire, like I say, had $7 billion of operating earnings. and. We've got lots and lots and lots of companies. We've got 360,000 people out there that have taken your savings and uh, go to work every day. And they have jobs. We deliver products, and you put up the money for it, and you deserve to. You took the risks, and, and uh, we feel very good about how things have turned out, and we want to keep feeling good. And uh, we have a extreme aversion uh, to incurring any permanent loss with your funds. You know, it, if, if I went broke, it wouldn't really make any difference. I mean, it, it, uh, I'd keep doing what I do. I'd figure out a way to read a paper and 
watch a little TV and, and think about things and talk to Charlie. And, but the idea of losing permanently other people's money, uh, people who trust us, uh, really, really, uh, it's, it's, that's just the future I don't want to have. And as Charlie says, uh, Charlie says, all I want to know is where I'll die, so I'll never go there. And uh, <laughs> um, uh, that seems pretty sound. <laughs> um, he has Works a way so of. Far. Yeah. <laughs> Works so far. Uh, in case you missed it, Charlie says it's worked so far. And, and uh, the. Uh, uh, and we, we would die psychologically uh, if we lost a lot of other people's money. We wouldn't take it in the first place. It'd be crazy to take, take people's money and lose it if you're going to feel terrible about doing it. So the one thing I can tell you about Berkshire Hathaway, I can't predict what our earnings will be, and I can't predict what the stock will do, and I can't... But we don't know. We don't know what the economy will do and all of that sort of thing. But we do know that we wake up every morning and the, we want to be safer in terms of your eventual investment. Uh, not whether you make the most money or anything, but we do not want you to get a terrible result uh, because you've uh, decided to become our partner. And uh, that's a pleasure we'll live by. Now, let's see what we have here. On uh, Q2, it gives some indication of that because we, and this is kind of interesting. I wrote a letter to our owners, and it was dated February 26th, and that was a Saturday, released. But I write the letter all through the year in my mind. I mean, it, it, uh, I don't, uh, you know, we don't have a, anybody that sits out and writes out the letter or anything like that. I mean, it's, this is a letter between partners, and I, I write the letter all year in my head. I'm, I'm, I'm writing next year's letter. Uh, I don't write out the words, but I, I have things I want to tell my partners. My sister's a partner, and uh, I'm writing to her in my head. Uh, my older sister died not too long ago, but I used to be writing to both of them, in effect. And I want to tell her you know, what I think and, and, and uh, about the business and what I think she ought to think about it and so on. Uh, uh, so the letter's dated February. 26th, and I said, not much is going on. And actually, we might jump over to Q3, if we will. Uh, uh, so I sent, I sent out a letter on February 26th, but it, that wasn't written on February 26th. And I said, basically, nothing much is happening around here. And I said, we've repurchased some shares, and uh, we just aren't seeing anything. And between January 1st and February 18th, as you can see, we spent $2.2 billion, which is half the quarter, you know, so probably 30 trading days in there. And we sold them. So that basically, we didn't do anything. And then uh, in the next three weeks or thereabouts, we spent $40 billion. Incidentally, when I say we spent $40 billion, there's, there's one fellow in the office that does this all. I mean, he buys all the stocks. He buys the government. Buy. He doesn't have an assistant or anything. I just... Uh, but he spent $41 billion at, uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, and he, he literally, I mean, it, 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 uh, and he does other things for me, too. He you know, puts together totals. He, it, it, he just does what he needs to do, and he's worked in other jobs at Berkshire long ago, but, but he, likes, he likes doing what he does, and uh, he does it very well, and we don't have a department for it. Then, as you can see, it fell off after that, and... We did also, in the first quarter, we spent about 3.1 or 3.2 billion, somewhere in that, for repurchasing shares. And uh, we didn't, you know, we, we talked about that in the annual report. And uh, as Charlie would say, it, would, it was keeping us out of bars. I mean, you know, that, that, that uh, gave us something to do. We never do anything that we don't think adds to the value of Berkshire Hathaway, though. So we only repurchase the shares when that is the most attractive thing to do. We haven't repurchased any shares at all in April. And uh, uh, so it's people who were looking for all these uh, prints in the, you know, foot, footprints in the woods and all that is what we're doing. We're just doing it day by day as it comes along. And I think 
this table kind of illustrates that, that we spent 40 billion in a hurry there between three weeks and, and uh, now we're back somewhat in our more lethargic mood, but that, anything can change at Berkshire. But the one thing that won't change, going back to Q2, if you'll, is we will always have a lot of cash on hand. And when I say cash, I don't mean commercial paper. When 2008 and 2009 financial panic came along, we didn't own anybody's commercial paper. You know, we didn't have money market funds. We, didn't, we have treasury bills. And uh, as I may get into a little later, I'll explain to you why. We believe in having cash. And uh, there have been a few times in history and will be more times in history where where if you don't have it, you, know, you don't get to play the next day. I mean, it, uh, uh, it's just, uh, uh, it's like oxygen, you know. It's there all the time, but if it disappears for a few minutes, it's all over. So we, our cash was down on March 31st because as you saw, we spent that large sum uh, there in that brief period during the quarter, 40 billion. Uh, we've committed to buy Allegheny Corp. Uh, something over 11 billion. And, uh, but we will always have a lot of cash. We won't, we don't. Some of our companies have bank, bank lines. I don't know why they have the bank lines. We're better than the banks and we, we'll give them the money if they need it. But, <laughs> but you know, the local bankers have been calling on them and they, uh, they need something to do. Everybody else has bank lines. So, uh, it, it's harmless, uh, but our, there's no reason for any of our subsidiaries uh, to have bank lines. When, when Berkshire is stronger than the banks that they're. <laughs> uh, I didn't hear exactly what you, I, I don't know whether that was a banker screaming or. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't really like to torture, I don't like to torture anybody. I mean, <laughs> but. but uh, and I'm all for banks, and we'll talk about that a little later. In fact, uh, we, might, we might even talk about it right now, just for a minute. It, it, uh, money's kind of an interesting thing. It, uh, <laughs> people seem to like to talk to me about it. I mean, they don't, they don't ask me how to dance or anything like that, but they do they ask about money. And so, uh, if we'll put up, uh, 20-1, uh, it's a, um, it's a photo of a $20 bill, and it says at the top, Federal Reserve notes. Now, Federal Reserve note, we, we've done all kinds of things with money in this country. It's amazing, a country only a couple of hundred years old, the number of different experiments we've made with banks and everything. But we finally just decided to put, let the Federal Reserve do the issuing of money. And uh, uh, the, uh, down in the lower left-hand corner, incidentally, I think Rosie Rios, uh, who signed this note, I think she signed more, more uh, US currency than, than uh, any other person in history. Uh, so if you see Rosie, you know, you cozy up to her. I mean, this is a woman that has issued a lot of currency. Uh, uh, but it says, it says, this note is legal tender for all debts, public and private. And that makes it money. You, you can go in, you can go into our candy store, and if you offer us enough bushels of wheat, we'll probably give you a box of candy. But, but money, is the only thing that the IRS is going to take from you. It, it, uh, you can you can offer them all kinds of uh, you can offer them paintings, you can offer them all whatever. But this is what settles debts in the United States. And I thought that you'll hear a lot about various kinds of money. This is the only kind of money uh, you're going to see, uh, in my opinion. Uh, throughout your lifetime or even throughout Charlie's lifetime. I mean, it, it, this is, uh, uh, 
Uh, it's very interesting because it, it just says that uh, settle all legal tender for all debts, public and private, and nothing else says that, except I thought you might be interested in seeing uh, another $20 bill, and this one I own. Uh, uh, and on that, it's got the same guy's picture, Andrew Jackson, and uh, everything. Uh, and that's a $20 bill, and that $20 bill was issued during my lifetime, and it was done by a bank that Berkshire ended up owning. So you'll see the Illinois National Bank in Buster Rockford, and uh, uh, we bought that bank back in 1969, and if you look down in the bottom of that one, it's signed by a fellow named Eugene Abegg. And we bought it from Eugene Abegg. So we, uh, we still have some $20 bills that came in sheets, and we can cut them out like paper dolls. And they're our money. Uh, the Illinois National Bank issued money. But just remember, the United States government, in effect, said that this became exchangeable for lawful money of the United States. That, that's what money is. It may turn out that it becomes worth dramatically less in purchasing power. Uh, it can become almost like paper money, as it has in many countries. But that is all. When people tell you that they're issuing new forms of money, uh, this is the only thing that will pay bills uh, under some circumstances. And there were, there were days, a few days, in 2008, and we came very close to having a repeat in March 2020. And uh, uh, we had plenty of money on March 20th, uh, but we were not very, very far away from having something that might have been a repeat of 2008 or even worse. And we have a bookstore here, uh, but the bookworm that's in the other room, and they've got a book uh, called Trillion Dollar Triage. And for those of you who actually like to read about this sort of thing, it's a marvelous account of what took place day by day uh, with the Federal Reserve and the Treasury. And believe me, uh, if the Federal Reserve hadn't done what they did, at least in my view, uh, in a very, very, very short period of time, uh, uh, things could have stopped. Uh, in, in, uh, uh, and I tipped my hat a couple years ago to Jay Powell for acting as he did. You have to act with speed. I mean, you, it, uh, in the old days when you had runs on banks, uh, back in the 19th century, you know, a line formed, you know, and the bank would go broke. But the fellow would pay out as slowly as possible, you know, hoping something would happen. A Wells Fargo truck or a stagecoach would pull up with a bunch of gold or something, and you'd sweet talk the people into the line dispersing. Uh, in Omaha, in August of 1931, uh, four state banks, so-called state banks, they had a vote in that day, they closed, and the national banks didn't. But they were all broke as of that day. If they, no bank can pay off in one day all of its liabilities. But the Federal Reserve is the only one that's good at that time. But I will say, tell you this, Berkshire Hathaway will be there <laughs> at that time. We, we run it on the basis that if, uh, if uh, things just behave slightly, very, if, if, if Frank Paulson, George H. W. Bush, or no, George W. Bush, I'm sorry, and uh, 
uh, Ben Bernanke, and a few people hadn't taken action. We were at that point where the line was formed, except it comes in electronic fund, they push buttons, and, and uh, it's all over uh, very fast uh, if there's a run on a bank. If you, ever, if you ever buy a bank and there's two banks in town, hire a few extras and have them go over and start standing in line at the other guy's bank. I mean, it, it, uh, <laughs> uh, and there's only one problem with that. After a while, somebody will stand in front of your bank, you know, and then both of you are gone. Uh, but the Federal Reserve is not gone. And the Federal Reserve in the United States can do whatever is necessary. They've got all kinds of rules about can do this or that and this and that. And, and uh, uh, I, one time in the 1980s, Paul Volcker, who was a very honest man, said to me, and I said, you know, what are the limits of, of, of what you can do? And he said, hmm. he, he was a very unusual guy and huge, looked out at me, said, we can do whatever we need to do. <laughs> And, and that's true, and that's what, that's what happened in 2008 and 9, and that's what happened in 2020, and you hope it happens again next time, but you want to be, we want Berkshire Hathaway to, to be there and uh, uh, in a position to operate when, the, uh, if, if the economy stops, and that can always happen, that can always happen. Some of those cheery words. Um, <laughs> uh, let's see if we. Uh, I think. I think we can actually. Might be a good idea. To start with some questions, as I said, we will have the questions alternate between. Uh, CNBC, Becky Quick, and those are questions that have come in from shareholders, and they can be directed to any of the four of us up here, and uh, and then we will go alternate and go around the room here, and we've got we've got the auditorium broken into ten or eleven uh, uh, sections. Uh, Charlie and I one time figured out, out a uh, form and uh, said officers of the company broken down by age, and we we just put all of us uh, as an answer to that question. But the uh, but we'll have it broken down by categories around here, and uh, uh, we'll keep alternating, and uh, we will uh, break for lunch. At, at, uh, at noon and reconvene at one. So let's start off and, uh, Becky, will you lead the way? The annual letter that you wrote in February 26, you mentioned that Charlie and you saw little that excites us in the market, yet around March 10th, the deal for Allegheny was announced, and then later the Occidental announcement, then did the disclosure of the HP investment. His question is, what changed from the time you dated the letter to the time the investments were announced? Did the name suddenly become interesting in the space of a month and a half? Or half a month. Well, Charlie, you want to give your version? I'll give my version. Well, my version would be we found some things we prefer to owning to, tre to treasury bills. <laughs> yeah. And as usual, Charlie's given the total answer, but I'll talk longer and say less. <laughs> uh, we, uh, uh, actually, the uh, the letter's dated February 26th, where we were confessing our inability to find anything, uh, which was a Saturday. But the day before that, uh, February 25th, I got an um, email. Uh, actually, uh, my assistant, uh, uh, Debbie Bosani, gets it because I can't figure out quite how to handle the machinery, but so she, she, she brought it in, and, uh, or actually she puts a bunch on the edge of her desk and then I collect them occasionally, and 
uh, there was a, a note, uh, just a few lines long, from a fellow that, uh, that was a friend of mine and, and that worked for Berkshire a good many years ago. And this was on February 25th, the day before the thing. And he said uh, uh, he had now become CEO of Allegheny Corp. I'd been following Allegheny Corp for 60 years. I, I, you know, I, I, I read their annual reports. I had four big file drawers full of it because it was an interesting company. And all companies interested me. For, uh, uh, so I, I, knew a, I, I knew a lot about Allegheny Corp. <laughs> from, and uh, uh, Joe said, you know, this is my first annual report as CEO, and uh, I just wanted to send it along to you, just like you write for your sisters. He says, I write this, I write this report as if I'm writing to you. And uh, I sent a note back to Joe, and I said, you know, I'm going to read it uh, over the weekend or whatever. I said, do him on it, which was... True, I mean, I look forward to reading it. And I said, by the way, I'm gonna be in New York on, on um, March 7th, and, and uh, um, you know, can, can we get together? Uh, I'd like to see you. And I've got, I think I may have said I got an idea. Well, I didn't have that idea the day before. I mean, it just, this, this thing happened to come in on Friday the 26th, and, and I, I knew I'd buy, I, Allegheny at a price, and, and if he hadn't sent me the note, it never would have occurred to me to write him and say, why don't we get together on, on, on March 7th or anything of the sort. It, would, it just wouldn't have happened, except for the fact that Joe uh, wanted to send me along this annual report that he'd just written. So that's, that's the orderly and uh, decision-making progress. I didn't call up investment bankers and say, you know, will you prepare me a report on this? And you know, what's your advice and all this stuff. I knew we'd buy Allegheny at, at the price we offered. And if it was of interest to Allegheny, fine. If it wasn't, but otherwise, if that email hadn't been sent, we we would not have made an offer for Allegheny. So uh, that uh, give credit to the fact that Joe uh, had written the annual report, and if he sent it. A week earlier, uh, well, I, was, I you know I wasn't going to make a special trip to New York, but I wanted to sit down with them and and tell them what Berkshire would do. But that explains the 11 billion. <laughs> and uh, uh, what happened was that uh, a few stocks got very interesting to us, and we also spent a lot of money. But uh, what happened? The market. And this is really important to understand. In, in the last couple of years, the stock market has probably, it's always been a combination of a casino and a, uh, and when I talk about Wall Street, I'm talking about the whole capital formation market. Uh, but the, and, and trading market, et cetera. But the market has been extraordinary. It, it, Sometimes it's, it's quite investment-oriented, kind of like it always you read about in the books and everything, uh, what, what capital markets are supposed to do, and you study it in school and all that. And other times it's, it's, it's almost totally uh, a casino, and uh, it's a gambling parlor. And that existed to an extraordinary degree uh, in the last couple of years, encouraged by Wall Street because the money is in the money is turn, is in turning over stocks. I mean, people say how wonderful you've done if you bought Berkshire in, the, in you know 1965 or something and, and held it, but your broker would have starved to death. I mean, it, 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 it's Wall Street makes money on on one way or another catching the crumbs that fall off a table of capitalism and, 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 and an incredible economy that, that you know, nobody could have ever dreamed of a couple of hundred years ago, but that they don't make money unless people do things <laughs> and that they get a piece of them. Uh, and it's, it's uh, uh, 
And they make a lot more money when people are gambling than when they're investing. I mean, it, uh, it's much better to have somebody that's going to trade 20 times a day and get all excited about it, just like paying, pulling the handle on a slot machine. You know, that's who you, uh, you know, you may not say that you'd want that person. You'd like the other kind of person too, maybe, but that's where you make the money. <laughs> and the degree to which the market got dominated by that is, is shown on a, on a slide some, I have here somewhere. Uh, yeah, here's on Oxy One. If you'll put up the Oxy One, that shows how we bought what became, well, we bought in two weeks, thereabouts, 14% of Occidental Petroleum. And you'll say, well, how can you buy 14% of a company in two weeks? And it's more extreme than that. Because if you look at the Occidental Proxy, you'll see that the standard names, BlackRock, index funds, uh, State Street index funds, basically, Vanguard index funds, and then one other firm, Dodge and Cox. If you take those four entities, and they're, they're not, they're not going to buy and sell stock. They may have got their own little rules. So they, they own 40% of the company, roughly, those four firms. And they didn't do anything during this period. So now you're down to 60% of the Occidental Petroleum Company that's even available. So well, Occidental's been around for years and years and years. Big company and all kinds of things. And with 60% of the stock outstanding, uh, I go in and tell Mark Millard, this fellow that is um, 30 feet away from me or so, and I say in the morning to him, you know, buy 20% and take blocks or whatever it may be. And in two weeks, he buys 14% out of 14, 60%. That's not investment. I mean, <laughs> you're not buying from investment. I find it just incredible. You wouldn't be able to do that with Berkshire. I mean, you can't literally buy it. You can say you want to buy 14% of the company. It's just going to take you a long, long time. But overwhelmingly large companies in America, uh, all of them, they became, they, became, they became poker chips. And people were buying and selling like three-day calls or two-day calls. And, you know, the, and the, the more people, times people pull the handle on the machine, the more money the machine makes. I mean, it's, it's very clear. Uh, and overwhelmingly, I mean, where did, where did people go? The investors just were sitting around and there weren't very many and the money was being made essentially by a bunch of people gambling on things and that enabled us in a two week period to buy 14% of a, of a business that's been around for decades. And you try and imagine trying to buy 14% of the farms in two weeks in this country, or 14% of the apartment houses, or 14% of the auto dealerships, or just anything, uh, when already 40% were locked up some other place. It, 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 is, it, it defies anything that Charlie and I have seen, and we've seen a lot, uh, but I've never seen that percentage of the American public. It sounds, essentially, it was a gambling parlor, and and the people that were making money were people that worked with gamblers. <laughs> and, and then it declined very significantly uh, you know, uh, a few weeks ago. You can, you can feel it if you're, if you're, uh, uh, if you're around it. Uh, uh, so uh, when somebody asks a very good question is, why weren't you doing anything on February 20th? And why were you doing it on starting, well, in the case of Occidental, on February 28th? Uh, uh, you know, it, it's because things developed in a way, and in the case of Occidental specifically, they'd had a, 
an analyst uh, presentation of some, uh, I don't know whether it was a quarterly one or what it was exactly, but I read it over a weekend, and that was the weekend when the annual report came out. I read it over a weekend, and what Vicki Holub was saying made nothing but sense, and I decided that that it was a good place to put Berkshire's money, and then I found out in the ensuing two weeks, it was there in black and white. There was nothing mysterious about it, but but Vicky was was saying what uh, the company had gone through and where it was now and what they put do with the money, and she, she'll do what she says. She doesn't know the price of oil next year. Nobody does, but um, we decided it made sense, and two weeks later we had 14 percent of the of the company, and and uh, we uh, also already had a preferred stock and warrants. Uh, and the story of the preferred stock is we paid 10 billion, uh, preferred stock and warrants, we paid 10 billion for it. And at the end of the March quarter of 2020, we valued that 10 billion uh, for our 10 Q. We valued it at five and a half billion. So we had a four and a half billion loss <coughs> And it would have, uh, you know, the world changed. Oil sold for minus $37 a barrel <laughs> one day, and uh, uh, now it's quite apparent, I think, that, uh, that uh, we want, we're very happy, we should be very happy that we can produce uh, 11 million barrels a day or something of the sort in the United States rather than being able to produce none and having to find 11 million barrels a day somewhere else <laughs> in the world to take care of keeping the American industrial machine working. Charlie, have you got any comments on that as to how, how something this crazy could have happened? <laughs> well, it happened, it's almost a mania <laughs> of speculation that we now have. We have computers with algorithms trading against other computers. We got people who know nothing about stocks being advised by stockbrokers who know even less. <laughs> and, they understand the commission though. Yeah, it's just, it's just an incredible, crazy situation. And it's weird that we ever got a system where all this equivalent of the casino activity is all mixed up with a lot of legitimate long-term investment. I don't think any wise country would have wanted this outcome. Why would you want your country's stocks to trade on a casino basis to people who are just like the people who play craps and roulette in the casino? I think it's crazy, but it happened. And it's respectable. Not with me, but with other people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, and look at look at what the country. I mean, they formed the New York Stock Exchange in 1792 under a buttonwood tree, and it really didn't seem like that was the eureka moment in America. But just look at what's happened using the system uh, for less than you know. Well, you know three of my lifetimes. I mean, it's unbelievable. So it, it's worked. Now, maybe it's worked in spite of itself, maybe, maybe with the country, but one way or another, America has worked in an incredible manner. Nobody could have dreamt it. Nobody. Uh, you know, they'd, they'd have hauled you away if you said, you know, in three lifetimes, you know, that, that uh, you know, this place where we're meeting. I mean, it, uh, uh, it became a state in 1867, but 17, in, in 1789, it asked Ben Franklin or somebody that was walking out of the Constitutional Convention, you know, is, uh, what do you think the prospects are for Nebraska? <laughs> it's, it, it, it's just, it's unbelievable what's been accomplished, and it's been accomplished uh, the people who encourage the gambling, they would like to say it's been accomplished because of the 
of uh, we've got these liquid markets and all these wonderful things. Charlie would probably say it's in spite of that, who knows? <laughs> but uh, the, uh, the, the answer is that, uh, uh, well, there isn't an answer. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, my wife, when they got married April 19th, 1952, we got in my aunt's car and we started driving west and we ended up, well, I drove all over the west, but one night we ended up in Las Vegas. And uh, there were three fellows out there. Uh, Eddie, Eddie Barrick and Sam Zygmunt and Jackie Gawne. And all three of these guys were from Omaha. And they'd bought little pieces of the flamingo. Bugsy Signal had, had his career ended rather abruptly uh, a few years earlier. A bad bullet. Uh, by, oh, it was a stray bullet, undoubtedly. That, uh, uh, but in fact, there were probably five or six stray bullets. But in any event, uh, Bugsy was gone. And uh, some people, including three guys from Omaha, were in the group. Sam Zygmunt lived about two blocks from where I live now, and he was Stan Lipsy's uncle. Stan Lipsy ran, those of you who follow Berkshire, ran the, the Buffalo News and was a partner for 40 or 50 years later on. So all kinds of things intersect, but I walked into this casino aged, or a flamingo, it's kind of a motel-like arrangement, and I was 21, and, and my bride was 19, and I looked around the room, and uh, there were all of these people, and they were better dressed then. It was a more dignified group than perhaps currently, but they'd flown thousands of miles in some cases, uh, you know, in, in uh, planes that weren't as fast as the current ones and were more expensive probably on a per mile basis adjusted. And they'd gone to great lengths to come out to do something that was mathematically unintelligent, and they knew it was unintelligent. And, I mean, they couldn't do it fast enough in terms of rolling the dice, you know, and trying to determine whether they were hot or whatever they may be. And I, and I looked around at that group. I, everybody there knew that they were doing something that was mathematically dumb, and they'd come thousands of miles to do it. And, they were, uh, and I said to my wife, I said, you know, I'm going to get rich. I mean, how can you miss? <laughs> I, if people are willing to do this, you know, this is, this is a, a land of opportunity. Well, it's the way it still is, uh, you know, and the Flamingo go to be much bigger, and, and, and in Omaha, we're very proud of Jackie and things he did. He only died a year, a year or two ago. He became sort of the, uh, the leader, a spiritual leader of, of Vegas, and like I say, Sam Zygmunt's uh, nephew uh, went on to save my and Charlie's investment that we made in Blue Chip in the Buffalo News. <laughs> and, uh, it's, it's a very accidental society that occurs, but there's nothing stranger than what has happened in finance. On the other hand, if you go back, perhaps the greatest chapter ever written on on uh, the operation of markets, particularly the stock market, is in a book, that, probably one of the most famous books in economic history, the, the General Theory, written by John Maynard Keynes, I think it was 1936. And I don't know whether it's chapter, I think it's chapter 12, but whatever it is, he describes what markets all about in 1936, and he describes something in beautiful prose uh, that, that explains why uh, the whole country in March of this year was sitting around uh, tra trading Occidental in some crazy way that enabled us to buy a quarter of what wasn't owned by uh, four other institutions that weren't going to sell. We were able to buy a quarter of it. and. We could have bought a lot more. I mean, it was, it, 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 you just wondered if there was anybody that really was thinking about investment. If you, 
going back to investing, I mean, investing is laying out money now with the hope of getting back more later on. It's really laying out purchasing power now with the hope of getting more purchasing power back. But that's the reason you, and you know, that's the way you learn in the textbooks, that you defer consumption now so you can consume more later on so that you can take care of your family. We all these things about how investment takes place. And that is what happens with farms. I mean, I'm not, uh, uh, somebody buys a farm and they generally they hope to leave it to their kids or they got it from their parents. And I mean, they don't sit there every day and they don't get quotes 15 times a day and say, you know, I'd like to get a call. I'd like to sell a put you know, on, on, on the guy's farm next to me and you can have a call on mine and then I'll have something called a straddle or a strangle or whatever it may be. And, uh, you know, they just, they, they, they go about making the farm worth more money and, and they do the same thing if they got an auto dealership and they do the same thing, you know, if they've, if they've got an apartment house, they look for, for improvement and track tenants, all those kind of things. And um, 40, what would it be, 40 trillion at least, you know, of, of the ownership of all of the American business. Uh, people, and, Trade his poker chips or pulling the handle and and they've got they've got systems set up so that if you want to buy a three day call on a stock, you can you can do it. And they make more money selling you calls than if you buy stocks. So they teach you about calls. <laughs> Nobody's going around selling calls on farms or anything of the sort. Uh, but that's that's why markets do crazy things and occasionally uh, Berkshire uh, gets a chance to do something, uh, and it's 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 not because we're smart. It, it, it's because we're the only thing I'd say we're, we qualify on, and sometimes I wonder about that. But I think we're sane, you know. I mean that, and and that's the main the main requirement in this business. And, and anybody, Charlie. Yeah. Well, I don't think we've ever had anything quite like what we have now in terms of the volumes of pure gambling activity that go on daily and the people lathering the gamblers up so they can rook them. And it's not pretty. And I don't find it creates any great glory for capitalism or anything. Any more than a bunch of people throwing dice at a table. What good does that do the rest of the world? It's a great way to become rich, though, just figure out ways to insert yourself into the system somehow. And, uh, you know, it, jobs to some extent self-select. And many years ago, and, and I've got all kinds of friends in Wall Street, not as many as I had before I had started talking this way an hour or so ago, but, uh, but I really do. I, I mean, I, I don't, uh, people make, they make lots of decisions in life, and the truth is that overall, the American system has worked extremely well. It's, it's, it may be very unfair in many ways, but it has produced incredible difference in the goods and services available to me versus what my grandfather had available. You know, I do not want to go back to pre-air conditioning and and people pouring whiskey down me while they, while they drill my teeth or something of the sort. Or any, I mean, this this is a lot better world. And, and uh, we. Well, I think we've made more be because of the crazy gambling. I think it's made it easier for us, net, over the decades we've been operating. Well, I mean, we've depended on it. Yes. <laughs> I mean, we depend on mispriced businesses through mechanism where we're not responsible for the mispricing of them. And overall, we, we learned something a long time ago that doesn't, doesn't take a high IQ, doesn't take anything. It just takes the right attitude. We may talk more about that later, but I think we ought to prove that we've got an audience here by going to section one. My question is on Berkshire buying entire companies outside the US. Would you only answer calls from them if you're interested in, or would you proactively uh, approach them if they would like to sell their company? I would, we actually 
made a few trips. I think I made, maybe Charlie went with me on one of them. We, we tried to stir up interest in all that sort of thing in Berkshire, around the world. We probably did that 20 or 25 years ago. Uh, uh, during that period that I showed you that burst of action we had, we probably spent, uh, we probably, we probably spent at least five billion of that. Uh, yeah, it'd be pretty, uh, in the area of five billion of it, we bought the, three German securities, we bought two, well, we bought, we bought one, Japan, we, we rounded up on some, some of the holdings we already had there. Uh, we, would, we would love them to buy it, but we'd, they don't think of us as quickly there. I mean, I don't have somebody that's gonna send me an email uh, about a company that I've been following for 60 years, and, and I know I can see them in New York, and the, you know, I can name a number to him, and if he likes it, he can take it to his board and so on. And it just doesn't happen that way. We haven't had that experience in, well, anywhere outside the United States. Now, you can say with 40 trillion here, you know, we, we should be able to find something here a little closer to home. Uh, but we don't have any bias against New England. We, there's, there's, uh, there are companies, you know, We'd buy in 10 minutes if we had somebody on the other end that could do business in 10 minutes. It's, it's much more complicated in certain countries than in the United States uh, to purchase businesses. And uh, uh, there's certain rules, but I would say this, you know, we got a call, whenever it was, many years ago on, the, uh, on, on, on our, our uh, company in Germany and and actually the two, two fellows that run it are probably here in the audience that saw them yesterday. And they're marvelous. And they run the business. And, and uh, you know, uh, uh, they're, they're, they're just trustworthy. As they're, well, the pictures were up on the, on, the, on the movie we showed before the meeting started here. We have so much trouble finding good ideas that we can't afford to ignore any, but they do have to be sizable now. I mean, there, there really isn't, there, there isn't a lot, a lot of, I love the, I love the operation we bought in Germany. And it, it's just a pleasure to be associated with the, with, with the people there. I just wish we could add another zero to all the figures and it was a much larger deal. It's not gonna have an economic impact on Berkshire, but they love it, they care. You can see it, you can feel it, and that's the kind of business we'd like to have, and, and we're very happy we've got it in Berkshire, but we can't do it one debt of Louis at a time, uh, uh, and we would never, never sell an operation like that, ever. Uh, uh, I'm looking at you, Greg. Uh, the <laughs> the uh, it, 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 you know, it, but it, we, if we get a call tomorrow uh, and we could make a deal that involved 10 or $20 billion that was in Germany or France or Britain or Japan or name a whole group of countries, we'd, we'd do it. We bought the interest in the five leading trading companies in Japan. Uh, uh, a couple of years ago, and and I rounded them up a little bit, mm -hmm. but I told them originally we weren't going to buy a lot with, we weren't going to change our positions materially without their okay. So we actually, I think, rounded to 5.85 percent, based on the latest figures we had then, of all five of them, and, and that put a good many hundreds of millions, or maybe a billion or two, to work. Uh, uh, so, we will, well, President Kennedy said, we'll pay any price, climb any hills, you know, whatever it may be, to, to find businesses, but we actually prefer it when they fall into our lap, like getting a letter from somebody, and, and uh, you hadn't heard from them for a couple of years, and, and you know what you pay for the business, and, and you know if the, if 
the board of directors of that company regards it as attractive, that they'll be happy to buy it, and they know you're going to show up at the closing and that you're not going to pile debt on it or change things or anything. They've got an answer, uh, and then you have to see if they've got the, the question in their mind is, is uh, what's the best thing for, uh, for Allegheny Corp? And in that case, we had $11 billion less at the end of the day or the end of the dinner uh, than we had at the start of the day. So it, opportunity can be any place, and we do have a terrific operation, for example, in in Israel, I mean, just terrific, and and it, it uh, and it's reason it's it's pretty good size. Uh, uh, would we like to have another one like it? Yeah, I just don't know where the other one is, Charlie. Well, but think in the scheme of things, imagine buying in sixty billion dollars worth of our own stock. We like the businesses, we like the price we're paying. No overhead. No cost, no, no nothing. Just, just more interest in what we already own. Isn't that we're totally wasting our time? Yeah, and if you look at it, there are, you can read hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of words written on stock repurchases and what this is and what that is and all this kind of thing. It's not very complicated. I mean, if you, if you had a partner in a lemonade stand and they wanted to sell out sell their interest, or two partners, and one wanted to sell their interest, I mean, and, and the business had the money to buy it, or the lemonade stand, and, and they were offering it a price that was good for the other two people that are going to remain, you'd buy, them, you'd buy it. Now, the thing that's fascinating to me is what you can accomplish, and still, people don't pay any attention to it. We owned, in 1998, you know, this is more than 20 years ago, uh, we owned about 150 million. I don't know whether they've split, whatever it is, if, it's, if they've split it, split adjusted, but we owned 150 million shares of American Express. Uh, I think we bought our last share in 1998 or something like that. So, and we then owned. 11.2% of the American Express Company, wonderful company. And since then, they've sent us a check every quarter as a dividend. And so we've taken some cash a little bit as they've gone along. And now we own 20% of American Express. Fund. And that's what's happened because they've repurchased shares. That happens to have worked out extremely well. If they overpaid for the stock and all that, it doesn't solve every problem, but it's a wonderful thing if you've got an asset you like and they take your ownership interest up. And like I say, we've gone from 11.2% to 20%. If you're using your American Express card or whatever it may be, 20% of whatever earnings are attributable to our interest, and they used to be 11.2%, and we've done it without putting up any money. Now, imagine, imagine if you owned a farm and you had 640 acres, and you farmed it every year, and you made a little money on it, and enjoyed farming, and somehow, 20 or so years later, it had turned into 1,100 or 1,200 acres. I mean, you'd say, you know, how long has this been going on? You know, why, what could possibly be, you know, is this an American or whatever it may be? I mean, is it, you know, sensible use to meet its cost of capital, blah, 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 blah. And that, uh, if you do it at the right price, there's nothing better than buying in your own business. We own, I mentioned that use Apple as an example, uh, of how our interest in Apple, you know, every time a company that earns 100 billion a year, you know, it means that our interest in it goes up a tenth of a percent. You know, we've added another 100 million to earnings. Well, that takes, I mean, it takes a lot of work to have a lot of 100 million to earnings. And uh, 
you know, in the first quarter, of the, they just reported, uh, they're on a fiscal year, but they just reported their March quarter, and, you know, they earned more money, and they had fewer shares outstanding, and we actually bought a little more Apple uh, in the first quarter, so we decided we wanted to own a greater interest, and on top of that, we knew that we would own an even greater interest if uh, uh, they kept buying in their shares, which we didn't have any insider information or anything, but certainly would seem the way to bet. And, uh, you know, we feel better because we bought the shares we bought in the market, and we feel just, just as good as the fact, by the fact they use their cash to buy out some of the other people. It, it is the simplest thing in the world, and then I read all this stuff. It, it, it is unbelievable uh, how people can't figure out something that, you know, if they owned a farm and the guy next to him had a farm and somehow you were getting more of his farm all the time without putting up any money while you farmed your own farm, that at least, if, you know, if you're using some of the earnings for that, you'd feel very good about it. And it uh, have you got any explanation for it, Charlie? Well, I have another thing that interests me in the presidency. We get all these suggestions from index funds, a letter saying we, the chairman and the president of the chief executive officer are the same person, and that they have some professor somewhere that thinks that American business would work better if it had a separate, if Warren could split, could split him in two and have each half work. And to me, it's the most ridiculous criticism I've ever heard. It, it, like, it would like, well, Odessus would come back from winning the battle in Troy and so forth, and some guy was saying, I don't like the way you were holding your spear when you won that battle. <laughs> It's some guy that's never run any business and doesn't know anything. I don't think too much of this activity. <laughs> well, let's see. Somewhere in here, I may find it at some point. Oh, here it is. Uh, we, wrote, we wrote in the annual report that in the third paragraph, of a nine-page report, we said, we're going to treat everybody the same. Um, Maybe a crazy concept we have, but, but we really feel that somebody that gave us our, their savings in 1960 or 1970 or 1980 and just left them with us and trusted us, we feel that they're entitled to the same sort of respect and attention that uh, somebody that and was accumulating like crazy assets under management gets paid based on assets under management that, that knows that they just need to have policies that essentially are popular in Washington. The only, problem, the only threat they have really is that Washington sometimes says that you're getting too damn big and we're going to do something about you. So they, they try to be very sure that they're doing things that people will share. So... Anyway, I say, well, we're going to treat you all alike. We've got three million people or shareholders out there. We're going to treat you all alike. And uh, on March 25th, uh, about a month after I wrote that letter, it's in the third paragraph. I, you'd think that they would get that far. That they, 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 they had uh, 101 million B shares. I mean, you know, somebody ought to read to the third paragraph. But anyway, we got a letter and says, we would like to meet with you in advance of Berkshire Hathaway's 2022 annual meeting of shareholders to discuss Berkshire Hathaway's perspective uh, on governance and sustainability. Well, I have written probably more on that that's been honestly written from, by the guy who runs the company, but why in hell would they think that we should meet with them and not you people all individually that come here? I mean, it is, uh, uh, I, I grew up in a very, very, very Republican household, but I, I feel like a, you know, some raving populist or something. But I, I, I just can't imagine. Uh, well, anyway, 
you've heard it. <laughs> and, and, and uh, you know, I, I, somebody, somebody gets paid to, to uh, well, there's a lot of people, I'm sure, in public relations, and they hire advisors and advi because it looks better if they have advisors that tell them whether the chairman and the CEO should be the same person or not, and those people get paid for it. And then they discuss it at the board meeting, and then, you know, in the end, believe me, if 90% if of Congress, for some reason, felt it was better to have the chairman and the CEO be the same person, the index funds would not be writing those letters because all they have to worry about is whether, for some reason, people start wondering why some, some institution should have 10% of the votes in, in every major corporation in the country. And I like the idea of index funds, I, I, but it is interesting to watch where incentives and bureaucracy and whatever it may be lead people. The guy that wrote me the letter is probably a very nice guy. I have, but you know, that's his job. And uh, uh, well, anyway, they didn't get a special meeting. And you people are here, and I, we appreciate the fact you're here. <laughs> BNSF and GEICO appear to be losing ground to their two primary competitors, Union Pacific and Progressive. Over the past several years, UP's operating ratio has been about 400 basis points better than BNSF's. And Progressive has grown faster while maintaining a lower combined ratio than GEICO. On an operating basis, UP's precision scheduled railroading and Progressive's telematics appear to have jumped ahead of the Berkshire businesses. He wants to know what Greg and Ajit are doing to address those business challenges. Let me just start by saying when we think of BNSF, we have an exceptional franchise there and a great business. And we do compete with other railways and we're very well aware of how they operate, including their operating ratios and, and the metrics they operate to and, and precision railroading, and it's all part of it. But what I, would share, what I would share with is when I think of BNSF, we start with focusing on our customer, understanding how we can best service them. And yes, we want to do it in an efficient, effective way that delivers great results back to our, our shareholders. And, and that will continue to be our focus. So yes, we learn from all the uh, metrics they report and how they operate their, their rail and we observe it but I would put our team up right beside them on, on any operating day, and we're gonna, we're gonna move our rail cars as, as well as any other rail company in America, and we're gonna do it on behalf of our customers. So we're, we're very proud, but we're not ignoring the fact that there's more to be done, both operationally and, and for our customers. So we'll continue to see improvement there. We've got a great leadership team there. We've got a great employee group within BNSF, and what I like is we're just gonna see long-term improvement there. We have a, an exceptional intermodal franchise out of the West. It's, it's incredibly valuable to our shareholders long-term, our partners. And that's what our team is focused on, building that franchise out. So couldn't be more proud of where we're at, but we also know we have a, a journey ahead of us and we're gonna continue to get better and better. Greg, if we were ever the opportunity, would you trade our operation for theirs? Never, never. And we love he our- He knows a lot about it, Phil. <laughs> we have a great franchise and we have a great leadership team running it. So, well said, Charlie. Thank you. And I, I just, this where we go to a Jeep. And Greg, you know, was a major partner for 20 years, more or less, since, a little over that since we bought the energy company and his boss uh, was Dave Sokol and and the two of them. I mean, they know how to run. They knew how to run businesses. I mean, and they, you know, it isn't like we don't we we don't read what other numbers are and all that. But we 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 uh, we've got the perfect person running and Katie Farmer. We've got the perfect person running. Uh, the NSF, uh, and you know, she'll do a great job. And it, it, changing around a railroad in various ways. You know, if you got 20, 20, uh, uh, 1,000 or something miles of own track and, yep. and all kinds of other, it doesn't count sightings and double tracking. And you've got a lot of things to do from something that they started building 
uh, a couple of hundred years ago, and not quite a couple of hundred, but, and you can't, you can't move things around very easily, and <laughs> towns grew. Yeah, you know, when you came into Omaha in 1862, <laughs> well, the, the railroad didn't even go across the river. I mean, it, uh, it, um, even though we'd become the, a major rail center for, for the West, or the opening to the West, and uh, it, we're gonna be here 100 years from now, we will be an important, a really vital asset of the country, and it will be a very big part, very important part of Berkshire, and uh, we will take what is an incredible assemblage, I think of 300 and some railroads or something I get over time, and, uh, right. and, and, and uh, you know, uh, the trucks got laid, and the routes laid out, you know, 150 years ago, the world changes, but you have, to, we have to adapt to it. But you don't do, you don't put an order out to change a thousand miles of how it's operated or anything of the sort. So we're running it to have that asset for Berkshire shareholders, and it, and it will redundant to the down to the to the, um, the benefit of the the country. And if we do it, a well, little. No matter who ran it, would be important. Obviously, enormously, the country and the UP will be here and, and, and uh, at, at that time too. And 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 uh, uh, it'll be a better railroad a hundred years from now than it is now. But I can't promise you what will happen if if, if if we get flooding and something in the next few months. You know, it it can it can uh, it can wipe out a lot of the plans you have and disrupt lots of lives and, and disrupt lots of shipments. And uh, there's, there, there are no magic wands in, in railroading to make great, great changes. On the other hand, you ought to be working at it every day to make it better. So, I forget how many bridges we have, but uh, uh, some years ago, we were spending three or four billion dollars a year on on capital expenditures, and one, I said, Matt Rose, you know, I said, this is, a, this is a lot of money to spend, you know, keeping up a railroad, and then, you know, he said, well, we're gonna have to do that and more and so on, and I said, well, I said, I can handle this, but I'm not sure if Charlie can. I mean, <laughs> I have to explain these numbers to him. So the next bridge they bought, uh, they built, they called the Charles T. Munger Bridge, so you can actually go see. <laughs> Our railroad has the Charles T. Munger Bridge because uh, Charlie, Charlie kind of was asking similar questions <laughs> 10 years ago. Uh, Ajit? Okay, thank you, Becky. Um, there's no question that the personal automobile insurance business is a very competitive business. Having said that, both Geico and Progressive are two very successful competitors uh, in this segment. Each one of them have their pluses and minuses. But having said that, there's no question that more recently, Progressive has done a much better job than Geico, as you point out, both in terms of margins and in terms of growth rate. There are a number of causes for that, but I think the biggest culprit as far as Geico is concerned, and again, you rightly pointed out, is telematics. Progressive has been on the telematics bandwagon for, I don't know, more than 10 years, probably closer to 20 years. Geico, until recently, wasn't involved in telematics, and it's been only the last two years that they've made a very serious effort in terms of making, using telematics for segmentation and for trying to match rate and risk. Uh, it's a long journey, but the journey has started, and the initial results are promising. Uh, it'll take a while, but my hope and expectation is that hopefully in the next year or two, Geico will be in a position to catch up with Progressive in terms of tel telematics, and hopefully that will then translate into both growth rate and margins. Charlie, you got It's, it's very interesting. I mean, it, it, the, the auto insurance industry is is a fascinating one to study. That, that, that in, in that that the largest 
auto insurance company now, <coughs> and <coughs> we're talking 2022, and uh, Henry Ford, I mean, it was 1903, you know, or something when, when cars really got started, and it wasn't too many years after that that he was turning out two million cars a year. Imagine that, you know, one guy, the, the two million cars a year is a lot of cars. So car insurance uh, became very important after hundreds of years of when people thought about insurance, it was, it was, it was ships at sea and, and uh, fire where they have protective societies and it, it, insurance is a, Products have been around a long time, but auto insurance uh, has been pretty much the same thing since Leo Goodwin started Geico in, in 1936. And we came along with a good idea and lots of big companies and all that. But the largest auto insurance company in the United States was started over in Illinois by a guy didn't know anything about insurance particularly and it's a mutual company. It's not supposed to succeed in capitalism. I mean, you know, if you go to business school, they teach you that only, the, only because you have incentives and compensation and all kinds of things can a company succeed. Well, nobody's really gotten rich off State Farm. They, they've sat there, and they are the largest insurance company. While Leo Goodwin started 80-some years ago, and he probably wanted to get rich and probably, probably uh, uh, at, at, at Progressive, uh, you know, people wanted to get rich and at Travelers and, and Aetna and we name off dozens and dozens of companies. And who wins? You know, a mutual company. In terms of present size, they still are the largest company. They have, I believe out Berkshire, they got the largest net worth by far. I think they've got 140 billion or something like that of net worth. You know, and Progressive is at a very, very, very smart guy running it for a very long period of time. They've got very smart people running it now, but, but they have a net worth that's one-sixth that of what some people over in Illinois that nobody knows the name of <laughs> have after years. Of, they've had the time to sell the same product, and they advertise like crazy. We spend $2 billion a year telling people the same thing we've been telling them for 70 or 80 years, you know. That, uh, the policy doesn't change, but when we get all through, State Farm's still doing more business than anybody, and it, it shouldn't exist under capitalism. You know, if you went there with a plan to start a State Farm today and have it compete with Progressive, you know, it, you know, who, who would put up the capital? I mean, a mutual company that you're not going to get the profits from? It, it doesn't make any sense at all, except they've got $140 billion or something like that of net worth. And progressive, I don't know what their net worth is, but it must be somewhere around 20 or so billion. And I haven't looked for a long time. Their net worth in the first, incidentally, I mean, they, they, they are very, very, very disciplined in underwriting. And of course, on the investment side, their net worth dropped in the first quarter because they, they own a lot of bonds. And they say, well, they would, probably everybody in the insurance business would say that, well, we own bonds because that's what people do. <laughs> and here's half the business where you do what people do, and the other time, other half the business, you spend all kinds of time trying to analyze in every, in every county and every, every, single, every single way you can segregate and properly rate business and all of that. And uh, uh, you know, I basically, uh, Peter Lewis, Sat in my office 40 years, ago, yeah, 40 years ago, and he was smart as hell. And and you know this guy was clearly going to be the ma a major competitor of Berkshire's, and he, and he knew insurance backwards and forwards and, and very bright and everything. But he just ignored the investment side, and that was as important as the as the the underwriting side, and and. It, it is interesting how organizations function and, and uh, gonna have what I would say are 
to some extent, blind spots. And of course, Charlie and I know we've got all kinds of blind spots ourselves. I mean, so the, we have to be kind of careful of criticizing other people for having them. <laughs> it is, it, it is, the, the auto insurance business ought to be studied in business school because it essentially refutes so many of the things they're presently teaching. So that's my suggestion today to business schools. Okay. <laughs> and thanks, Ajit. You couldn't, Ajit is responsible for adding more value to Berkshire than the total net worth of Progressive. That's not to knock Progressive. I'm just saying one guy. <laughs> you have always said that it is impossible to time the markets. Yet, if we look at your track record, you have had amazing timings with some of your key decisions. You got out of the stock markets in 1969-70, you got back in 72, 72, 74, when the markets were really cheap. You did the same thing in 87, 99, 2000. And today, we are sitting on a significant amount of cash when the markets are going down. My question is, how do you time the big market moves so well? We'd like to offer you a job first. <laughs> <laughs> I will take it. <laughs> the, uh, the interesting thing is, uh, you know, obviously, we haven't the faintest idea what the stock market is going to do when it opens on Monday. We never have had. We have never made, Charlie and I, I don't think, in all the time we've worked together, and I'll tell you something later on maybe about how learning takes place, but we have, we have never, uh, I don't think we've ever made a decision that, that where either one of us has either said or been thinking we should buy or sell based on what the market is going to do. Uh, no. Or, or for that matter, on, on what the economy is going to do. We, we don't know. And the interesting thing is, sometimes I get some credit someplace for the fact that, you know, how wonderful it was that we were optimistic in 2008 and when everybody was down on stocks and all that sort of thing. You know, we, we, we spent a big percentage of our net worth at a very dumb time. <laughs> and and I, I shouldn't say we, it's I. We spent about 15 or $16 billion, which was a lot bigger to us then than it is now. We spent it in the last few weeks, there were a period of three or four weeks between Wrigley and Goldman Sachs and General. We, at a terrible time, as it turned out. I mean, I, I didn't think, I didn't know it was going to be a good time or a bad time, but it was a really dumb time. And I wrote an article for the New York Times and Buy America and, and all these things. Well, if I'd had any sense of timing and waited six months until, I think the low was in March, and in fact, um, I think I was on CNBC maybe that day or something, but, but uh, I totally missed that opportunity. I totally missed, you know, in March of, of, of 2020. We, we, we have not been good at timing. We have, we have been reasonably good at figuring out when we were getting enough for our money. And we had no, had no idea when we bought anything well, we always hoped it would go down for a while so we could buy more, and we hoped even after we were done buying and ran out of money that if it was cheap, the company would keep buying, in effect, taking our interest up. I mean, that's stuff you could, you could learn it in fourth grade, but, but it's not what's taught in school. And, I mean, it, it, so never give us any credit. Well, actually, give us all the credit. You, I mean, go out and tell everybody how smart we are, but we aren't. <laughs> they, it, we, we, we haven't ever timed anything. We've never figured out insights into the economy. I mean, when I was, when I was 11 years old, March, March 12th, I guess, 1942, yeah, at, uh, March 11th, you know, I bought stock when the Dow was 90, well, it was 101 in the morning. It was 99 at the end of the day, I think. 
And, uh, you know, now it's 34,000 or maybe it's a thousand less than it was on Thursday. <laughs> it, uh, but you know, I just, you know, it's one decision that it's a good thing to own American business. And, and it, you know, if the Harvard Endowment had come to see me and it's 11 year old and, <laughs> and, and uh, you know, or General Motors pension fund or something, and you know, they say, well, no, but we have to have a balance and we have to maybe have 60% of, uh, and then we have to sit around every three months and listen to a bunch of managers. They, they'd have just done better if they'd just taken some darts and thrown them and, and just said, we're gonna be in America 50 years from now and 100 years from now, and we'll do better in stocks than we will in bonds. Uh, it, it, it's, it's amazing how hard people make what a simple game it is. But of course, if, if they told everybody what a simple game it was, then 90% you know, of the income or more of, of the people that were speaking uh, would disappear. So it's really a little too much of us to expect of human nature that people will explain why they really aren't adding any value to what you can do by yourself. Or actually, you're, you know, I hate to use the example, but it, you can't have monkeys throwing, throwing darts at the, at the page and, you know, take away the management fees and everything. I'll, 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 I'll bet on the monkeys, but I, not, I don't consider them a superior species and I don't want them to move next door instead of my next door neighbor or anything, but that is the way, it, it's just the way it has to be. Charles, do you have anything cheerful to say? Well, frequently in well, the wealth advisory business, the way it used to be, you, you go to your investment advisor and you say, what should I do to protect myself for the future? And he says, why don't you give me $50,000 of your net worth now? That's my contribution to your future. It's a peculiar business. <laughs> yeah, it's a great place to go rich. It's still, if, if you have, if you're, if you have a, uh, uh, a son or daughter that that really wants to make money per point of IQ and per erg of energy and all of that, well, tell them to go to go to Wall Street. I mean, don't have men under the priesthood or anything. I mean, you know, that, if that's what they. Uh, it self-selects, and uh, it always will be the case. I mean, there's no reason to despair about humanity because they behave in their self-interest. They may not actually be behaving in their self-interest over time, but they, uh, uh, you know, are they happier? Who the hell knows? But, but if they just want to make money, but, uh, uh, well, uh, you know, People here in the auditorium saw, saw a little session from the Solomon, uh, Solomon uh, uh, episode. And Jerry Corrigan was then the head of the New York Fed. And that same committee was grilling him. And they said, Mr. Corrigan, they were, they were giving him a hard time. And they said, uh, uh, who was the highest, uh, they said something to this effect, uh, who was the highest paid or uh, guy at Solomon last year? And, and, and uh, he said, well, he, uh, he yeah, and he named him, and he said, or maybe he named him. And, and he said he got, I forget what it was, 20 million last year. And we're talking 1991 now, too. He said, he got 20 million. And, uh, the guy says, well, how old is he? And, you know, and he said, well, I think he's, Corrigan's uh, somebody affected. He's, he's um, you know, 26 or something like that. And, and then Corrigan couldn't resist saying, and he can't even throw a football. <laughs> the, <laughs> and the truth was, you know, now there's a lot more money in throwing a football now than there used to be. But, uh, uh, you know, one of my heroes was Ted Williamson. You know, 
I think he was making twenty or twenty-five thousand dollars a year, and uh, you know, just imagine today, some guy that bets two thirty or two forty, you know, and he makes it to the bigs. I mean, he's, the money flows in, and of course, uh, those people sh should sit down and thank the fact that that the stadium that could hold thirty or forty thousand people and was the source of revenue for the people who paid their paycheck. That stadium went from thirty to 40,000 because somebody first invented television and they came up with cable television and they came up with pay and all that sort of thing. And no, nobody knows the names of those people, but capitalism is very, very, very peculiar in how it dishes out rewards. And for a while, it was better to be in Wall Street than be at 220 or 230 here in the in the, in the bigs, and, uh, uh, and, you know, it is now reversed because uh, of the development of TV, et cetera. So it, it's a crazy world. The rewards seem very, 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 very capricious, and they are, and they don't seem to any theologian or or even to Charlie and me in our spare time. And the whole thing seems kind of crazy, uh, but it's worked awfully well. And even the people who don't take advantage, get shortchanged by the system, are doing far, far better than if the system hadn't gotten changed. Doesn't mean that you, doesn't mean that you necessarily shouldn't work for change, but you should recognize the limitations of, of what you can do with humans, I'll put it that way. Okay. Charlie, is there any way you'd like to close the sermon? <laughs> well, I do think we have a very interesting phenomenon in, I would argue that in a lot of the wealth advisory business, people are charging for skill and delivering closet indexization, closet indexization. In other words, you, nobody can stand being that different from the crowd in results. They're afraid they'll lose their fees. So everybody does the same thing. It's, it's mildly ridiculous. The yeah. world is mildly ridiculous. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But as Charlie pointed out in the movie, which you only people there saw that. But that yeah, before we were married, you know, we tried to convince uh, a couple of young women that we were really more attractive than we were. I mean, <laughs> you can't expect people not to behave with their self-interest, and that was very important. That that uh, that uh, we didn't disclose all disclose all of our weaknesses uh, before the marriage. So, Warren, we're trying to be a little better. <laughs> Yeah, we, that we, is may true. we may fail a little, and I don't know about you, but I've slightly improved since I was 17. Yeah. Well, <laughs> well, that's that's a really interesting point because if, if if fortune has just showered you with all kinds of good things, you ought to be a better person in the second half of your life than the first half. I mean, that is really should not be asking too much of people if they've if they've won the ovarian lottery and all kinds, you know, they're born in the United States and all kinds of good things have happened to them. Uh, and you've had a chance to see how stupid you were in all kinds of things you did. You know, why not have the second half of your life be better than the first half? I mean, it, it, and I would say working from a very low base, but I mean, uh, I, I'm not nearly you know, by any intelligence test or ability to do any of that. I'm, I, you know, I haven't learned anything, but you do learn certain things only by interacting with people. And you don't know when you're two years old, no matter how much you're picking up all kinds of, of knowledge from the world, the learning machine that's going on in a two-year-old's head is just unbelievable. But it's not the same as having 30 or 40 years of experience with actually how the human animal behaves, which is that you really 
you know, you're learning all the time about it. But that should make you a better person in, in the second half of your life in the first half. And I would say that if, if you say you're a better person in the second half, if you've got reason to say it in the first half, you know, forget about the first half. <laughs> Enjoy the second half. And uh, uh, I think both Charlie and I have had the luxury of, of, A, living a long time, so we get to play the, what we would regard as the, the hopeful and respectable second half. Uh, and we have had enough sense to figure out, well, we figured out what makes us happy, and we've gotten somewhat more sensitive to what can make other people unhappy and all that sort of thing. And, and I'd rather be judged by the second half of my life than the first half. And so would Charlie. Yeah, of course. <laughs> okay. I'm very, I, I don't even look at what I did when I was young because it would embarrass me. <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, any of you who wish to quiz Charlie on specifics can do so later. <laughs> <laughs> Several years ago, Mr. Buffett was quoted that a nuclear attack is the greatest risk to Berkshire Hathaway insurance. Given the present circumstances, what would the fallout be on Berkshire Hathaway insurance if a nuclear event occurred in the populated world? And then secondly, has Berkshire Hathaway Energy suffered any physical or cyber attacks? And irrespective of that, has any special hardening of security been put into place? Yeah. Well, the first half. Every day since, since uh, August of 1945, every day, uh, and accelerating dramatically when a second uh, large country had the ability to um, kill millions of people, which has been magnified by the incredible factor that Truth is that, that uh, there is a risk every day. It's a very, very tiny risk. But as a jeep, well, anybody at this table could tell you, if you if you roll, well, they had a, they had a, they had some they had a pair of dice out of the desert inn in Las Vegas for a while under a glass thing, and some guy had thrown 32 passes in a row, and I don't know what maybe the odds are eight million to one against that or. Four million to one against, four billion to one against it. But uh, you know, if you if you just keep rolling the dice, you know everything will happen. I mean, if it uh, get 330 million Americans out tomorrow, every American says heads or tails, uh, uh, and they do it every day. After 10 days, you know, you you got 330,000 of them that. Have, called the flip 10 times in a row, and if you do it 10 more days, you, you've still got a bunch of people who've done it 20 times in a row, and they really think they have learned how to control the flip. Well, the answer is the world is flipping a coin every day as to whether people who can literally destroy the planet as we know it, you know, and, uh, will do it, and, and unfortunately, uh, uh, the major problem is with people that have large stocks of nuclear weapons and, and uh, uh, ICBMs. And, uh, when they talk about using tactile nuclear weapons because somebody will be upset because they're losing a war, I mean, does anybody think that somebody's willing to kill, you know, hundreds of thousands of people with? The tactile weapons. I mean, why do they stop? But you know, if they're, it, it, it is a very, 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 very dangerous world. And uh, and but we, but we don't have any way of no protecting. There's no way against to a big nuclear attack. No. I, I know a man who said, "I know what I'm going to do if there's a nuclear war. I'm going to crawl under the table and kiss my ass goodbye." <laughs> <laughs> well. <laughs> Yeah, and Charlie is in charge of loss control at Berkshire. <laughs> uh, the, yeah, the, 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 that, we have no solution for it. No, we don't. And, and there isn't any solution for it. 
And, uh, you know, it's extraordinary when you think about it. it uh, uh, in August of 1939, September 1st, as you all know, Hitler moved into Poland, but nobody really knew that much about it here. I mean, you know, the news you got, you got from the newsreel you went to because the theater was air conditioned, you know, or something. So, so if I went to the movies, uh, which you wanted to do in the summer because it was air conditioned in, in August, of, well, September 1st in the case of the actual movement into Poland. But, but uh, you know, there was a few people on the screen and some guy with an authoritative voice telling you the German forces are just moved into uh, Poland. And, picture of a few tanks, maybe, and uh, it was over in a minute. Now, of course, all day, every day, you see people dying who you very much empathize with, and it could be you instead of them, and, and it's just so different. But in August of 1939, there was a letter sent uh, to President Roosevelt about a month ahead of time. And why did he get that letter? He got the letter because Hitler was so anti-Semitic, basically. He drove all the, all the Jews that could see it coming out of Germany, and among them were some great scientists. And uh, uh, Leo Szilard, who was obviously from Hungary, but somehow he, he got driven out, Einstein got driven out. And uh, Leo Zollard lands and eventually in the United States. And he writes a letter to tell the President of the United States, Franklin D. Roosevelt, that, that the, the, uh, there's a bunch of uranium moving different ways or whatever it may be, I don't know anything about physics, zero. I don't know what the off and on sign is, but in any event, I, I know what the letter did. Because he writes a letter and says, uh, you know, something big may happen in physics and, and America better get to it first. But then he has the problem of how do I get it to Roosevelt? You know, Leo Zillard, who's he, the President of the United States. So he figures if he gets Einstein to co sign it, that the president will pay attention, and he's right. So he goes and gets Einstein, and the two of them send the letter, and they send it to Roosevelt, and that, uh, they wouldn't necessarily have been in the United States if it, you know, Hitler had a different, hadn't had the crazy views about, about Jews, basically. And so anyway, uh, that letter went, and uh, we developed uh, the atom bomb uh, before anybody else did. It was a very, very fortunate development that, uh, that, uh, uh, that Leo Szilard and Einstein happened to end up in the United States rather than perhaps be someplace else. Who knows? But the accidents of history, and the ac there's going to be more accidents in connection with Atomic weapons. We, you know, we've come close for various times. I mean, it, uh, uh, we had geese flying over, you know, somewhere up north, and NORAD gets a crazy signal, and we've had wrong training tra tapes placed. One time, you know, we're in the Soviet Union or some, you know, and they, it looks like things are going on, and it's we can't do anything about it, and uh, uh, that is. One risk that Berkshire absolutely has no interest in, even though you can say everybody in the world should have an interest, but it doesn't do us any good. You know, the feeling is, doesn't do us any good to think about it. So, but that doesn't stop the fact that there are two powers in the world that, through miscalculation uh, of the other's intentions, through all kinds of things, you know, have come close. In the past, and Charlie and I lived through the Britain, through the uh, through the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis, and you know we we knew there was some chance that uh, that 
weapons of mass destruction would be used. And believe me, there, that uh, there's a lot, there's a lot more bad that can happen. And humanity has not uh, really come up with a counterforce to uh, technology. I mean, if you live back in the caveman ages, if you were a sociopath or something, you, you threw a rock at the guy in the next cave, you know, or something. I mean, it was sort of proportional to, uh, and, and we kept developing, and then there was this breakthrough where technology is totally outrun humanity, and we'll see whether, what happens, but uh, so far, so good, and Berkshire does not have an answer, though. We don't, we don't, there's no, there's certain things we don't write policies on because we, we wouldn't be able to make good on them anyway, you know, for that, for that. And, and everybody would know we wouldn't be able to make good on them, so we're not a, we, you have that risk and there's nothing Berkshire can, can protect you against. Uh, and uh, we've been very lucky so far. Ajit, do you ever get any questions in terms of? In, in addition to all what uh, Warren has said in terms of the chance of something like this happening, the additional thing that concerns me about a nuclear situation is my, my lack of ability to really estimate what our real exposure is in the event of a nuclear event. Uh, when you're talking about, you know, other big exposures we have, earthquake and hurricane and cyber, I can, with some reasonable degree of accuracy, have a point of view in terms of how large our exposures can be and how big our loss can be. When it comes to a nuclear thing, you know, I, I sort of surrender. I, you know, it's very difficult for us to estimate how bad bad can be. Very many different lines of exposures will be affected by it. And even though in almost all our con contracts we try and exclude nuclear as a covered peril, nevertheless, if something like that were to happen, I'm, I'm fairly positive that the regulators and the courts will hold it against the insurers, uh, and we will be, and they'll rewrite the contract and we'll be required to pay. For example, one thing which is already uh, being talked about, uh, we issue what are called fire policies. And these fire policies try and exclude nuclear as a covered peril. But there are several regulators who feel that, gee, if it's a fire policy and if the nuclear attack causes a fire, then how can you exclude fire? And you better include fire. So, you know, debates like that we will have to live with, and it will be very difficult for the insurance industry to fight back both the regulators and the court systems in terms of what is covered and what is not covered. And there won't be any regulators or anybody else. <laughs> so, <laughs> and, and, uh, um, we'll leave it to a million years of reconstruction. <laughs> but, uh, uh, Einstein said that, he said, I know not what the, uh, uh, Weapons will be for World War III, but I know the weapons for World War IV will be sticks and stones. You know, that, um, uh, it, there's a lot of things. You know, but, uh, there, I mean, it's it, it just, if you're worried about the effect of uh, nuclear attacks, uh, you know, you got other things to worry about than the value of your Berkshire. I'll put it that way. <laughs> and and uh, what other cheerful things? Uh, station. Uh, Warren, do you want me to touch on the cyber? Oh yeah, sure. Yeah, I'll, ju I'll just touch on the on the cyber because it was raised. And when you do think of Berkshire and and they use Berkshire Hathaway Energy as a reference, but uh, cyber risk and managing that risk both at Berkshire, it really falls across all of our subsidiaries. And it's a, it's a constant risk that's there. It's one of our greatest risks we're always evaluating and trying to literally defend against. And if we use Berkshire Hathaway Energy as an example, <clears throat> we would uh, receive billions of attacks every day against our various operating systems. 
So that's basically what our team is in place for, both they harden the assets to deflect it, and then evaluating the underlying attacks we have you know, every, second of the, every second of the day. And, and by the way, that would, uh, we'd have a number of operating subsidiaries that experience that, but obviously it's the rail and the energy and the, a few others that we, we spend a lot of time on, a lot of effort, a lot of resources. And the good news is that uh, today, that through to today, our teams have done an exceptional job. We really haven't had a, a significant event. We've had some minor events at small businesses, but across our major businesses, across our major operating systems, uh, we've had the proper security protocol in place to avoid events, but it, again, it never stops. Our team would tell you that every day that's a, a risk they recognize and a risk they're addressing within the, within the businesses. So uh, a significant risk, but a significant priority for all of our operating teams. Yeah, and I would add one thing. I think Greg knows way more about this than I do, but my impression from everything I've seen is that you always have, you know, historically the, the, uh, the private industry has always said the government can't do anything right, and, and government always says that the private industry is just thinking about itself, all these things. So the truth is, I th I, from everything I've seen, is that the cooperation between government and business in terms of trying to minimize the threat of, of cyber problems I think it's been magnificent, you know, basically. That, you know, <laughs> yeah, excellent point. When it comes to cyber, the collaboration between a variety of U.S. agencies and our individual businesses, it's incredibly strong, including down to the uh, certain agencies will submit uh, basically a lot of our operating data on, an a on a daily basis where they're helping us go through it to identify if we have... Uh, uh, a bad character, a bad individual who's maybe penetrated into our system. So it's a, it's a strong collaboration, and Warren, you're absolutely right. It's, uh, it's very unique to see how both the industry and the government's working so closely, but I think we both recognize it as such a, such a significant risk. We have to stay strongly aligned on the approach. It's a real partnership, and we can do better because the government is helping us, and the government can do better because we're helping them, and there's no lack of will on either side and and I uh, cyber cyber I mean it blows your mind on sort of an but the nuclear is the is the is the number one threat but it's a very 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 low probability yeah you know, you it, uh, it, uh, someday the sun will burn out too you know but but uh, it is there's really no place for two countries with large ICBM possibilities and who knows what else and everything. But the, we haven't figured that out yet. You know, it, uh, it's easy to go around and say this is a solution or that's a solution, but, but uh, you know, if you have two people with loaded guns, facing each other and, you know. It, and not everybody is likely to be totally rational. Oh, well, we see so much irrational, irrationality in where people's self-interest is involved. You know, they're doing all kinds of things to destroy themselves in terms of how they live their lives. And, and you know, it, it doesn't stop with, <laughs> as you move up the ladder, and, uh, you know, people, People, some people do terrible things, and just have to very much hope that they aren't in a position where they can do it all by themselves with the rest of the world as their, as their supposed prize. Okay, uh, if sta station three will please ask something about motherhood and apple pie or something like that. <laughs> this is my fifth annual shareholders meeting. Well, we appreciate you coming. We do, sincerely. As you know, for the past four consecutive months, we've been going through inflation with an inflation weight north of 7% for the first time since 1982. 
from 1970 to 1975, at a time where your portfolio took paper losses, and yet you made some of the best investment choices of your life. Reflecting on that, my question is, if you had to pick one stock to bet on. <laughs> oh, you kind of snuck up on us there for a second. <laughs> and be resilient in the inflation, which would you choose? And what specifically enables that stock to do very well and might very likely be a difficult market? Well, I'll tell you something even better than that one stock. <laughs> Maybe we'll get to one stock, but the best thing you can do is to be exceptionally good at something. If you're the best, if you're the best doctor in town, if you're the best lawyer in town, if you're the best whatever it may be, uh, you know, no matter whether people are paying you with a zillion dollars or paying you, they're going to they're going to give you some of what they produce in exchange for what you deliver. And if you've got it, and if 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 you're the one they pick out uh, to do any particular activity, sing or play baseball or, or be their lawyer, whatever it may be, whatever abilities you have can't be taken away from you. They can't actually be inflated away from you. Somebody else will give you some of the wheat they produce or the cotton or whatever it may be, and they will trade you for the skill you have. So the best investment by far is anything that develops yourself. And again, not taxed, you know, it, it, so. That's what I would do. I got some advice for you, too. <laughs> when you have your own retirement account and your friendly advisor suggests you put all the money into bit to Bitcoin, <laughs> just say no. <laughs> yeah. Nobody can take away from you the talent you have. Mm -hmm. I mean, and the truth is that the world will always be willing. They'll need to do something, and some people will not have skills, and they will get less of the product of the society uh, than somebody who has other skills. And sometimes that has something to do with education, but a good bit of the time it doesn't have anything to do with education. I mean, it, it, uh, but figure out figure out what you'd like to be and figure out how and what you'd like to be is what you're going to likely be good at it. and you know that, that uh, the world will will always need somebody on that tube to tell us what's going on so you know study Becky quick or somebody and <laughs> figure out you know what makes her good and uh, and what you sort of sort of naturally bring to the game. I mean, I could have, who's the guy that says you gotta spend 10,000 hours doing this or that? And then that, uh, uh, Malcolm Gladwell. Malcolm Gladwell, you know, would say just spend 10,000 hours on something. Well, I could have spent 10,000 hours trying to become a heavyweight boxer, but <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I'd have felt very good at the end of the 10,000 hours. I mean, it, 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 you, it, you stumble in, do what you really like doing, what you're good at, what is useful to society, and then it doesn't make any difference whether the dollar bill, you know, is now worth, in terms of the purchasing power, a cent or a half a cent or a hundredth of a cent. Uh, if you're the best doctor in town, you know, you will, they'll bring you chickens, they may, whatever they may do, but, <laughs> can't take it away from you. And my guess is that uh, if you've come to five meetings, you know, you've got a very good future ahead of you. I mean, that, that shows, it, it self-selects. I mean, uh, 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 so uh, if you want to sell a piece of yourself, you know, that, we'll buy that as the best investment we can make. We'll take 10% of your future earnings mm -hmm. and we'll give you a cash payment now. <laughs> and, you know, we'll, we'll have a terrific asset. And you can have 100% of your future earnings, and if you make it 
develop your talent. Maybe you'll be a great dancer. People, people pay money to watch great dancers. We had Fred Astaire and his sister Adele that came from Omaha. You know, their name was Austerlitz then, but, but they could dance. And uh, Adele you know, did whatever she did with him, moved to England, and Fred Astaire went on to do a whole bunch of other things. And, Ginger Rogers had to do it all the same backwards in high heels, and she didn't get paid as much because she was a woman. A, but you're going to do just fine. I bet a lot of money on you. <laughs> mm -hmm. We like that the current management thinks in the long term to increase shareholder intrinsic value, but we aren't sure that at the time of the management change, the new management will act the same way you do. They might take risks in the insurance field where it's hard to find on the balance sheet, and that might take years to realize. We would like to know how we can assess the insurance risk today and in the future, or to know in time when you and Ajit are not here anymore. Well, I would say that the future for a long time is about as assured as you can have in the world. We don't have an answer for the nuclear problem or anything, but we have a culture that A, has worked, B, has the shares and the shareholders uh, that uh, will carry it a long way. And, uh, you know, the first year, let's say I die tomorrow, the first year, you know, everybody says, you know, what's going to happen? Are they going to spend it all? Are they going to do all these things? You've got the shares held in a place that it can't happen. You've got a, a, a board of directors that understands that our culture is 99.9% of, of running the business. They don't think that having meetings of the committees and bringing in outside experts or anything like that mean a thing. I mean, it, it, it's a process that the, that the world has adopted and, and they've done it for reasons we understand, but Berkshire is just plain different. We are a business that exists for people that trust us. and. All we have to do to fulfill that trust is fairly simple things. We've got the people to do it. We've got unbelievable resources to do it. And it isn't that difficult as long as you've got the freedom, essentially, to do it. And the world will write stories a year after, so a year later, what has happened at Vera? You know, the railroad will be run the same way. Then it, 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 uh, the big, the big worry, of course, is that somebody comes in and figures they can make billions of, as a group or, you know, people that sell the businesses and say it's better to be private, because, you know, or it's better to be pure this or something like that. Well, you know, we're, we're a pure partnership is what we're pure at. And, and uh, we do have what we think is a special relationship with our owners. And uh, I don't think the relationship changes and the ownership doesn't change that much. And uh, there's nobody can take us over uh, for a long, long time. And by that point, we would hope that maybe the superiority of this culture might be somewhat better understood uh, by the world. And, and we will be here. If we have the same culture, we'll be here 100 years from now, assuming the you know, we haven't had nuclear exchange or something, but uh, Berkshire is built forever. There is no finish point. You know, nobody is waiting to retire or have their options vested or thinking about, we don't have anybody that's thinking about, should I take another job? It just doesn't, you know, they're doing what they want to do in life. And it isn't because, you know, we're topping somebody else's offer or that, that, that uh, headhunters come around and say, we want this person or that person, and what will it take to get them? Well, they can't get them. I mean, that, uh, well, that's, uh, I don't know whether we could build it again, but we've got it. And we didn't know we were building it exactly when we took over one. You know, when we had a lousy textile mill, I mean, the, it isn't like Charlie and I sat down, and he didn't happen to be in Berkshire, but he was my partner and everything. And, so we, we were metal partners. Huh? We didn't sit out and work out some plan that, that said, well, we'll run the dumb textile business for 20 years, and then we'll finally have to fold it, or, and then we'll do this and that and everything. 
we just kept putting one foot in front of the other. And, but we did, we, didn't know, we did know how we felt about the, running a public company. And one thing we wanted to do always was we wanted to have people that were in sync with us. We didn't really want that group I saw in the Flamingo uh, you know, in 1952. We wanted people who trusted us. And we started, in my case, in a partnership. We started with seven. Charlie started the partnership. And this is the same thing. It was, we didn't go to institutions. And we didn't pay fees to people to bring in money or anything like that. We sat down with people. In my case, I handed them a little sheet of paper. And it said the ground rules. And I, I wanted to be sure we were on the same page. I said, you don't have to read the partnership agreement. I, I mean, there's no way in the world I would be trying taking advantage of it. You shouldn't be here if you think I did. Uh, but I do want you to, I, I do want you to be on the same page and, and measuring me by the same yardsticks I measure myself. And, and those people stayed with me. And they're still, they're, they're their children, their children's children, their shareholders of Berkshire, but they're partners. And, and uh, you really, be hard to do that again, but I would do it with whatever, if I were gonna be in this field, I would try and do the same thing. I would try to find people that trusted me. And uh, uh, I don't wanna be with people that are saying, how'd you do versus the S&P, you know, last month or, you know, what's your long, short position or anything like that. I, I, I sold securities for three years and it just, I just didn't want to be in that position where essentially they thought maybe that I could do things that I couldn't do. So I finally found a way to get a few people. I mean, it, I didn't actually I stumble into it, but a few people that, that trusted me and, and they just gave me their money. And we've lived happily ever after. So it's, it's uh, the new management's got them. We'll, and the management after them, and the management after them. <coughs> they're just, excuse me. <coughs> they're just custodians of a, a culture that's embedded. The owners believe in it. People that work there believe in it. And we're not saying others, other things can't do better or anything of the sort. We're, we're just saying this is what we've got. And, we have got the directors, we've got the share ownership and all of that to, uh, and the size that essentially can ward off any attempts to change the culture. And, uh, you know, it, it, it's silly to talk about, about if our board members did this and did that and they, you know, and in the end, Obviously, we're always going to follow the law. And we're a Delaware company, we follow Delaware law. But that doesn't mean that we have to do what every other Delaware corporation does and how they look at the Delaware statute. Uh, we, we'll follow the law and then we'll, we'll, we'll run it as a group of people who trust us and, and we appreciate that trust. Charlie? Well, I remember when you had a textile mill and it can, I try to forget it. <laughs> the textiles are really just congealed electricity the way modern technology works. And the TVA rates were 60% lower than the rates in New England. It was an absolutely hopeless hand. And you had the sense to fold it. Hello? <laughs> 25 years later. <laughs> <laughs> well, you didn't pour more, more money into it. No, that's right. And no, I, uh, recogni recognizing reality when it's really awful and taking appropriate action is, just involves often just the most elementary good sense. How in the hell can you run a textile mill in New England when your competitors are paying way lower power rates? And I'll tell you another problem with it too. I mean, the, the fellow that I put in to run it was a really good guy. And I mean, he was 100% honest with me in every way. Uh, it was, he was a decent human being, and he, he knew textiles. And uh, 
if he'd been a jerk, it would have been a lot easier. Uh, I would have probably thought differently about it, but that, uh, we just stumbled along for a while, and then, you know, we got lucky that Jack Ringwald decided to sell his insurance company, and we did this and that. Uh, but I even bought a second textile company in New Hampshire. I mean, I don't know how many, seven or eight years later, I mean, it, I'm going to talk some about dumb decisions. Maybe, maybe after lunch we'll do it a little. And, uh, it, it is incredible how many dumb decisions we made. Charlie and I bought that, and Sandy Gottesman, we bought that department store. And that was 1966. And you know, we were working with our own money. And why in the world did we think? And Charlie flew to Baltimore, and I'd, I mean, we used to really work in those days. <laughs> and and, and the, there again, we had wonderful people. Louis Cohen couldn't have been a better guy, but everybody in that business had a different reference point. You know, they wanted to expand their company. Well, who can blame them for that? And, you know, they were planning the couple of new stores, and each department, the shoe department said, well, we'll do it better at this time, and all that kind of thing. But the whole idea was crazy. And, and uh, we got there for a little while, and we figured it out, finally. And uh, we, we reversed course. Yeah. But why the hell did we do it in the first place? <laughs> well, because we were stupid. Yeah, OK. Well, <laughs> that, that's important to realize. We paid $6 a share for that stock. And uh, uh, if the department store has succeeded, it might be worth you know, $30 a share now. And, we do. and it failed, so we, but we did other things, and we merged it into Berkshire, and we'll talk about that a little later. Uh, and you know, I'm not, I don't know whether it's $150,000 a share an hour or something like that from the six bucks. So if it succeeded, we would have made a, we would have maybe made a few dollars and because it failed, we made hundreds of thousands of dollars per share. But that's the way life is. Mm. <laughs> you just keep going. And, uh, and keep learning, that's the secret. Keep learning. Keep learning. Keep learning. And you can say, why would it take guys that long to learn and, uh, well, we got a few minutes before lunch. We, we should let's address that problem because I, I did bring something along on that. It, it there have been well, I started buying stocks when I was eleven. I've been reading every book in the library on it. I loved it. My dad, you know, it was his business, and I get to go down to his office and I'd read the books down there. Or, and I saved the money, and finally, by the time I was 11, I could buy a stock, and I could tell you, at that time, uh, I went to New York Stock Exchange when I was nine. My dad took us to New York, each kid to New, New York once, uh, and he took me. I went to New York Stock Exchange, and I was in awe of it. I could tell you how the specialist system worked and the odd lot arrangements, and I could tell you history of finance, and. All of these things, and then I, then I started. I got very interested in technical analysis and charted stocks, and then all kinds of crazy things, hours and hours and hours, and and uh, and save money to buy other stocks, and and tried shorting, and and I just did everything, and then when I was either 19 or 20, and I can't remember exactly where I did it or something. Uh, I picked up a book someplace. It wasn't a textbook at school, but it was in Lincoln, Nebraska. And I, uh, you know, I, I looked at this book and I saw one paragraph and it told me I'd been doing everything wrong. <laughs> I, I just had the whole approach wrong. I, was, I, thought, I thought I was in the business of trying to pick stocks that would go up. And in one paragraph, I saw that that was totally foolish, and I left. I brought something that it, 
it's really interesting. Let's put up, uh, what do we call this chart? Oh, oh, here we are, yeah. Let's put up illusion one. Yeah, there we have it. You know, now if you look at that, some people will see two faces, some people will see a base, and some people will look a long time and only see two faces. But the mind flips from one side to another, and that's another well, some name for it that uh, they call it ambiguous illusions or something of the sort. There's other things that talk about aha moments or or in the old comic strips with Popeye Wimpy would have a little balloon over his head and the light bulb would go on. There's this point where all of a sudden you see something you haven't seen. Well, it took me, I had an illusion that I was looking at, we'll say in that one, two phases. Let's go to the uh, one labeled two. If you're looking at it from one side, you look, it looks like a, a rabbit, and if you look the other way, it looks like you're looking at a duck. And, and you know, it, 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 the mind is a very funny place. And I think people call it an apperceptive mass when you have all kinds of things going on in your mind. And they go on for years and they sit there and get lost. And, and then all of a sudden, you see something different than what you were seeing before. Now, and it took me in stocks, which I was intensely interested in. I had a decent IQ and I was reading and thinking and, you know, and, and it was important to me to make some money on it. Every, I had every, every motivation in the world. And then I read a chapter, I read a paragraph actually in chapter eight, I think it was of the intelligent investor. And it just, it told me that I wasn't looking at the duck, I was looking, you know, now it was the rabbit, whatever it may be. And whether you call it a light bulb, whether you call it, you know, a moment of truth, whatever it may be. And that's happened, that happened to me in Lincoln. I mean, it changed my life. If I hadn't read that book, I don't know how long I would have gone on looking for head and shoulders formations and 200 day moving averages and the odd lot ratios and all, a zillion things. And I love that kind of stuff, except it wasn't, it was the wrong stuff I was looking at. And I've had that happen and Charlie's had it happen, I'm sure. It happens a few times in your life. And uh, all of a sudden you see something important that why in the hell didn't I see this in the first place? Maybe it's, a week ago, maybe it's a year ago, maybe it's five years ago, maybe it's maybe it's learning how to get along with people. You know, I mean, whether actually it's it's better to be, you know, kind or not. You know, or whether I mean, they're just learning how to have. If you want the world to love you, what you have to do, or what it's it's it's, it's you know it when you see it, but you didn't see it for ten years before, and I don't want to. Charlie's got some thoughts on that or not, but that's happened in a few situations in business where I've looked at a company for, for a decade and, and, and then there's something that it just all gets rearranged in your mind and you, you know, you can say, well, why didn't I see this five years ago or, but usually, I've, I've had it happen a few times, obviously, and, and everybody here has, and just in different areas of their lives. And you think, how could I have been so stupid? Well, that's what Charlie's, when he was in the law practice, uh, had a partner, Roy Tolles, and he, every smart guy that would get in trouble, usually with, it was guys, and usually it was with women, and, the, and, and uh, you know, They'd come into the office and they'd look, you know, down faced and everything, and they'd say, it seemed like a good idea at the time, you know, I mean, <laughs> and, and their lives unraveled, you know, in many cases. Uh, so there's, there is that apperceptive mass that's sitting in there inside somehow, and every now and then it produces some insight. It's better actually if it produces insight into your behavior 
than whether it produces insight to make money. I mean, that, that, and some people never get it. And they wonder why they're, you know, whether their kids hate them or whether there's nobody in the world that would give a damn whether they live or die. In fact, they prefer they die because then they've been courting them for their art collection or whatever it may be. It, 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 it just, Charlie would say, you know, you know, just write your obituary and reverse engineer it. And uh, not, a, not a crazy idea. But Charlie, I don't know, what, what do you know about apperceptive masses, which are <laughs> well, optical illusions? Well, I know that that's the way the brain works and that it's easy to get it wrong. And part of the trick is to get so you correct your own mistakes. And we've done a lot of that. Yeah. Frequent, frequently, frequently, way too late. Yeah, we've done better with the mistakes than we have with the good, reasonably good ideas. Well, it's so easy to overdo a good idea. That's what's going on now. You have a lot of good ideas that are being grossly overdone. Well, just tell me, tell me about one that hasn't been, but tell me later when the crowd isn't listening. <laughs> and well, that, but, that's where, but look what happened to Robin Hood from its peak to its trough. Wasn't that pretty obvious that something like that was going to happen? Tell me again what it Robin Hood, when it came out and it went public and oh. got alerted on everybody and all the short-term gambling and big commissions and hidden kickbacks and so on and so on. It was disgusting. Yeah. And it said so last year and they got mad at you and they sold a bunch of their stock and they got the money and... Yeah, but now they're, it's unraveling. Yeah. God, God is getting just. But a lot of the insiders have great gotten, no, but they've gotten a lot of money from it. I mean, they were big sellers as I remember. That may be, but yeah. there's, a, there's been some justice. Well, uh, I have to agree with that. <laughs> well, it's a good idea to go around making enemies of people, though. That, that's another question which we, we, we do. Is it, wise, is it wise to criticize people at all? Probably not, but I can't help it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well... And here's the smartest guy I know, and he's 98, and he hasn't figured it out yet, so, I mean, give up. <laughs> Enjoy. <laughs> well, with that, we'll go to lunch, and we'll try to come back wiser at 1 o'clock, and thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> okay, let's reconvene. I think we sold uh, 15 boats so far. I was told that a while, a little while ago out there, so get them while they last. We won't have the first one available for delivery for about a year, but, but people are getting 10% off, whatever that means, uh, who order one, and I've ordered one myself, and we're, uh, things are going well in the other room, and we only got uh, seven questions, which is the new low in the first half, so we'll try and move a little faster. I can't imagine why it went that slowly. I mean. Uh, who, was, who was doing all that talking? How should CEOs decide which issues to take a stand on or whether their companies should engage in the political realm at all? That's a terrific question. And that is one, obviously, I've had to think about plenty. And at one point, I said, I don't put my citizenship in a blind trust when I take the job as CEO of Berkshire. But I've also learned that uh, you can make a whole lot more people sustainably mad than you can make temporarily happy by speaking on any subject. And on certain subjects, they will take it out on our companies. And that means that the people that are employed by us, uh, some of them we would end up letting go. It means that the shareholders get hurt. And uh, do I really think that it's so important that I 
talk on every possible subject that people can get very upset about, whether uh, they should be asked to pay that price. And I've come to the conclusion the answer is no. Why, why in the world do I want to hurt the people in that other room that do all kinds of things for Berkshire? Why do I want to hurt you? Because I say something that 20% of the country is going to instantly disagree with, and sometimes they will be so upset about it that they will try and take it out. And since they can't scream at me, they'll, they may have campaigns against their companies or anything else. So I, I think it uh, applies to me. I'm not going to go around and, and uh, uh, take positions where instead of saying Warren Buffett says, uh, it will be, it will say, you know, Berkshire Hathaway or Warren Buffett of Berkshire Hathaway. I get it uh, identified, and I, I do not want to make the lives of you with them. I just decided I'm not going to be doing that. And if I want to do that, I should, I should quit my job. And if I think I'm, my citizenship, speaking out is that important. I'll give up what I love the most, which is having this job. I don't want to do that. So I've decidedly backed off. I, I, I don't want to say anything that will get attributed basically to Berkshire uh, and have somebody else bear the consequences of, of what I talk about. And that, uh, so that's where I stand. And I can tell you that at most companies, or many, that isn't fair, but in, in a great many companies, you know, the CEOs, uh, they have to think about what their board says to them, and they, they've made a point of electing people to their boards because it's socially acceptable, who represent different uh, constituencies, sometimes very strongly. And if they think they're stakeholders for this group and that group and that group, uh, they're gonna, they'll get pressured by their boards to take positions, and, and it, it, it's just a territory that, that we don't, we're not going to get into. I don't, Charlie, how do you feel about that? Well, I, even more than you, I have to be very careful about what I say. <laughs> <laughs> now, And the difference between the two of us is I can't resist saying a little more. <laughs> it, it, uh, I see headlines in papers just time after time after time that say Buffett's buying such and such. Well, I'm not buying such and such. Berkshire Hathaway is buying it, and it may be the work of two other people that work at Berkshire. And the people who write the articles don't have the faintest idea whether it was my uh, my at my instigation, or whether I'd even ever heard of it. And, uh, uh, but the headline says, the headline will attract more people if it says Buffett buying this, and if it says Berkshire Hathaway, and we don't know whether it's his, the people that work for him or him. And the headline is designed to bring people into the story. So it's, 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 it's the confusion is, is terrible. Uh, and, the easiest thing to do is to um, basically shut up and uh, and uh, not not have a bunch of people have facing consequences that they didn't ask for in the in the first place. So uh, with that, uh, well, I'm glad you asked that question. That is a good question, and, and I probably thought more about that question than I think about whether this stock or that stock is cheap. President Biden's fiscal 2023 budget request would impose a 20% minimum tax on the unrealized capital gains for households worth at least $100 million. What are your views on this issue? And if you don't want to answer, maybe Charlie does. <laughs> well, we'll find out. <laughs> I, I, and we should, be, in all honesty, we, would, we should both say that we we would be affected by it. If it's 100 million, we'd both be affected. So our point of view is, we're, uh, and 
and I have no point of view. Charlie, I, I have no uh, per, uh, no no point of view that I would would want attributed to. I tend to stay out of the income tax things like this. My, my policy is I pay whatever taxes they they pass, and I don't want to engage in lobbying about taxes. Yeah, we. And I would add one thing. Lobbying is really distasteful. Uh, I once did it for a candidate, and I ended up in a room with a bunch of lobbyists for cigarette companies. They didn't care about Nebraska. They didn't care about it. They didn't have anything. They just, they were there because uh, they were handing over a contribution. They didn't, and I was a convenient uh, accessory. And, and you know, it, it made you want to throw up, basically. Uh, uh, on the other hand, we operate in the railroad business, energy business, uh, insurance business, and they're extensively regulated. And uh, I don't also want to be the only railroad that stays out of the railroad group, the only, the only insurance company that stays out of the insurance group. So, you know, other people can rightly figure that we're a free rider under those circumstances. So I, I tell the, the managers generally, you know, don't spend Berkshire's money on candidates that you like. Don't pressure suppliers to do what I mean. Berkshire is not a weapon to use, which, and it's been used by certain people in the organization, but don't, don't use it to muscle money out of anybody else for who you like or what school your wife went to or whatever it may be. Um, and some of it goes on anyway. But I, I don't tell our people that don't belong to any trade associations. Charlie wrote one of the great letters of all time. And if you go to search, type in, I think, 1989 Munger Savings and Loan or something. We resigned from the U.S. Savings and Loan League, I guess it was. And we warned them. We said, we just cannot stand you know, what you're doing to the country and what a bunch of very nice people get together. But they decide it's in the interest of their savings alone to get do this or that. And we warned them. And finally, Charlie wrote a letter, which is, like I say, available on search. And it's one of the, well, it should be one of the proudest letters, certainly one of the proudest letters that's ever come out of Berkshire. And he just said, we can't stand it anymore. And we're resigning, and uh, but that's that's a very tough thing to do. You can't, you, know, you can't. It's, it's it's a tough way to live. Just go around criticizing the people you work with, and the neighbors, and and they're perfectly decent people, but they run into institutions that are doing things that are very distasteful to them, and and we belong, support uh, some of our subsidiaries. Uh, in energy, and, and, and you know, we, I don't want to find people who are doing it for personal reasons. I mean, in that case, they're in trouble. But I don't say they can't do it because I don't want their hands tied if something comes up. And essentially, they're either their competitors within the industry or the industry versus this. Uh, we're not going to stand alone and say, well, we're morally superior to us, so you put your money up and buy it. So that's, that's, that's where I end up. Charlie? I've got nothing to add. Okay. It never bothers me when I don't have anything to add, but he, he, he seems stuck on that. <laughs> How to practice the multidisciplinary framework in making investment decisions and in life? Like, how to make it more practical? Charlie? Well, obviously, it, it, it helps you to know more than one discipline. There's an old saying, you know, that a man who carries only a hammer thinks everything else is a nail. And it, you make a lot of wrong decisions if you don't have the sum command of all the disciplines. That's all I ever said. And but you do irritate people terribly when you come into their territory. 
You say, I'm multidisciplinary, you're the expert, and I know better than you. They hate you for it. I can test to do it. I, I've done it several times. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, China, well, to a certain degree, in the, they have a culture that, that um, uh, to some extent, reveres age. So Charlie's got me beat. <laughs> I don't even try and compete with him on China. <laughs> I can't catch him on age. Okay. I'm, I'm going to try to, though. In the 70s, you wrote an article entitled, How Inflation Swindles the Equity Investor. You said that stocks cannot keep pace with inflation because companies cannot increase the return on equity. Do you believe that this is still the case? Yeah, and I, I, of course, bonds can swindle the equity investor to everything. I, 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 in, in, inflation, I should say, swindles the, the bond investor too. And they, it swindles the person who keeps their cash under their mattress. It swindles almost everybody. And the problem, if you have a business that doesn't take any capital, and let's just say the dollar depreciates 90% or something, so things cost 10 times as much. If it doesn't take any capital, you can charge 10 times as much, and you've kept your relative position. But most businesses take some capital. If our utility business, if, if just say that the dollar is worth one-tenth uh, some years hence from now, we have to have 10 times the capital investment, basically. And we get paid a return on that, but we have forced capital investment to essentially keep them in the same place. And uh, I wrote an article that uh, related to that, and I will tell you a very one famous story, which you will all sympathize with, and that I wrote that story for Fortune, and when I finished it, it was about 7,000 words. And Fortune doesn't, didn't like publishing 7,000 words, and they, and my friend Carol Loomis explained that to me, knowing that I would pay more attention to her than anybody else, but being stubborn and male, I said, uh, uh, you know, every word is precious, and they can either run it or not. So then they sent an editor, a very nice guy, out to Omaha, and this guy explained to me that it just wasn't right to use that many words. And uh, I said, well, that's fine, but if you don't do it, I'll right at someplace else or something. Very disgusting behavior on my part. And then I sent it, it was, it was beginning to bother me a little. So I sent it to my friend Meg Greenfield. And Meg was a great, great, great editor at the Washington Post. And we were very, very good friends. Wonderful woman. And Meg, who was tough as nails with most writers, but she was kind of nice. She, was, she didn't want to really hurt me too much. So she said, I said, well, May, what do you think? And she said, well, Warren, she says, you don't have to tell everything you know in this article. <laughs> and and it, it, uh, it, made, it made the point. And so I write that letter, I write that article shorter, and, uh, but I'd say more or less the, the same thing. No, it, you're better off. If, if you really could have a totally stable unit of, 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 of uh, a monetary uh, use uh, for the next 100 years, it would be better, better for, better for uh, business and investors in general. Charlie? No? We will go to... Station six. Inflation, inflation is, the, the question is how much, and the question is whether you can, you can decide that 2% and keep it. it. The answer is nobody knows. You know, I mean, it, it, you, you do not know, and nobody knows. Uh, you, you can list all kinds of stuff, but they don't, nobody knows what the, how much inflation there will be over the next 10 years or 20 years or or 50 years, or next month, and, and people talk about it all the time because you're interested in knowing the answer to your question. And they don't know the answer, but, but 
There are a lot of people that will tell you they know the answer if they if you pay them enough, and other people that will tell you for nothing because they think it enhances their prestige and makes them more valuable and all that. But the answer is they don't know, and we don't know either. Um, the best protection against inflation, though, still is your own personal earning power. If you, if you play the violin very well, you will do reasonably well during inflation. I mean, it's just play it better than other people. People will pay you for doing that if you, you know, all kinds of things. So your skills can't, will not be taken away, and your money may be. With the growing influence of institutional index funds, how can management teams foster a shareholder culture like the one we have at Berkshire? Well, fortunately, we have it. We know more about how to keep it than to, to, to institute one. And it's very interesting. Uh, we have we have a million four hundred and seventy thousand uh, Class A shares outstanding today. That's fewer than we had a year ago in there. The, those seats are filled. I mean, you are the shareholders are in place. We like the group we have. So why in the world? Well, we got a fixed number of seats, which if we sh should we go out and recruit other people to replace you? you know, I mean, the ideal shareholder is the group shareholder group we can have is the group we have today. And why? You know, if we had a church, we'd want the people to keep coming back week after week after week. If we had a limited number of seats and we had some wonderful parishioners, and uh, we would not go out and recruit another. 50 or 100 of them, and have to throw out 50 or 100 of the ones we already had. We've got, and uh, every company I know virtually, you know, is wooing new people to come in, and whether they're improving the group they get or not is another. I mean, it's, it's, it, it, it strikes us as, as basically crazy. We we don't want anybody different <laughs> than we have now, and and uh, you know. We're not going to get rid of the index funds, so uh, we have to get rid of, of people like you, and we don't want to get rid of people like you. <laughs> uh, and I, I just don't understand why, if you, if you had a neighborhood, and, you had not, and the size of the terrain or whatever it was would be such that you could have 10, 10 neighbors, and they were all great neighbors, why in the world would you go out and say, to a whole bunch of people going up down the street, you know, why don't you buy the house of the guy next to me? You know, a, <laughs> it, it is, it is weird, but there's an awful lot of people that make their living by doing that, and they never really question. Uh, I would, I would sort of ask any company that's making analyst uh, presentations every month or something, which of the present ones are you trying to get rid of? You know, basically, because you're not going to have more. I hope you're not going to have more shares outstanding at the end of the year than you have now. And and uh, am I supposed to, you know, get out of the way so some some other fund that is thinking about what your stock is going to do next week replaces me? It, it, it is a very 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 weird situation. And of course, the really the, the really uh, crazy process that has developed is people talking to, we'll say, analyst group, you know, the sort of the high priests of finance. You know, some companies are doing it more than once a month. Well, just imagine if you go, if you work for that company, you go to work for that company, and Every month, people are repeating these things about their company, that it's important that we have more services per customer, and it's 6.2, and we got to get the 7 or something like that. And they'd say that month after month after month. It becomes a catechism. And CEO says it, or his or her representative says it, and it goes, it, how do you go on? the next month and say, by the way, we were really wrong, and this is what we should be working on. You don't say that. 
And it's a terrible problem that the new CEO has coming in after a previous CEO has said the important thing to do is to hit your earnings targets. Well, you know, you have to, he's been meeting them in all probability by cheating from some time to time. And this guy hands you the baton and are you going to sit, come out and say, well, we've really been cheating a little and it's really counterproductive to the development of the com com you know, companies, not to make earnings projections and just to give you the results as they come rather than, than making up a few things in the accounting department? No, they can't do it. You can't. It's not human nature. And besides, you wouldn't get appointed as a successor, but you just don't go in and say, we've been perpetuating these myths that we can always deliver 8% growth, or we can do this or do that, or that the most important thing is this. You can't go in and change that if every month you're, you're, you've been preaching to people that this is what we stand for, and just ask another question and carry this message out to the masses, to the analysts and all that. And it, it's, it's a totally destructive uh, policy. I mean, I can, you know, I can, within gap accounting, and, and uh, I, I can play a lot of games with numbers. We have never, we've done a lot of dumb things at Berkshire. We have never told anybody that the number had to be this or that or to change anything. I mean, it just, uh, once you start it, it's all over. You can't quit. It's like taking $5 out of the cash register. You know, the first time you take the five bucks out, you say, well, I'm going to put it back. And then do it a few times and you'll never stop. In fact, do it once and you probably never stop. But it, it, it's, uh, if something is going to be destructive, the thing to do is not start it. And forecasting earnings, I can't imagine anything more destructive. I got 360,000 people out there and they know whether I'm lying or not, a good many of them. And they know what they send in figures, and they get changed. You know, what, what message are you telling them? We've, we've got one dramatic illustration of that within Berkshire. And it, it, uh, it, it, it's just, you know, we, we want to, if, if you start lying, you've got a big problem. It's that simple. And, uh, and, uh, and if you start saying, to your team that somehow you've got a job, you've got, you got shareholder relations, your job is to go out and tell everybody that our stock is the best thing among thousands of choices to buy every day. Well, that's crazy. And, and uh, so what do you tell them? Well, they, they try to you know, see which way the wind is blowing and figure out what they have to tell people. And then they go out and tell them. And, and then if you're a human and you've said we're gonna earn $3.59 a share, you can get to 359 and get there quite a while. And you know, you can have audit committee, you have all these processes. But if you have a culture of lying, the processes really don't they, they just disappear. But and Charlie and I have seen it. Well, every time we've gone on a board, but uh, you know, Charlie, tell them about it. <laughs> well, I think Berkshire's culture is going to last a long time after we're gone. And uh, I think it should, and I think it'll prosper pretty well. The rest of corporate America is quite different. And it gets more different, I think, with each passing decade. And it's getting very peculiar. Pretty soon they're gonna hold all the shareholders meetings online and, and the shareholders won't even come. And it's just, it's getting very peculiar and the index funds get more and more important in the voting. And it's like everything else in life. It, it changes and not always in ways you like. And it ends up for selecting different CEOs and all kinds of things. I mean, it, it, uh, you're not going to appoint a successor CEO 
this is gonna come in and said, everything that's been done before is, you know, it's been kind of fraudulent. You know, I mean, if we needed to book, book an extra sale after the end of the quarter, if we needed to adjust the reserves, and uh, it's just, it's, once you start lying, it's all over. And uh, I just don't know where, any way around that, except to try every way you can uh, to not, you sure can't, if you set the wrong example at the top, you got a real problem, you know. But we don't, we've never told, we never told anybody to change a figure, and we never will. And uh, if they had been changing figures, you know, we'd be in all kinds of trouble because they know it and I know it and the next person would know it and it just deteriorates. And we've, 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 we've really seen it, we've really seen it time after time. Board, the way boards operate, you know, it's, it has to be process oriented. I mean, I understand the problems that Delaware has in writing a statute that judges face when they look at things, but it's extraordinary. Uh, it, it's just extraordinary what uh, an emphasis on process can do to an organization because they think they can do anything if, it, if it's allowed. And, uh, you know, eventually the foundation crumbles. Uh, okay. Oh, I, I should make a little news here. So. You've come, you've all come, and uh, you may or may not see this, but it's very possible. Uh, one of the things we bought, one of the things I bought, it was bought for a different purpose by a different manager months earlier. Uh, he bought uh, roughly 15 million shares of Activision, and I never paid. I knew about the company, but I, I would just see it at the monthly report. But then on January, I don't know, 17th or 18th, something like that, Microsoft announced they were going to buy Activision for $95 a share. Now, when they announced that, at that point, Activision becomes a different kind of security. It becomes what Charlie and I used to call uh, well, everybody did. 50 years ago, uh, we call them workouts or something like that, and they've become known as arbitrage. Well, they're not really arbitrage, but they're, they're securities, they're, in this case, a common stock, whose value depends not on what the market price does, but whether a given corporate event occurs, an announced corporate event occurs. Well, Microsoft wants to buy, Activision will say it, well, they, they said at $95 a share. And they've got the money, and obviously mergers and big mergers, tech companies, all kinds of things, have got all kinds of problems uh, with the world generally in terms of opinion. So you don't know what the Justice Department will do, or you don't know what the EU will do, and there are all kinds of things. But at that point, it becomes a different security. And Charlie and I, uh, 50 years ago, we used to do a lot of that sort of thing. And, uh, and we, and Gus Levy did it at Goldman Sachs, and we even went back one time, I think, on British Columbia Power, didn't we, Charlie? Yeah, we certainly did. Yeah. <laughs> a guy named Bennett was up there, and we were trying to figure out whether some, some uh, takeover of, of the, the power business. I mean, we spent a lot of time analyzing the probabilities of announced deals going through, and we call them workouts. Now the term became ARB, and it hasn't worked where overall too well in recent years. Now every now and then, uh, I see something that I want to do in that field, and, but very seldom because they gotta be big. The profit is limited. You know, if they say you're gonna get 95, you're not gonna get 96, and you may, the deal blows up, you may have a stock that's at 40 or something. So it's a, but we, we did it with uh, Monsanto five or six years ago uh, when Bayer was buying it, and we got very lucky because it, 
it turned out to be a terrible acquisition for Bayer, but, but it, it, it did go through because Bayer had the money and they, they went through with the deal, even though Monsanto came with a problem that nobody uh, really understands to so the extent of. And we did it with Red Hat when IBM bought it. So, in any event, on September, whatever, I mean, on January, whatever it was, 17th, 18th, 19th, Microsoft announces it. And the stock, which had been at, at 60, well, let's see what it, I may have a slide here, which I'll find. But in any event, the stock, which had been in the 60s, went up to the 80, 81 or 2. And that looked like not a big enough spread to me for a few days. And then it settled back a little. So anyway, we now own something like 9.5% of Activision. And if we went over 10%, we would file a report. So in order that the news people don't feel that there's no news there, I can tell you that as of uh, yesterday, we own about 9.5%. If we go past 10%, there'll be a form filed with the SEC and so on. But it is, it is, a, it is my purchases, not the manager, who bought it some months ago, and uh, if, if the deal goes through, we make some money, and if the deal doesn't go through, who knows what happens. But that's, I just want to be sure that if we do file that report, people understand very clearly, because there's been some very mixed up stories on that in the past, uh, we want to be very clear that, that uh, it was Warren Buffett's decision in that particular case, and he doesn't know what the Justice Department's going to do. He doesn't know what the EU is going to do. He's never talked to anybody in Microsoft about it or anything. He's just read a document. He's made his own assessment. And it can change. And uh, uh, at one time, I think we sold a few shares even uh, when I thought it was a little higher than it should be. And turned out those sales were not bad sales. And so I just want to, I want to create a little news for you. And... Uh, uh, I want to, if possible, head off stories which have been incorrect in the past and which get then get picked up by other media and corrections never get written. Uh, that all the corrections were written by uh, one inaccurate story uh, and they apologized even to me. Uh, sent both, both the reporter and the, ed and the editor sent me a personal note of apology and they, they didn't expect to make a mistake but uh, but when the other publications picked up the story, they didn't bother to pick up the correction, and, and millions of people were misinformed, and probably, uh, literally, by the time it gets spread around. And, and uh, uh, this one I will attempt to head off by telling you exactly what the facts are right now, and we'll see whether we go beyond 10%. But if, you know, it could easily be that if it went up a few dollars, I'd, it's still a $95 deal, it's still... The, we don't know what the Justice Department will do. We don't know what, what the, the EU will do. We don't know what 30 other jurisdictions we will do. One, one thing we do know is Microsoft has the money. So that, that takes that one risk out of it. Uh, so anyway, Charlie, do you have any news to break? <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. And, and incidentally, I don't, even, I don't talk this over with Charlie. I mean, you know... Uh, he, he knows. He knows what I. Uh, 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 occasionally, I'll see an arbitrage deal and do it. And you know, 50 years ago, we were doing it together. And, and his general feeling is, why is Warren fooling around with this kind of stuff? Even, but, but uh, um, it, uh, it's uh, the old fire horse. But occasionally, it looks like the odds are in our favor. But absolutely, we can lose money. Uh, on that company and, and uh, you know, fairly large sums of money, depending on what happened if the deal blows up. And there will be a lot of people that want the deal to blow up. But Microsoft doesn't want it to blow up, so we'll have to see what happens. Passive investment vehicles now control upwards of 50% of the United States stock market. Yet in doing so, passive investors have empowered the large index funds to become the biggest activists in the market. These passive managers now enjoy enormous, and I would argue undue influence over corporate governance. Do Warren or Charlie see any benefit or logic to a rule that would prohibit passive investment vehicle managers from voting the shares they control for their passive investment clients? Well, I'll take that. 
I think the guy's right. I think I think the thing is out of control and counterproductive. And and uh, I don't think it's good for the country to have three passive investors with bright young men from Harvard or what else telling them what proper governance of corporations is. It's not a good development. And it is, and I think indexing, if it gets to 90%, then it won't work very well at all. But at the moment, it's worth fine. Yeah, and well, the one thing you can count on, too, is that if it does look like it's going to, uh, uh, if, if, if the public opinion shifts over to the idea that it really is a good idea to let three people decide the fate of every company in corporate America, the three people, and they won't collaborate or do anything. They're not oh, they're evil people in the least. I mean, they're just doing what you and I would do. They would figure, we don't care that much about voting. What we do care about is keeping a lot of assets under management. So we'll, we'll figure out something that ends up reflecting public opinion, and then politicians won't get mad at us. And our only threat really is that politicians get mad at us and regulate us in some ways. So we'll head it off. And I, I would predict fairly confidently that if the American public doesn't like the idea of three people controlling things, the three people and their organizations and everything, but the three, they're, what they want to do is they want to get bigger. <laughs> and they wouldn't be where they are in life if they hadn't wanted to get bigger. Those, those things don't happen by accident. That doesn't mean it's the only thing they want. They want their investors to get good results and everything. But they are certainly not going to follow a policy which is going to cause a backlash that causes them to be a lot smaller then. They can figure out their self-interest. I mean, it, uh, and, it's, and it just so happens that in this case, it would achieve the right result, which is that they would not control America. But the, uh, they, they'll do what's good for themselves. And, and what they have to do, what's politically acceptable. We, the only thing that really can mess up what is a very good deal for them is to have Congress change the rules. And, and you know, the rules were the Investment Company Act of 1940 really changed how people behaved and, and, and it's governed things uh, in a big way for a very long time. And, and uh, Anybody that takes on the federal government loses. You know, and if you're talking about trying to do that sort of thing, and they don't need to do it. They just just say, well, we'll we'll, we'll give up voting, or we'll vote our shares as the rest of people do. And of course, if you vote your shares as the rest of, as the rest of the people do, then if the passive if the if the index funds had 90 percent of the country, you could take take over a company by uh, somebody else buying three or four percent because you'd automatically get. Uh, the the uh, funds to follow your very small little percentage. You'll see it all play out. I mean, it's it's not a it's a big case, but it's not an unusual case. Berkshire Hathaway Energy and the unique structure that has evolved there, given that Berkshire doesn't own 100% of the company. The first part of that question is related to Greg's ownership and his corresponding incentive alignment with overall Berkshire. I would conservatively say that Greg's stake in BHE is worth more than 500 million at present. And I'm curious if you, if you can share any plans that you have to convert his Berkshire Hathaway ener energy ownership to Berkshire stock. And if there isn't a plan to do this, can you please explain why we shouldn't be concerned about Greg's incentive structure going forward? The second part is about leverage at, at the entity. You have always said that BHE operates with an appropriate amount of leverage given its earning power. With that said, it's still a very, very large debt figure in relation to current earnings, especially uh, with what we have become accustomed to at Berkshire. 
If Berkshire owned 100% of Berkshire Hathaway Energy, would you still operate the business with the same amount of leverage? Thank you. Uh, the, second, the second part is the easiest one to answer, so I'll take that. Uh, and I'll throw the first, first one back to Charlie. Uh, Berkshire Hathaway Energy actually is required with its regulated utilities, and it basically started pretty much with regulated utilities, um, and, and still is dominated by that, and we're interested in buying more regulated utilities. It's required in different ways by different states and by different regulatory authorities to have a large amount of debt because the regulatory authorities will say in Iowa or, or to pick any state, the regulatory authorities are going to say you can get debt money cheaper than you can get equity money which historically has largely been, almost always been true. And they say that since we're going to allow you a return on equity, we'll say, just pick a figure, but let's say they allow us a return on equity of 9% and we can borrow a lot of capital at 3%, they say it'll result in higher rates to customers if you use it, put in all equity. We would love to have all equity in. <laughs> in our utilities, uh, but we wouldn't, uh, the regulator wouldn't stand for it because it would result in, under the traditional system, it would result in higher prices to consumers. So that's built into the system. And uh, we would, well, our regulator wouldn't allow us uh, essentially to get the same return on equity and, and, and uh, have an all equity structure. Uh, they, and the answer is, uh, you know, we we put well. You actually saw in the in the film earlier, which the people that are listening or uh, hearing the webcast didn't see. But but just in Iowa, you know, we recently got approval to spend three hundred fraction billion dollars. But but they want us. Iowa has a history, and like every other state in the union except Nebraska, which is all public power. But every private power, you know, they have a history of wanting X percent to be in, in debt. They, they want you to raise a lot of money in debt because it's cheaper, means cheaper power for the consumer. So uh, the answer is if we owned 100% of Berkshire uh, Energy, we would be, we would absolutely be following the same, we would be operating pursuant to what the utility commissions tell us they want us to do that. They represent the people of those states. Now, Charlie, do you, do you want Well, the other one's simple too. It's a historical accident. It's not causing any big tension or breaches of fiduciary duty. We had the same problem with Walter Scott, who was the director for years and years, known stock in the same company, also an historical accident. Yeah, I just don't think it's a big problem at all. Oh, we, we I see no, no behavior from Greg ever that isn't in the best interest of Berkshire. Yeah, and we, we've had various percentages of Berkshire Hathaway Energy uh, ever since we bought it in around 2000. And it happened, we were, my sister who's here, we were at her house and there was a party going on, and 20 or 30, probably 30 people. And Walter said to me, uh, uh, if you got a minute or two, I'd like to talk to you about something. So we went in the library or someplace, and Walter says, you know, we've got this company and it doesn't seem to fit the public mold very well, and would you, like, would you want to buy in and go, go private? And I, I said, sure. You know, turns on the price. And uh, when we got back to Omaha, I was out on the West Coast, we got back to Omaha, and we met with David Sokol, who was the big holder, aside from Walter. And uh, uh, we agreed on a price. And uh, I remember Walter saying to Dave, don't negotiate with Warren. <laughs> he'll tell you, he'll tell you to forget it and he'll do something else. And uh, uh, 
So we bought it. And it uh, so it was, it was kind of a weird structure from the start. And we had a public utility holding up an act to deal with and all kinds of things. And it's evolved. And uh, it now has us with 91% roughly. And it has Walter's estate. And I don't know where that goes I'm, and uh, uh, at all. And Walter never talked to me about it and I never asked him about it. Uh, but it's one way or another, interest connected with them or in the, in the estate now, close to eight, I guess. And, 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 and Greg's got one. And, and the E, you know, from our standpoint, if we made a, a deal with, with, if they ever came to us and the, the Scott interest wanted to do something, you know, we'd say fine with them, we'll do the same thing with Greg if he wants to, and he probably would want to, I mean, but from our standpoint, I've never seen any decision remotely. If I thought that would make a difference, you know, he would not be, he just wouldn't be the right kind of person to run um, Berkshire. And, and uh, the problem, of course, is that you've got lots of process that can be involved with insiders and everything, and, and I've got no interest in, as long as I'm alive, you know, my interests are 100% with Berkshire, and the board wouldn't probably, and to some extent, a little reluctantly, but they just say, well, if Warren thinks the deal's okay, it must be okay, which is true. <laughs> and uh, uh, so I could make a deal uh, with anybody, and it doesn't get all messed up with process. But on the other hand, if I'm not around, you know, the pressures are the directors to do whatever the lawyers tell them to do and the lawyers tell them to do this and that and then they want to bring in investment bankers to make a value and the whole thing is a game from that point forward and uh, it's expensive it takes a lot of time the people it, so it would be better if it happened while I'm alive and around but there's no reason We'd rather have 100% than 91%, obviously, because more earnings for Berkshire. But there's no reason to try and do anything with either the Scott interests or, or, or Greg, unless they, they want to do it. And the logical thing is if anything happened with the Scots, we'd certainly offer it to Greg. But that, who knows what happens in the future? The one thing I can guarantee you, Berkshire Hathaway holders will never be taken advantage of and you know you can you can sue my estate or something like that if it <laughs> if anybody felt differently about that it, it isn't going to happen but it's a lot easier if it's done while I'm around actually than if it's done later but I wish we had 20 more complex events just like it <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> that's exactly true yeah uh, it oh, it it's it's an it's it's a it's a it's a per, it's, kind of, it's a perfectly logical question. I mean, I, 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 but it uh, it is not a problem, and any answer that's arrived at will be good for all concerned. And right now, I've got no I've got no feeling that that well, I don't I have no no, no knowledge at all of um, where the stock. That the Scots have goals, or what they, how they feel about it, or anything, and and, and that's up to them. They're, they're, you know, the Walter was our partner, and as far as we concern, we're concerned, we tr treat anybody connected with them as our partner, and they know that. And they don't have to worry about us taking advantage of them, and and we can understand what if they don't do anything, we can understand that. If they want to do something, we can understand that. It's a good question, though. Thank you. To Charlie, he says, in the past, you've made favorable statements about investing in China, in part based upon valuation metrics. What is your opinion now, and how much weight do you put on the actions of the government in your analysis? Do the recent Communist Party activities in China, including human rights violations, blatant cyber theft from U.S. companies and others, crackdowns on speech from business and media, et cetera, cause you to change your opinion on investing in China and how do you evaluate the clear dangers of investing under authoritarian regimes as recently evidenced by Russian atrocities in Ukraine? 
Well, those are good questions, and there's no question about the fact that that the government of China has worried the investors from the United States who invest in China more in recent months and years than he did in earlier periods. Uh, so there's been some tension, and it's affected the prices of some of the Chinese stocks, particularly inter uh, internet stocks. Just in the last day or two, the Chinese leader has sort of reverse course on that and said he went, went too far and he's going to pull way back and so on and so on. So we're having some hopeful signs. But yes, there are more difficulties in best in, I mean, of dealing with the regime in China than there are in the United States. And it's different. It's a long way away and they've got their own culture and their own loyalties and so on and so on. And the reason that I invested in China is I could get so much more, so, so much better companies at, at so, so much lower prices, and I was willing to take a little political risk to get them to get into the better companies at the lower prices. Other people might reach the opposite conclusion, and everybody is more worried about China now than they were two or three years ago. So that's that's just the way it is. I have nothing to add. <laughs> Your expectation for the likelihood that float will be stable and the cost will be zero or close to that over time with adverse years from time to time. What about Berkshire's insurance businesses give you the confidence to make that statement when your competitors are trying to do the same thing but haven't been able to come close to achieving Berkshire's record in cost and growth of float. They really aren't trying to do the same thing, which is kind of interesting. Uh, the, um, the answer to your question is we wouldn't be in the business unless it was my judgment that the likelihood, uh, the weighted probabilities are higher that, that the flow will be useful to us rather than costly to us. And uh, nobody will know the answer to that for a very long time. So far, so good. But, but it is a judgment, and absolutely I could be wrong about it. But you know, the... The, I think both Charlie and I would say that we think the odds are that, that it's a winning bet and the odds are pretty good and that we're quite well positioned to do it if anybody does it. But, you know, did we know 9-11 was coming or, you know, I mean, it, it, okay, I mean it, 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 it is not a sure thing. Just think of what the potential is, though, when you're reviewing it. If we could buy common stocks we were virtually sure would give us 8% after taxes with our whole float, that would be a hell of a lot of money. Well, it would be 11 people? billion. I can tell yeah. you what it'd be. Yeah. <laughs> and, it'd be 11 and, or 12 billion. Yes, it's, it's an enormous amount of money. Annually. Yes, <laughs> and, and the float has been growing. So relax. We're glad to have the float. But Charlie, Charlie stuck in a couple of ifs there, if we could earn it and if we could. The answer is, you know, it's our job, and we think we can do it as well as anybody or we wouldn't be doing it. But it's our job to figure out what businesses we want to be in and, and when they don't make sense, reluctantly, occasionally, to give up on them like the textile business. But, but that, that, those, are the, those are the hard decisions. And... and and insurance, I didn't have the faintest idea back in 1967 when Jack Ringwald stopped by the office at a quarter, stopped by at about a quarter of 12, and Charlie Hyder set him up. And Jack, about once a year, he'd get mad at the regulators. He, did, he just didn't like being regulated. And it, it, he'd say to himself, you know, I'm going to sell this damn thing. And Charlie caught him one day, and he, he said, Jack is in the heat. You know, I said, bring him around. So he came up and quarter of 12 and 
Jack, does anyone want to get rid of this damn business? The regulators were driving him nuts or something. And I said, fine, I'll buy it. And uh, I said, what, what price do you want? And he said, I think $50 a share then. And I said, fine, we've done, we've done it. We don't, we don't need an audit. We don't need anything. And then Jack started, and he says, well, he says, uh, immediately, he, he really changed his mind, but he was too honorable to back out. So he said, well, I suppose you'll want me to sell you the agencies. And I said, no. And of course, if I'd said yes, and then he said, well, then we can't do it. So I, I just said, no, you keep him, Jack. You know? And he said, I suppose you'll want me to do this. I said, no, no, I won't want you to do that. He was hoping I would just give him an out. But after, after doing that for 15 or 20 minutes, he saw that I was gonna to agree to everything he said, and he said he'd sell it to me at 50, so he, he followed through, and that was that. And, you know, it was pure luck. And, no, and but Jack, Ward, we really like our float, don't we? Pardon me? We really like our float. Oh, yeah, no, it's, 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 We it's, love it. No, we, we, we made the most of it, but we didn't make the most of it until a gene came along. <laughs> and, uh, you know, who knew that the guy was going to walk into my office in 1986 and, and uh, you know, I would decide that he was the guy to make this damn thing work. But I hadn't been able to make work the way I wanted it to. And who knew that Geico would come along later and who knew it? There's just all kinds of things. The one thing you have to be, do is be prepared. When opportunity comes, you really do have to just, you just move. And... Fortunately, I operate in an environment, and I wouldn't operate in any other environment. I get, I get out of there, but I operate in an environment where I can do it. And it'd be crazy of the board to say, we want to set up a committee to review every acquisition and all that. And I would say, that's, that's fine, but you can work with somebody else because I, <laughs> I just don't like to go through that, all that stuff. You know, I've got other things to do the rest of my life. As a, so it, there's, there's so much so much luck, but it, there is that, you do have to be mentally prepared and to do something when it makes sense, sense and do it big time and do it instantly. And then you gotta be sure you've got the resources to do it. And, I mean, you know, the relative absence of bureaucracy at Berkshire Unbelievable. has made the company a lot of extra money for a very, very long time. And it's made my life happier. And yes, <laughs> uh, but that, that, that's ideal. <laughs> it, uh, but in the end, we are extraordinarily well positioned to do exactly what we want to do with float, while at the same time never putting ourselves in the position, never coming close to making a promise we can't keep. We had two small insurance subsidiaries uh, before, well before a G. Uh, two companies I bought, one I really didn't know that much about, the other one I, I did it all by myself. And uh, they were disasters. And left alone, which they could have been, they'd have gone bankrupt. And, we just didn't want to do it. So, we, you know, we, we, we could pay the liabilities and if the parent company got involved and or we put it in another insurance company or something. And we, just, we did it. I mean, it, it's, uh, you know, Berkshire, you know, in a crazy way, I look, I look at Berkshire as a painting, you know, and it's, it's unlimited in size. It's got an ever-expanding canvas, and I get to paint what I want. And if somebody wants to paint something else, then I'll go someplace, and I'll get a smaller little thing, and I'll paint away. And, uh, you know, I actually, you know, I'm no good. I, I don't know anything about paintings. Take me to an art museum, and, you know, all I really want to know is where the men's room is. But, but it, it's... You know, I, I'm just not interested. And other people look at paintings and they see something and then they see something additionally later on. And, and, I mean, they really have a different sort of perception ability. 
in relation to that. And to me, Berkshire's a painting, and I get the paint. And you know, the object, obviously, I want my partners to come out well in it, but the real thing I, I like is the painting. And uh, as long as, you know, it's in my head, and I see different things in it as I go along. And, and you know, it's, uh, it's, you know, the closest thing I can come to enjoying myself every minute of the day. <laughs> and and uh, it, it's not, I don't prescribe it for other people. And occasionally I, well, not so occasionally, but I, I see things in the painting, you know, I think, well, I should have done that differently, and I go back and paint it over, and, and uh, it's, it's satisfying. And uh, who knows why human beings react in that manner, but I, I do know what makes me happy and what doesn't make me happy. Uh, and uh, I found what makes me happy, so why in the world would I change it? <laughs> so that's, uh, that's a short answer to a question that I can't remember what it was. <laughs> <laughs> Given those inflationary trends have continued and in some cases accelerated since last year's meeting, could you comment on how this particular inflationary period ranks among previous such periods in the United States, like the 1970s and 1980s, and what can American businesses and citizens do to reduce the negative impacts that inflation brings about? Well, we've sort of attacked the, what you do yourself. And, and you, know, you develop skills that, that people are willing to pay for in the future, regardless of what the unit of exchange is. But, uh, but in terms of inflation in our own businesses, it's extraordinary how much we've seen. You know, with, uh, the, I think you interviewed Herb Blumpkin at the Furniture Mart, and for two years, uh, you know, the prices have just kept coming in higher for these things, and we, and we sell them for higher prices, and people have more money than they've had before, and uh, uh, they like to buy, and there's certain things they can't buy. It's like during World War II, you had a lot of money created, and people couldn't buy cars, and they couldn't buy refrigerators, and they couldn't even buy as much sugar or coffee or things as they wanted. They had little stamps and gasoline and all kinds of things. Well, eventually, if you get a lot of money in people's hands, and you don't have very many goods, prices go up. You can do all kinds of things uh, to, uh, you know, try and talk it down. And of course, inflation is never the same. Nothing in economics is the same the second time after it happens than the first, because the first affects people's attitudes in the second, and this, their attitudes always influence the, the, the activity itself. I mean, it is, it is an interesting phenomenon. There, there, people write a textbook, and they write, write it based on the last experience, and people read the textbook, so they behave differently next time, and they, then they wonder why they get a, they're getting a different result than they got the time before. So. Anyway, we have, we have sent out lots and lots and lots. When I say we, I mean the United States government. We have, the government has sent out lots of money to people. And at some point, you know, it, it, the money can't be worth as much as it was when there was less money out. Here's an, I'm, here's an interesting figure that uh, I think probably will astound you. Sounds to me anyway. The Federal Reserve every Thursday puts out a balance sheet. The, the Federal Reserve and Treasury, they're complicated institutions, but they do put out this kind of consolidated statement of all the various Federal Reserve banks, all these things that have entered into legislation over the years. And, and, but there's a balance sheet. And 15 years ago, roughly, um, if you look, you know, the Federal Reserve issues those notes I talked about uh, a while back, and uh, that's the one, uh, there's the current one, <laughs> and they print these pieces of paper, and they, one way or another, they got it in the hands of people. Well, the interesting thing is, people said cash is dead and all that sort of thing, you know, cashless society. Well, there were 800 billion, 
go back 10 or 15 years, there was about 800 billion of currency in circulation. And if you look at last Thursday's report, you'll see there's something like now $2.2 trillion of currency in circulation, 2.2 trillion. Now there's about, um, there's 300, well, there's 300, there's 100, and, there's 330 million people in the United States. Let's look at it that way. And with 330 million people, and you have almost 2.3 trillion of currency in circulation, that's $7,000 per person. Every man, woman, and child, in theory, has $7,000 worth of currency. Well, you know, that isn't right, but you, but you do know that the Federal Reserve's bookkeeping is essentially right. They've got that much that's out there. I don't know whether where it is. I mean, I don't know whether it's in Russia. I don't know whether it's in South America. I don't know where, you know, I don't know whether Charlie's got it all. I mean, <laughs> it's, it's a staggering sum, you know. Cash is dead, and yet we, on average, have $7,000 for every person in the United States. Now, uh, while you're absorbing that, think for a moment what would happen if the U.S. government said, well, they work it out in private, and uh, they decide that they're going to send Federal Reserve and I'm not going to blame the Federal Reserve for this. Somebody back in Washington does. <laughs> this idea they're going to send out a million dollars to every household in the United States. And uh, there are 130 million households in the United States or something like that, you know, and, and they're going to mail you a million dollars in cash. And there were a couple of provisions attached to it. Um, one is, if you talked about it in the next 30 days, the money disappeared. So it was like in one of those old TV shows or something, and poof, disappears. And after 30 days, you could spend it. Well, all of a sudden, you've, the household wealth of the United States, Federal Reserve puts out an estimate, it was 130 trillion or something like that. So basically, you've doubled the household wealth. And all you've done is mail out people, but then you don't tell them you're doing it with everybody. You just say they won the lottery or whatever it may be. And now you've got an amount equal to household wealth. Uh, you've got a, every, on average, people have doubled it. They've got, they've got this extra 130. trillion of wealth, and uh, in a month they can spend it. Well, what's going to happen? Well, that, uh, what? prices are going to go up, but are they going to go up immediately? Well, you don't know the other guy got it. You just know you've got it, so you don't really feel like you've got to rush out and buy things. But as soon as word gets around, well, we've mailed out. If you look at the amount we've distributed, the federal government. I'm, not talking about, I'm just talking about the distribution of resources. You know, we're, we're talking numbers like that, and, and it, it affects prices. It has to affect prices. If you, had, if you had 10 times as much, if you went home and you found out you had 10 times the net worth you had yesterday, but everybody else did the same thing. It had, doesn't increase the amount of bread in the economy or the number of cars. It, it just means that the price <laughs> <laughs> the value of this is going to go down and, the, and, uh, and, and it's purchasing power. You can't buy more than exists. So it's a very strange period where we had lots of money sent out to people. One way or another, we're getting it, that, that uh, they didn't find as many places, things to buy as before. And we had supply chain disruption. We have all these things happen. But the end of it is they go out to the Nebraska Furniture Mart and they start buying things. And they do it with our other companies. And they do it uh, in very peculiar ways. And now they're buying, I mean, one thing, you know, jewelry stores were 
generally speaking, not a very good business. And, and two years ago, uh, every landlord that had a, real, a jewelry store or multiple jewelry stores in their mall, you know, was wondering how they were going to get their rent. And uh, now every jewelry store virtually is, is doing incredibly better than they ever dreamt with way less inventory because people are just come in and buy. I mean, and they don't wait for sales. You know, when they walk in the store, they're going to walk out and they're going to have bought something and uh, they pay for it. They got the money. So we are seeing an unleashing of the fact that we've just mailed a lot of money to people. One way or another, it's very indirect. And it all gets complicated when we talk about a big system, but this is what's happened. And uh, I will guarantee you that if we just, if we mail out a million dollars to every household in the United States tonight, and you don't know that it's happened, you, you know, you, you don't really expect much to happen in behavior tomorrow, but somehow, at some point, and then if you start doing it every month, we'll say, and people really know you're doing it, then they start anticipating it and buying at a time and forward. I mean, there's a million things that happen in economics. But the, the answer is we've had a lot of inflation, and it was almost impossible not to have if you're going to mail off the kind of money we've mailed off. And it's probably a good thing we did it. In fact, I think there was one point when the Federal Reserve uh, which in fact creates the money, uh, the, if they hadn't done it, your lives would be a lot worse, a whole lot worse now. And that was an important decision. And, and uh, uh, that's the way the, that's the, uh, that's why you've had inflation and, and heaven knows, I mean, it could end you can throw the country into recession. You can do all kinds of things. The country's going to have recessions, incidentally, and it's going to have depressions periodically. And, and, and things don't, things will happen differently. And you'll read a newspaper today and you'll wonder a year from now, why was I reading the newspaper a year ago? I mean, it, 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 it's, it's just the way it works. I mean, when I bought the first stock in 1942, did I know everything was going to happen afterwards? Of course not. I didn't know a damn thing. But... Uh, I just needed to have one idea, and that idea wasn't really well formed. It was just, it was just probably the way practically every kid felt about the country when we'd just gone into a war. You know, we thought America was going to win, and America was going to win then. It was going to win just generally, and and savings bonds were paying 2.9 percent. I learned that because we. We bought them. They called them war bonds originally, and they called them defense bonds, and they called them savings bonds, but they were the same thing. <laughs> and uh, uh, it's you, you print loads of money, and money is going to be worthless. Not worthless. I got in trouble doing that one time with CNBC because I said it was going to be worth separately less, but it got contracted down to worthless. <laughs> so I, I, it took me a few years to learn that. <laughs> to separate those words somehow. Uh, anyway, that's everything I know about economics and more, and Charlie can probably improve on it. <laughs> well, it, it happened on a scale this time we'd never seen before. Those checks that were just mailed out to everybody who claimed to have a business and claimed to have employees, they, they, they probably drowned the country in money for a while. And, they, and as you say, they probably had to do it. But it, it was something that had never been done on that scale before. But we had a problem we hadn't had before. Yes. Oh, no, I'm not, I'm, I'm not saying it wasn't a good no, idea. Was, I mean, in my book, Jay Powell's a hero. I mean, it's very, very simple. I mean, he did what he had to do, you know, when, when the, if he had done nothing, it would be, the, I mean, he would be, uh, you know, it'd be very easy to engage in what you would call thumb sucking then. And plenty of, I shouldn't say plenty of, but there are other Fed chairmen that would have been sucking their thumbs and the world would have fallen around them and nobody would have exactly blamed them. They would have blamed the, the virus and the Chinese and all kinds of things. Well, the really interesting company is Japan where they, first they buy back all the debt and then they start buying back all the common stocks. Now that's really weird. 
And what did they get? 25 years of stasis. Who would have predicted that? Well, nobody predicted anything. I mean, <laughs> there's nobody's predictions that we're interested in, including our own. I mean, it's very simple. The, what we do know is that we can, we can, we can deserve your trust. Uh, and there's no reason to do things that don't deserve it. And we can't tell what. But basically, we think we're trying to build a Berkshire that cannot, can't withstand a nuclear exchange, but it can withstand just about, withstand as much as then. anything that, can, that we can do anything about. And, uh, and uh, that leaves us feeling good. It doesn't leave us feeling perfect that we'd like to even promise you more than that, but we can't promise more than that. So it's, it's very simple. My question is regarding the gap rules. If you were to change it, what would you change and what it would look like? Well, I would resign the job. What would you do, Charlie? <laughs> no, it's an impossible problem because, first of all, you have to decide whether what gap is supposed to reflect, and it doesn't reflect value. But in certain cases, of course, it is important to say that this is value and so on. I mean, it is a, it's, it's, it's a convention, and it is done so that the auditor generally is protected because otherwise everybody sues everybody in this country for anything. And it's designed to uh, uh, cause people who want to report a given amount of whatever is desired by the market to largely be able to do it. I, and I, I don't know how I would write the rules. I mean, I've watched people who I would be delighted to have live next to me. You know, if I was going away for two weeks and my kids were to stay at somebody's house, it'd be fine with me if they, they stayed there. If I lost my wallet someplace and they found it, they'd, they'd return it to me. But they'd play, it, they'd play games with any number that came to them. And of course, it, it, it's a very awkward thing to be on the audit committee of a company where People are playing around with the numbers, and and they and they don't want you. If you raise a stink, you've got all kinds of problems. And I actually wrote something some years ago of four. I was kind of anticipating your question about 15 years ago, I guess. And I uh, I wrote four suggestions for questions to be asked of the audit committee. And uh, I don't know whether I was on the audit committee then of Coke or where. But anyway, I mean, it was just clear to me what was what was happening. But you had to, you really had to follow the charade, or you got in all kinds of trouble for doing that too. And so uh, I just put four questions out that that I would want to know, and they were perfectly logical questions. And and in the end, nobody adopted them. I mean, <laughs> it, it it the system was fine as it was. The auditors got sued, but not that often. And and uh, the SEC had lots of rules, and I admired the SEC enormously. I think I think the country is better off because of the SEC. But but it is a hopeless question, it's a, a question to, or problem to uh, devise rules that that people can't get around. I mean, it's it's uh, it's, uh, it's it's not. I think it was who was it that. Uh, uh, my friend that was a writer said, it's not the illegal things that are outrageous, it's the legal things. <laughs> uh, it, it's just, it's very hard. You try and it's worthwhile. You need an SEC, but the SEC can't really stop the stuff that, that you know, you would find outrageous. It, you know, it, uh, it explains, and the auditors have the same the same question. I mean, the auditors really want to, they want rules and they want processes and they want it to be so they can operate. Charlie found a, he was on the audit committee of Solomon and we had, 
probably literally millions of contracts where people put numbers in. And uh, then he found that $20 million, we had the largest auditing firm of the country then, Arthur Anderson, as I remembered. Charlie. They're gone now. Yeah, they're gone now, but they were the, <laughs> but they were the largest. And Charlie found a $20 million error, I think, one time at an audit. They called it a plug. Well, when your accountant starts talking about a plug, it's not good. Well, I'll tell you a story I haven't told before. <laughs> you saw in that movie, people who are here saw me testify in August before a subcommittee who were out to you know, get their way. And, and, uh, uh, and I, I just decided, I, you know, I was just gonna answer every question honestly and I was not gonna try and draw up anything. And, uh, so I just sat in front of them and, and, uh, and said what I knew and didn't know. And one of the things I said, which was absolutely true, is that I'd only been there 10 days or so at Solomon, but I said, I really haven't seen anything yet that strikes me as terrible in accounting. Uh, but I've been there 10 days, but, uh, but, but this guy who got us in all this trouble. So far, he's the only thing I found. I don't know what else is gonna be found. How in the hell could I know what had gone in a place that was doing you know, incredible numbers of transactions and everything? Well, uh, but I said, you know, what I've seen, the accounting strikes me as, as legit. Uh, about a month later, I was so happy I'd testified earlier, not later, uh, a very fine, CFO, and very, these are decent people. They're very decent people. And he comes in and he said, uh, Warren, there's, there's probably something you should know. And I said, well, what's that? And he said, well, 12 years earlier, or whatever it was, Solomon had merged with Fibro, which was a huge trading company. Solomon was a huge investment banking company. It became his huge powerhouse. And he said, uh, 12 years ago when we merged with them, uh, we sort of couldn't find exactly, they were on a trade basis and we were on a settlement basis. And, and they said, we, we never really figured out how to put the books together. This is the largest uh, audit company in the United States, Arthur Anderson, that's responsible for signing this thing. So we have this number and every day it moves around and it's just put in there to make assets equal liabilities. <laughs> and, and, you know, today it's 173,412,000, you know, <laughs> down to a penny, and tomorrow it'll be something different. You know, and I thought to myself, I am sure glad I testified for Congress a month ago, because I did not know then. But uh, if they ever ask, ask me again, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell them exactly what happened. That, that we just got this number that floats around every, every day, and we haven't found it in 12 years. And Arthur Anderson doesn't know where it is. <laughs> and, and, you know, you got to make the assets equal to the liabilities, right? I mean, so what else do you do? <laughs> and that's exactly what happened. And strange things happen in this world. There's one I thing think I, the name was the floating plug. Yeah. You know, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And Charlie's on the audit committee. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, the one thing I've always suggested, nobody ever wants to do this, and I can understand why, but you've got trillions of dollars worth of contracts and everything that people are putting down little numbers for every day at banks and investment banks and all over the world. I mean, commodity traders and, and at Berkshire, we, we stick down something, you know, there's certain hedging that even the, the regulators want us to do in, in terms of giving utilities, and we put a little number in. And I've, I've made the suggestion once or twice that if you really want to do something sort of interesting, you know, just get some young guy, that give him a couple of weeks, and pick the 100 most kind of complicated, long-term, you know, lots of wording, uh, derivative contracts and look at what one side who promises to do something values it at 
and look at what the other side, who also reports, you know, and, and just let them do it for 100 operations at random. I just like to know if somebody's valuing some, we're valuing a contract at 28 million, the other guy's valuing it at 33 million, to, you know, and, and you've got the same auditing firm on, in both cases, and they're, they're, they're signing their name to them. Nobody ever, I don't think anybody's ever done anything with that suggestion. <laughs> and, and it's, you know, that would be the first thing I would do, actually, if I really wanted to sort of dig into what was happening in accounting. But, but there's a lot of things in life you can't change, and, and uh, nobody is going to go looking for ways to create lawsuits and newspaper stories, <laughs> all kinds of things, and I don't blame them. But, uh, I did, I said, I brought one thing I just couldn't resist. I was hoping I'd get a question. So I'll ask it myself. Uh, I, <laughs> I was hoping to get a question that, how could be some guy be so idiotic as to propose a price that of $848.02 or whatever it was, or is, for Allegheny Court? And, uh, I mean, that, isn't that getting a little scientific, you know? <laughs> and, and of course, I did provide, when I made the offer, that it'd be $850 less whatever was paid to whatever investment banker they wanted to select Allegheny in this case. And, and they're bound to have to do it because Delaware law is developed in such a way that the directors are protected if they get expert opinions, all that sort of thing. So I, I, don't, I don't fault anybody in the system, but I just thought, it might be useful, actually, uh, maybe to Delaware judges someday, Delaware, Delaware statute makers, maybe people that are writing papers, who knows? But I suggested that, that we just, since I'm willing to pay $850 a share for the place as is, you know, if the audit fees are, I mean, if the, if the advisory fees are 10 million or 40 million, that it makes a difference to someone. And, and, uh, and it's always made a difference to us as the buyer, but that's just the way the game was. Well, there's a little history to that. And I went back, and there's been twice in the, nobody's ever paid attention to this, but, but it, uh, there's been twice in the history of Berkshire Hathaway, 57 years, twice that Berkshire was required to get a fairness opinion. And it was perfectly logical that we be required to get a fairness opinion in those two cases, because in one case, Diversified Retailing, which was a company I was invested in, in both of them that came out of our partnership, but one had a group of shareholders that were different than the other group of shareholders at Berkshire, and the two of them want to merge. So you have two companies with me being the biggest beneficiary in between. And, uh, and it really, it wasn't up to me to determine the ratio. I mean, even though I had the most involved, but, but I had a little more of one company than the other. So anyway, a fairness of opinion was required. And this has only been twice in the history of Berkshire that one was required. So naturally I went to Charlie. And I said, Charlie, you know, we do have to, I mean, Charlie told me, we, he knew it better than I did. We need a fairness opinion in this case. And uh, I said, you know, I know what's fair. You know what's fair. Sandy knows what he thinks is fair. If the three of us owned it, in 10 minutes, we could have worked out a deal that all three of us regarded as fair. But because there were public shareholders and everything, it wasn't right to do it that way. And, and the, first time, the first one, we have two of these, but the first one was uh, November 27th, 1978. And I told the shareholders, essentially, that uh, my personal belief is that both diversified and Berkshire shareholders will benefit from the merger, but I will not, I will, I will vote for the merger only if a majority of the shares, which are voted by other shareholders of each company, are voted to support it. So, I, I, which was fine. I committed myself, you know, that, that let the other people decide whether this is fair. But on top of that, 
we needed to get a fairness opinion from an investment bank with a big name and everything. And so I said to Charlie, I said, you know, these things are going for a million or two million bucks where they get some guy that they hired last week and he, he writes up a little thing and, and then we get a bill for a million or two million. They really haven't done anything. They don't, they don't know either company and you know, they, there's a million things they're not gonna know about it, but, but they're gonna write an opinion and, uh, and we need the opinion. I said, so what do I do? I go to Charlie with these kind of problems. And Charlie said, Warren, it's very simple. He said, uh, uh, pick out 10 prestigious investment banks and do exactly what I say. <laughs> so, okay, Charlie, uh, what do I do? When I call and get these 10, he says, well, put them in order, one through 10. And he said, call the guy at the top of the list and tell him you'll pay him $60,000 for doing a fairness opinion. And you know that it's an insulting price and it's ridiculous for him to do it because it'll affect what he can get from other people down the line. They'll look back and they'll say, well, Buffett only paid 60,000. Why should I pay 2 million? And it's, 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 but he said, just tell him that that's what you'll pay. And if, if they're insulted by it, which they probably should be, then that you'll go to number two and they'll offer them the same deal. And you'll just keep going down till you get to number 10. And if you don't have anybody by number 10, you've told the other people, you'll come back to number one again. And you'll say, well, I'll pay 80,000 and then you'll go down the list and everything. Well, so I picked 10 names out and number one name was Jack Shad. And Jack Shad was a, a, a friend Tom Murphy's in front of Bill Ruane's and he was running E.F. Hutton and he was, he, he was a very, very, very successful investment banker. I didn't know him as well as the others, but I'd, I'd met him through my friends. So I called up and I said, Jack, I said, I've got this crazy request. He says, only because everybody admires you so much and my friends are your friends and blah, blah, blah. And E.F. Hutton is so well regarded. I said, I'm going to do something that's I'm going to ask you something that is totally against your interest, and I fully understand the fact that you're going to say, you're an idiot to call me on this and slam down the phone. Yeah. But I said, Jack, here's, a, here's our procedure, and I described this procedure that he gets called first, and if he turns it down, then I go to Payne Weber, and then I go to the, and then I go through it. And I tell him, there's these 10 people, and if we don't get any yeses, I'm going to come back to you again, and I'll offer you 75, and we'll do the same thing until somebody says yes. Uh, and I said, Jack, you know, but you are the first call. So uh, $60,000, and it's going to screw up your business if you do this, because every client you get in the future is going to say, well, you did it for diversified retailing in Berkshire, and why in the world should we pay you $2 million when he paid you 60000 And Jack said, don't worry about it, Warren. <laughs> I can take care of that. <laughs> he says, we're in. And uh, so... We got a fairness opinion, but written uh, but for one side. And now the next call I made was to Payne Weber, and I said, gave him the same story. And uh, uh, I said, E.F. Hutton was dumb enough to take the one side for sixty thousand bucks. You know, I, I don't know why the hell they're doing it. You know, they're, they're destroying their reputation and all that. And Payne Weber said, "We'll take the other side for sixty thousand." <laughs> <clears throat> so. We have, a pers we have a thing here that describes the whole process. And they got well low. They sent out an amiable alcoholic. They well, had to do something with. Well, what they did <laughs> was they each billed us for 60,000 bucks and we paid it. That's what you get for 60,000 bucks. No, no, no. <laughs> we, we got the same thing everybody else got, yeah, Charlie. I know. And, and, and of course, Jack Shad, uh, this was 1978, he was appointed chairman of the FCC for <laughs> seven years. I mean, I mean Jack, Jack liked to do business. And, and it's true, it didn't hurt him. They paid us 60,000 and they went back and charged somebody else 2 million. 
you know, the next week. And those guys, it's all play money. And uh, so we did the same thing when we got the blue chip stamps where we were similarly conflicted four or five years later. We went back to the same two guys and there'd been a lot of inflation and everything like that. So we, we said 110,000 then. I've got the prospectus for that. And both of them said, you know, send it in. Don't worry about our other clients. We can, we can, we'll figure out some story to tell them, you know, and whatever it may be. But I just thought it would be interesting to, at some point have people realize that it's not play money. Somebody pays it. And it's a game. And, you know, it, it, it uh, but it's, it's, it's what passes muster in Delaware, and the directors will have it explained to them by the lawyers that they're not going to get sued if they do it in a certain kind of way. And, you know, it, it, it's, uh, uh, so I just decided that somebody at some point ought to point out what actually is happening in this situation. And that's why we did it that way. And, and uh, you know, it, it may go down with our earlier attempts to educate the world on the realities of finance and its various interactions and why it's better to teach your son to be an investment banker than to be an electrician, you know, or something. But uh, uh, it's, uh, uh, you've got an eccentric chairman and that's what he did. <laughs> Charlie, yeah. how do you feel about this whole matter? <laughs> it was your idea, I'm originally. <laughs> well, <laughs> It's, we're a little peculiar. <laughs> and it's not all, all the peculiarities are not bad. I talked to Charlie before. And I didn't talk to Charlie before I did it this, uh, this time. But, yeah, it. But Charlie has given me four ideas and together that on extremely practical matters <laughs> were so much. Uh, I mean, they, 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 they just changed everything. I, I think you really ought to tell them about the experience with the fraud claim. <laughs> uh, what? On the fraud claim, it, uh, you know, that, uh, the fidelity claim with the guy, you know, you had, you had the very well-known insurance company that you don't have to name names, but uh, where the, you know, you basically told them just raise the stakes uh, to, to make the the game fair. This was back in the 1960s. Do you remember that? I don't remember. Oh, well, I, I do re I remember it. Well, tell it then. Uh, <laughs> um, Charlie had this tiny little operation, which he ran as fund, also had a seat on the Pacific Coast Stock Exchange. The firm was called Wheeler Munger. It was called Wheeler Munger at first. Later, it changed itself to Munger Wheeler. And Jack Wheeler said, well, pretty soon it'll be Munger and Company, but that's okay. They, Jack Wheeler was a very interesting guy, and he had the specialist position in General Motors and a few things. And some employee stole, like, I don't know, 12,000 bucks or something like that. from yeah, the well, he hit, he hit, I remember, he hid the trading tickets. Yeah, yeah. Some, guy, some guy steals some money. And... Charlie's firm, Wheeler Marker, was required to have a fidelity bond and all these things that covered dishonest employees and all of that sort. So, this guy's clearly dishonest. He's clearly stolen the money. So, Charlie puts in a claim for $12,000 or something like that, whatever the loss was, and sends it to this very big and prestigious insurance company. And, of course, the insurance company denies this claim. They say, you know, the guy really wasn't employed, he doesn't exist, you don't have a dog, you know. I mean, the, the whole thing. And Charlie gets this letter back, and they're not going to pay the claim. And uh, so Charlie writes a letter to this very well-known, big-name uh, person that runs the insurance company. And he said, look it. He said, we have this $12,000 claim. And he said, this guy stole the money. Uh, and we thought we had an insurance policy against people stealing, the pay to people stole money. And he said, he said, we're in this very interesting position because you've got a bunch of people on the payroll and they're going to get their weekly check or monthly check, whatever they do, 
So they just say, we're not going to pay, and life goes on. Whereas I'm sitting here, and I've got my time. I've got to work on this thing, and it isn't worth the $12,000 for me to fool around with this claim against the company, and they'll appeal it and all these things. So he said, I know that you would be offended by the thought that you might be using this inequality a bargaining position to avoid playing at the claim. I, that never could be your intention. So what I suggest in order to really live up to your code of behavior is why don't we make the $12,000 claim, we'll just, we'll just multiply it by 10 and call it 120,000 either way. And if you lose, you pay me 120,000. If I lose, I'll pay you 120,000. Now it's worth my while. And uh, <laughs> he addresses the letter to the chairman and says, that's the guy. He gets a $12,000 check by return mail. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a bad lesson. He's told me two others, but the tricks are too good. <laughs> I don't even want to share them now. I may use them myself someday. Have you changed your views on Bitcoin and or cryptocurrency in any respect? Well, <laughs> I shouldn't answer any questions on the subject, but I will. <laughs> uh, you know, there's, there's all kinds of people watching this that are long Bitcoin, and there's nobody that's short, and nobody, nobody wants their windpipe stepped on. I don't blame them. I don't like people to step on my windpipe. But I would say this, that if all the people this, if the people in this room uh, owned all of the farmland in the United States uh, and you offered me a 1% interest in it and you said for a 1% interest in all the farmland in the United States, uh, pay me, uh, pay our group. Um, well, let's see. Ten million, one. Uh, pay us this bargain price, $25 billion. I'll write you a check this afternoon. $25 billion, now I own 1% of the farmland. If you tell me you own 1% of the apartment houses in the United States, <coughs> uh, and you offer me uh, a 1% interest, so I'll have a 1% interest in all the apartment houses in the country, and you want whatever it may be for it, then call them another $25 billion or something. I'll write you a check. You know, it's very simple. Now, if you told me you owned all of the Bitcoin in the world, and you offered it to me for $25. I wouldn't take it because what would I do with it? Um, I have to sell it back to you one way or another. I mean, maybe I'd be the same people, but it isn't gonna do anything. The apartments are gonna produce rental and, and the farms are gonna produce food. And uh, uh, if I've got all the Bitcoin, you know, I'm back where whatever his name was who may or may not have existed was, you know, 15 years ago. If I've got it all, he could create a mystery about it. But everybody knows what I'm like. I mean, so if I'm trying to get rid of it, you know, people will say, well, uh, you know, why should I buy some Bitcoin from you? <laughs> I mean, why don't you call it Buffer Coin? You know, make your own or something. What? Do something. But uh, I'm not going to give you anything for it. And you'd be right, incidentally. But that explains the difference between productive assets and something that depends on the next guy paying you more than the last guy got. Now, net, if you look at it, a lot of commissions have been paid, and there's, I mean, there's all kinds of frictional costs that are very real that somebody has paid to a bunch of people who facilitate this game. But whatever one group of the public has taken out, or one group of owners, has come in from other People. I mean, it's other people have entered the room and they move money around, but but no money has. There's no more money in the room. It just changed hands with a lot of maybe fraud and costs involved and you know 
a whole bunch of things. You lose, you know, you forget the numbers or get the equation. The, uh, um, you can do that with a lot of things. I mean, it's been done throughout history. Uh, certain things have value that don't produce something tangible. I mean, you can, you can say a great painting, you know, probably will have some value 500 years from now. May not, but the odds are pretty good that if it was a big enough name at some point, there will be a few things. You can find something pretty. If somebody wants to sell you a pyramid or something and you can charge the viewers, or, you know, it'll be around a long time and, and won't produce anything, but, but, but uh, people will find it interesting to go there because I've read about the pyramids. But basically, uh, assets, to be, to have value, they have to deliver something to somebody and, uh, uh, and there's only one currency that's acceptable in the United States. I mean, you can, you can come up with all kinds of things. Uh, we can put up Berkshire coins or, you know, we can put up Berkshire money or anything like that. But uh, we get in trouble, I guess, if we call it money. But uh, in the end, this is money, and, and there's no reason in the world why the United States government whose currency people prefer. I mean, we literally, there's 2.3, just under 2.3 trillion just of these little pieces of paper floating around some places. 7,000 for every man, woman, and child in the United States. And of course, most of them probably aren't in the United States. Who knows? But this is the only thing that's money. And anybody that thinks the United States is going to change to where they let Berkshire money replace theirs you know, it's out of their mind. I mean, and, uh, uh, so anyway, uh, with those few deficiencies, you know, you can, whether it goes up or down in the next year or five years, 10 years, I don't know. But the one thing I'm pretty sure of is that it, it, doesn't, it doesn't multiply, it doesn't produce anything. It's, it's, uh, it's got a magic to it. And people have attached magics to lots of things. I mean, the gold in Wall Street. You know, create magic, you know. you know. We are not an insurance company, we're a tech company. Well, they're an insurance company, but a dozen people or so have raised a lot of money. They just say, just don't pay any attention to the fact that we sell insurance. We are a tech company. Well, in the end, they wrote insurance, and overwhelmingly, they've lost a lot of money since then. It, 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 you, can, you, can, you can make up things that work well and getting money from other people, and that's why. Well, I have a slightly different way of looking at it. <laughs> I'll sell you some then. Well, I, the, in my life, I try and avoid things that are stupid and evil and make me look bad in comparison with somebody else. And Bitcoin does all three. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and in the first place, it's stupid because it's very likely to go to zero. In the second place, it's evil because it undermines the Federal Reserve System and the national currency system, which we desperately need to maintain its integrity and government control and so on. And third, it makes us look foolish compared to the communist leader in China. He was smart enough to ban Bitcoin in China and with all of our presumed advantages of civilization. We are a lot dumber than the communist leader in China. Yeah, and when 25% of the people of the country get mad because we've said what we've said today, just remember Charlie spoke last and was the most... <laughs> <laughs> the one development that I really do think is actually Important, but I don't know any way to do anything about it. But I would, my general sense, and there's no way to prove it, but I essentially believe people are now behaving somewhat more tribal than they have for a long time. And 
I mean, people are always going to be partisan and they're, they're going to have religious beliefs. They're going to have all kinds of things. But, but it, gets pretty, it gets pretty tribal. And I want to tell you, I speak from experience because I've been tribal. And, you know, we're confessing today. Uh, and, uh, you know, Nebraska football is tribal. And when I watch a television set and I see our guy step, Nebraska, step out of bounds by a foot, but somehow the ref misses it and calls it in, and then they show six replays, I'll continue to believe it was in, even though it's right in front of my eyes. <laughs> and they stepped out. You know, that's tribal behavior. And, and it's fun. I mean, <laughs> participate in uh, But it, gets, it can get very dangerous when people, one group of people say two plus two is five, and another say it's two plus two is three. You know, and they're going to give you those answers if you call them. And the interesting thing is, to me, at least, and partly because of my age, but I actually think that just from memory, uh, that the last time that the country was seen as tribal was actually when I was a kid and Roosevelt was in. Either you hated Roosevelt or you loved him. I mean, nobody cared about the fact Alf Landon was running or Wendell Wilkie was running against him. They just had these feelings. They either had Roosevelt's picture on the wall and named their kids after Roosevelt, or they hated him. And, uh, and they thought he was going to, you know, no third term and, you know, and, I mean, a million things. And the country was very, very tribal in the 30s, but Roosevelt's tribe was bigger and in my opinion, they did some wonderful things, but I happened to grow up in a household where we didn't get served dessert until we said something nasty about Roosevelt. I mean, I'm speaking. <laughs> and, I, and believe me, if you don't get dessert, you're going to say something nasty about Roosevelt. <laughs> and so you trained them young and, you know, all kinds of things. And uh, so I've been, I've seen, a, I, I, I think I've seen a period that, it wasn't that way when, you know, if, if Eisenhower was running against Stevenson or, you know, or whatever it might be. I mean, it, uh, uh, you know, people, they didn't, they didn't just, they had a partisan behavior and they had a certain amount of tribal always, but I, I, I think it, I don't think it's a good development for society generally when people get tribal regardless. I mean, it, uh, I, um, <laughs> Charlie, what tribes are you a member of? <laughs> well, in California, we have a legislature which is completely gerrymandered, so no, nobody can ever be thrown out by the voters. And therefore, the only people in the legislature are insane rightists and insane leftists. And they get together every 10 years, and there's usually six moderates somewhere in the legislature. And so they rejigger all the districts to throw them out, because neither party can stand them. Now that is government in California. Yeah. And, and you live there and you have to go back? <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> I'm sure you'll have a walk. And I you. prefer living there to living in Russia. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, who, who haven't we gotten in trouble with? <laughs> What was it, Lenny Bruce, that you say, is there anyone I've forgotten to offend you? What advice would you have for someone who's still trying to figure out what they want to focus on and find their calling? Well, that is a, it is a very interesting question because I, got, I was very, very lucky in that I, um, I found what I wanted to do because my dad happened to be in a business that he wasn't interested in, but they had a, some books down there, and I loved my dad, and I'd go down and read the books, and they interested me. And, you know, I'm, I'm glad he wasn't a, you know, a professor, professional 
boxer or something, or I, you know, I wouldn't have any teeth left or anything. <laughs> I, I, it, it, was, it was accident, just totally accident. But I do think, I do think you know it when you see it, and it doesn't mean you can follow it. I, I would tell the students as I wrote in the report, I mean, you know, find out what you love doing it. You spend most of your life doing it, and that, uh, why in the world would you want to be uh, around for a lifetime uh, working with people that you didn't like unless you had to, which sometimes happens, and uh, uh, just work for whomever you admire the most. And uh, I gave a talk at Stanford one time, and somebody showed up at Tom Murphy's office, I think, <laughs> a couple of days later. I mean, I, that person was right. And of course, it's what I did when I got out of school. I, I wanted to work for Ben Graham. I mean, that, that is, I just, I didn't care what I got paid. It didn't make any, you know, I'm, it just is, I just knew that that's what I wanted to do. And then I pestered him for three years and he finally hired me. Uh, and then I found somebody else that I'd even rather work for than Ben, who happened to be myself. <laughs> so, so, so I've been working for myself ever since, but I worked for, I had about four bosses in my life. Uh, you know, I, I had done the Lincoln Journal, with, uh, 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 oh, name slips my mind at the moment, it's a wonderful boss. It was Cooper Smith and J.C. Penney's here in Omaha, and they, they all were wonderful people. But I still preferred working for myself, and of course Charlie and I both worked for my grandfather, and, and we just didn't, we didn't find it that interesting. At, uh, uh, I, I, I never, I don't remember, how, how'd you, why'd you ever decide to go to work at the store? Charlie, Charlie worked there in 1940, I worked well, there. Well, I, I worked just for the experience of working. I didn't need the money. My father gave me an ample allowance, and I also had a private business. So uh, I was kind of working as a lark in your grocery store. 12 hours a day? Yes. As, for a lark? Yeah, as a lark, yes. Do you consider that a good investment of your time? I'm just looking back on it. Well, I had never done it before, and I wanted to have a little of that experience, and I wasn't going to do it very long. Hmm. That sure as hell wasn't the reason I worked. <laughs> well, <laughs> but I could give that young lady the advice. Figure out what you're bad at and avoid all of it. That's the way Warren and I found our provision. Absolutely, we, yeah, we, we failed at everything else. We worked at everything until we found the ideal employers ourselves. <laughs> you know, and that, that, was an organ, that was something we really admired. Was <laughs> yeah, I know, Warren said work for somebody you admire. The only one he knew was the one he was I shaving. self -employed. You see when he was shaving. <laughs> but it isn't bad advice. It isn't bad advice. I mean, who, wants this, if they've got an option. I mean, if you're, you know, Charlie went into the service and whatever year it was in the 40s and he didn't really have a choice of who he was gonna work for. And as I remember, it didn't really work out that well <laughs> who you worked for, Charlie, did it? Well, <laughs> if you stop to think about it, the two things that neither one of us has ever succeeded at one, we've never succeeded at anything that didn't interest us, right? Right. And we've never succeeded at anything that was really hard where we didn't have much aptitude for it. Yeah, and we've been doing whatever we please for yeah, six years just, now. I mean, <laughs> and we get, you know, we have fun in our way. And I'm we, just amazed. You'd think if you're smart, you could do things that don't interest you well, but you can't. Well. I've certainly got a lot of examples in my own case, but we won't get into them here. <laughs> the Berkshire Hathaway 2008 annual meeting where you talked about global oil production. At the time, you talked about major ramifications if global oil production went below 85 million barrels in 25 years. We are at the 14-year mark and global oil production looks to be 79 million barrels. At the same time, we're depleting our strategic oil reserves. Should the United States be doing something differently, and do you see consequences to these actions in the next 10 years if we do not become more proactive? 
a lot. Charlie's the expert on oil. Well, I bet. <laughs> Only compared to me. <laughs> Samuel Johnson said it's harder to, hard to determine the order of precedency between a louse and a flea. <laughs> it's hard to tell which of us is more incompetent in oil. <laughs> the, yeah, we're still competing. <laughs> I have a different view on this subject. I like having big reserves of oil. If I were running the benevolent desk of the United States, I would just leave most of the oil we have here and I'd pay whatever the Arabs charge for their oil and I'd pay it cheerfully and conserve my own. I think it's gonna be very precious stuff over the next 200 years and so and nobody else has my view, so I, it doesn't bother me. I just think they're all wrong. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, but at any rate, I, that is not the normal view. And we've been pretty flexible in our own view. I mean, actually, the, the, uh, you know, the, the federal government is serving up however many billion barrels of, of the stuff that, that entered into the economy. <laughs> and you know, it wasn't that long ago that. You know, the idea that anybody produced a barrel of oil was somehow uh, t something terrible. I mean, the, just try doing without 11 million barrels a day and see what happens tomorrow. It, it, is, it is something that everybody has a feeling on immediately. And, and uh, uh, you know, this gets into uh, a whole bunch of different uh, tribes of sorts, and, and you offend an awful lot of people if you talk in any way about it, but in, in the end, I think, at the moment at least, most people feel that it's nice to have some oil in this country than not have it, and, uh, and we're using a lot of it, and if we were to try and change over in three years or five years, I'd... I, I, Nobody knows what would happen, but, but the odds that it would work well are extremely low, it seems to me. Charlie, why don't you say something more dramatic so you'll be the one that offended the most people? <laughs> <laughs> well, if you, if you stop to think about it, the oil industry is being so vilified now, I can hardly think of a more useful industry more and I don't know about wildcatters, but certainly the petroleum engineers I, I know and the people who design our oil refineries and pipelines are some of the finest and most reliable people I know. And I see very little trouble with the oil supply thing in the United States. So I'm basically in love with Standard Oil. So, And I, I don't have this feeling that it's an evil, crazy place. Uh, I, I wish the rest of the world worked as well as our big oil companies. You two have brought tremendous joy to all of us through the years. And speaking personally, your wisdom has not only made me a better investor, but more importantly, a better, happier person. It's a privilege and honor to thank you. So Warren and Charlie, thank you. Well, that's my kind of a question. Yeah, that, that, that's <laughs> fine. Let's have more of those. <laughs> yeah, or you my, can say it again. I mean, <laughs> maybe you could sing it. <laughs> Maybe I should quit at this point. Let him um, go to it. <laughs> my question relates to share repurchases. Since you started buying back Berkshire shares in size two years ago, the repurchases have ranged between one billion and three billion per month. By my estimate, it appears that the buyback rate is about three billion per month when Berkshire's trading at a 20 or so percent discount to intrinsic value. Two billion per month at about a 10% discount and a billion per month at a zero to 10% value. Do I have that about right and approximately, uh, approximately right? And do any other factors influence the rate of share repurchases? Well, uh, after you were so nice in your introduction, I have to say that, yeah, <laughs> that you're actually wrong in the, in, in, in our, if, if somebody had offered us $50 billion worth of stock, uh, at a certain point in the last three or four, five months, uh, we'd have taken it. You know, it's, it's that simple. And 
as I mentioned earlier, we, we haven't bought any stock in April. It, it, uh, it's something that when we can do it and we know, at least we think the probabilities are very high, we certainly believe it in terms of our own evaluation and our own investment. Uh, if we think that we're improving things for the remaining shareholder, uh, we'll buy it back. And if we don't, we don't buy it back. And, and if we have the choice of buying businesses that we like or buying back stock, if the controlling factor is how much money we have, we'd, we'd, we'd rather buy businesses. And so it isn't, you know, we don't, we don't stay awake at night uh, working out formulas or anything of the sort. Uh, but we don't ever do it if we think that we're not doing something at the time. If we had a lemonade stand and Charlie and I and you owned it and the lemonade stand was making us about a buck a week or something and we divided it up and, and you said you wanted to get out and uh, uh, if you said one number, we'd, we'd have the funds in the, our little buy, lemonade company and we'd buy you out and if we didn't like the price, we wouldn't buy you out. And that's, it's, uh, it's the same way we feel. We don't, but we do feel an obligation to do things that we think are intelligent and in no way risk, absolutely no way in present any risk of financial problems under any circumstances we we can envision, it, except maybe it's something like nuclear war. Uh, you know, we will, we'll, we will do it, but it never can be that big a factor. Certain companies, well, Charlie, I think spoke the other day in connection with Henry Singleton. Uh, I think he bought back 89% of the, the company over time, and he sold stock like crazy or issued it much earlier when it was overpriced and they bought it back underpriced. But the key to that, of course, is having people think you're wrong <laughs> in doing it. So he was able to buy a ton of it. And there's some other companies that have bought a ton of it. And Berkshire isn't gonna get the chance to do that because we, we uh, if people think we're buying, the, we've got sensible shareholders is what it amounts to. If we had the same group of shareholders that own two-day puts, and they were our shareholders, we'd buy back the whole company, you know, in a, in, in a very short period of time. But it's such an easy concept to assess. I mean, the second stock I bought, I bought City Service Preferred, that was the first one. Second stock I bought was a company called Texas Pacific Land Trust. And that came out of the bankruptcy of the Texas and Pacific Railroad back in the 1880s or something like that. And they had three million some acres and they owned the minerals and they owned the surface and everything else, but it was, it was terrible land in the 1880s. But they had some kind of a charter that said to use the proceeds from land sales. Whatever it was, they were gonna buy in stock every year. And, uh, and you know, I sat there when I was 13 or 14 and I figured if I lived to be 100, I would own the whole place. Well. I haven't lived to be 100 yet, and I didn't buy the whole, I wouldn't have bought the whole place. So both calculations are <laughs> so far imperfect, but it, it's uh, been a remarkable company, just plain remarkable, because they would talk about grazing fees of $6,000 a year or something like that, you know, maybe when they had 3 million acres. And then they kept finding oil and more oil and more oil, and, and they've changed the form and all kinds of things, but they bought in stock week after week after week. And I sat there and figured out how long it would take until I owned the whole company. And, and I obviously made some improper calculations <laughs> because it wouldn't have worked that way. But uh, it, it still was apparent to me that it would be a very good idea if they had three million acres down there that they got all through with and they kept their mineral rights and all kinds of things, which they were doing. Uh, you know, a lot of at a very cheap price, it ought to work out well for anybody who sat around for a long time. And it has worked out extremely well for anybody who sat around a long time. But, 
but nobody knew that they were going to find a lot of oil, and that eventually El Paso would grow out far enough so that the, the surface lands became worth some money, that they were somewhat near El Paso. Mm -hmm. Then you had to go a couple of hundred more miles to find the next person, but that was another problem. So uh, it's, it's just so, some of the stuff is so simple, you know, but, but you know, people want to get their PhD or something, so they, they, they work out hundreds of pages and have lots of Greek letters in it and all that sort of thing. And, and you know, either you're buying, buying out your partner at an attractive price or you're not buying them out. <laughs> your price and if you got the money around to do it and the price is attractive you don't have some other opportunities you know why not do, I mean, you, you got to come out ahead by doing it and if certain other if you've got other things that are more intelligent you, you don't do it and and, it, and if it isn't intelligent on an absolute basis you also don't do it Charlie have you got anything to add to the what were you doing in 1940 <laughs> <laughs> Three, you were, in the, you were in the service. And well, I was Warren, the, we, we'd be crazy if we didn't rather enjoy having come a considerable distance from small beginnings. And to do that in good company, it's a, it's a favored life. Yeah. We've been very fortunate. Yeah. And tomorrow... Monday, I can tell you, it's almost certain that if anybody offers us, well, we share a trade of Berkshire, and we won't buy any. But, but it's also a pretty fair chance someday a lot of shares, quite a few shares, not a lot. Berkshire's got the, our shareholders are too smart. That's one of our problems, <laughs> if we want to repurchase shares. But we really don't want to squeeze it. We don't want to squeeze out anybody, but, but we also are here to do things that increase the value of, for the people who stick with us, I mean, it's uh, not very complicated, and and uh, we'll get well. There'll be times when we'll do it, and there'll be times when we won't. But it won't. There won't be any formula, but there will be the principles that I've just expressed. And and uh, and my guess is that my successor and their successor will have a similar calculation because we're looking for people that are rational and devoted to, to Berkshire. In the future, will Greg be able to act with the same spontaneity that you mentioned earlier and make immediate multi-billion dollar decisions without board approval? Well, my guess is that the board, it's just, they respond as people do, they'll be, they'll put some more restrictions or they'll have some more consultation on a lot of matters that, that, uh, or some matters, uh, then they they do with me. I mean, that, uh, uh, they won't need to, but they'll feel that they haven't had the experience, they haven't seen them as long, and then a whole bunch of things, and they'll feel that the Delaware laws protects them better, and incidentally, they don't have directors and officers liability insurance. I mean, it, it, uh, virtually every company on the New York Stock Exchange has it, and uh, uh, we just don't buy it. I mean, to, to come on the board and you're a trustee for a whole bunch of people that trust you and me. Uh, I'm talking about the directors and me. Uh, you know, fine. And the, but it, it, it's very interesting. People, people go on museum boards, you know, and they're expected to contribute. People go on college boards and they're expected to contribute money. And it's, they say it's a great honor to be on a university board or museum board or whatever, it's a great honor, and, and therefore you should raise money for us. Well, frankly, I think our board's more interesting than being on a university board or, you know, or a hospital board or something. I, don't, I wouldn't know what they were talking about in any way and on a museum board or an art board. And so in, uh, in, uh, uh, you know, the, but people have found that they can make three hundred thousand dollars a year, uh, you know, which is way more, which is enormously important to some people and is meaningless to others. Uh, and I mean, the chances are, if, if somehow they'd arranged it so that 
directors didn't get paid at all, there'd be plenty of people who wanted to be directors. And there'd be a prestigious sort of thing and all that. But, but in effect, it's, it's money I, that uh, comes very easily. I did, the whole idea of the independent director, frankly, is it just doesn't really make any sense. Okay. You don't think a director is independent who needs $300,000 He needs the money, yeah. I, I mean... He's independent I, the way a slave is independent. I am... I am going to read a few sentences which are absolutely the case. Except I'm doctoring... There's just a... I don't want, I don't want anybody to be identified, obviously, with this. And these are just... But these are word-for-word word excerpts with... No, I'm not, I'm not telling you whether it's a, a woman or a man. I'm going to use a male pronoun because it's just because it's easier. But I picked out a few sentences from a letter I received many years ago. And this letter said, I'm writing to you with a great deal of reluctance and a sense of personal embarrassment. I have tried all of the conventional means of raising the money. This person needed a couple million dollars. And I wouldn't have known the person if I saw him on the street. You know, but but uh, but he wrote this letter and said, "I need a couple million dollars." And uh, and then this is the item that I think you might find interesting. And I've kept the letter. My income is composed 100% of my board fees. Well, he ha I just looked him up and. Uh, Time. He was a director of five prestigious companies and had been directors of others and directors of, and he was going to be director of a whole bunch of things. But, but he was desperate for money and he says he's getting 100% of it for board fees. And he was an independent director, classified as an independent director at every one of these companies. Uh, and uh, it's just astounding to me uh, that uh, you know we're going to have a shareholders meeting in just a couple of minutes. We're going to we're going to start it, and uh, um, it's just astounding to me that uh, 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 in 2006 we, we own nine percent of the Coca-Cola company. I mean, maybe they gave me a free Coke. I mean. Uh, we own nine percent at Berkshire Hathaway. We can obviously cared about the future of the Coca-Cola company, and, and uh, uh, this so happened in in that year. Calpers and a few others uh, recommended that we be voted against for something or other, and and at one time there were two big institutional investors that voted because they didn't think I was independent because Dairy Queen bought some Coca-Cola, uh, or, or actually the people that had our franchise, bought some Coca-Cola. I mean, do they think I can't add things and <laughs> if we've got billions and billions and billions of dollars that, that I'm going to be compromised? And, but it's, it's just nutty. And uh, so one year, my, my, my boat fell from 90, 96%. Yeah, maybe it's 98% vote approval to 84% because uh, I forget whether it's 2004, 2000, somewhere along the line, they just decided that that I wasn't the right sort of person to be able to handle these responsibilities. <laughs> and uh, uh, um, you know, it, the idea that somebody that's an important part of their income I mean, what they want, they may want to do a lot of other good things. It doesn't, it doesn't mean they're terrible people. But if the, if the difference is whether you, uh, how you live, and in this case, whether the person might go broke, uh, uh, how in the world you can call somebody like that independent and say that anybody owns a lot of, you know, maybe Walter Scott's you know, not independent or maybe, it's just ridiculous. But it's the way the, the rules are, and we, we, will, we follow the rules, but 
Well, they don't want them just independent. Now they want one horse, one rabbit, one cow, one what, whatever. You no, know, um, I, I mean, I, I, you know, I feel like Galileo. Independence I, is not enough. You <laughs> got to have a very diverse kind of independence. Yeah, yeah, and and if you if you desperately need the money, in this case, 100% of the income coming from it, uh, you're on five of the most prestigious boards in the in the country, and 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 classify as independent on each and other, other and all you're hoping is that well, I your CEO gets called we can by another this. CEO and says, is this guy okay? And you say, of course he's okay, which means of course he doesn't cause trouble. And so he gets on a sixth board. Anyway. I know. But, all I can say is it's, it's not our idea of an independent director. No, no, it, it's all a little. Crazy, which brings us to the fact that we're now going to have our annual meeting here, and about 15 minutes we'll we'll, we'll reconvene at 3:45, and then we'll do the, uh, the the business of the meeting that is required. And uh, and you're all welcome to stay. Or and uh, uh, it's very. <laughs> We now come to, to the moment you've all been waiting for. We'll all have, we will have the annual meeting. Uh, Charlie doesn't join me for this because once or twice in the past he was caught on camera uh, sleeping. So <laughs> we've solved that one. And, uh, and uh, we're now going to have a, an annual meeting where I follow a script. And uh, you may think that's impossible, but I'll do it. <laughs> so the, the meeting will now come to order. I'm Warren Buffett, Chairman of the Board of Directors of the company. I welcome you to this 2022 annual meeting of shareholders. Mark Hamburg is Secretary of Berkshire Hathaway, and he will make a written record of, of the proceedings. Rebecca Amick has been appointed Inspector of Elections at this meeting, and she will certify to the count of votes cast in the election for directors and the motions to be voted upon at this meeting. The named proxy holders for this meeting are Greg Abel and Mark Hamburg. Does the secretary have a report of the number of Berkshire shares outstanding, entitled to vote, and represented at the meeting? On March 2nd, 2022, the record date for this meeting, there were 614,692 shares of Class A Berkshire Hathaway common stock outstanding with each share entitled to one vote on motions considered at this meeting, and 1,287,633,719 shares of Class B Berkshire Hathaway Common Stock outstanding, with each share entitled to one ten thousandth of one vote on motions considered at this meeting. Of that number, 423,719 Class A shares and 759,159,354 Class B shares are represented at this meeting by proxies returned through Thursday evening, April 28th. Okay, and uh, I will interrupt this meeting for one second to announce that we're still selling things next door and we've sold 15 boats. Uh, <laughs> so with that uh, brief commercial and uh, uh, and if anybody leaves, I will not be offended. Uh, thank you. The number represents the quorum, and we will therefore directly proceed with the meeting. The first order of business will be a reading of the minutes of the last meeting of shareholders. I recognize Ms. Sue Decker, who will place a motion before the meeting. I move that the reading of the minutes from the last meeting of shareholders be dispensed with and the minutes be approved. Do I hear a second? Second, the motion. The motion is carried. The next item of business is to elect directors. If a shareholder is present who did not send in a proxy or wishes to withdraw a proxy previously sent in, you may vote in person on the election of directors and other matters to be considered at this meeting. Please identify yourself to one of the meeting officials in the aisle so that you can receive a ballot. I recognize Ms. Sue Decker to place a motion before the meeting with respect to election directors. I move that Warren Buffett, Charles Munger, Gregory Abel, Howard Buffett, Susan Buffett, Stephen Burke, Kenneth Chenault, Christopher Davis, Susan Decker, Davis, David Gottesman, Charlotte Guyman, Ajit Jain, Ronald Olson, 
Wallace Weitz and Merrill Whitner be elected as directors. I second the motion. It has been moved and seconded that the 15 individual named in Ms. Decker's motion be elected as directors. The nominations are ready to be acted upon. If there are any shareholders voting in person, they should now mark their ballot on the motion. Ms. Amick, when you are ready, you may give your report. The ballot of the proxy holders in response to proxies that were received through last Thursday evening cast not less than 449,190 votes for each nominee. That number exceeds a majority of the number of the total votes of all Class A and Class B shares outstanding. Thank you, Ms. Amick. The 15 nominees have been elected as directors. The next four items of business relate to four shareholder pro proposals that are each set forth in the proxy statement that can be accessed at BerkshireHathaway.com. The first proposal requests that the company adopt a policy and amend the bylaws to require the chair of the board of directors to be an independent member of the board. The directors have recommended that the shareholders vote against the proposal. I will now recognize Peter Flaherty, a representative of National Legal and Policy Center, to present the proposal. Our proposal would separate the roles of chairman and CEO. Sorry, Charlie. But I would take it one step further and suggest that Berkshire remove itself from corporate America's assault on American institutions and culture. I'm proud to say I'm a capitalist, but it is obvious to me that capitalism is failing to deliver for the American people. Real wages have been falling for years. Wealth disparity has never been greater. And right outside my hotel window here in Omaha is a homeless encampment, an all too familiar sight in American cities. We don't have a free economy, we have bailout capitalism. When small businesses lose money, they go out of business. But when billionaires bet wrong, government steps in. Money printing by the Federal Reserve and irresponsible, debt-fueled spending by politicians, what they call fiscal stimulus, have artificially inflated asset values. So those with the most assets benefit the most. Wage earners get ruinous inflation. But even worse than the wealth gap is the values gap. The top 1% now seek to impose their corrupt morality upon the rest of us, whether it's in the form of critical race theory, transgenderism, and or the myriad of other woke causes that permeate corporate advertising and messaging. Why has corporate America embraced both economic and cultural radicalism? It's pretty simple. When you have so much money, your fortune is going to come under scrutiny. The best way to insulate yourself and keep anti-business off your back is to embrace their causes even if in the process you undermine the system that produces your wealth. That is what allowed Mr. Buffett to advocate for higher taxes, even though they will fall in the middle class. The Federal Reserve has offered free money to corporate America for over a decade now, creating a class of oligarchs and greatly enhancing corporate political power. Executives now believe that they can tell elected governors and legislators what to do as we've seen in Indiana, Georgia, Texas, and Florida. Last year, Coca-Cola CEO James Quincy, a British citizen, sought to kill Georgia's new voter integrity law by making inaccurate and inflammatory statements about it. He also instituted diversity training, whereby white employees were encouraged to try to be less white. Despite being Coke's most celebrated shareholder, Warren Buffett is nothing about Quincy. In fact, Mr. Buffett jumped on the America is Racist bandwagon by signing a statement by corporate leaders suggesting that Republicans seek to extract ballot access based on race. All this did not prevent Coe from sponsoring the Winter Olympics in China, which has never had a free election, and where minority communities are the victims of genocidal policies. And what about Apple? A large part of Apple's supply chain is in China. The company removes apps from the App Store at the request of the Chinese government because they are used by human rights activists. 
And of course, Apple is the world's most successful corporate tax minimizer, famous for routing profits through offshore tax shelters. Over at American Express, the company instituted an anti-racist initiative for employees that teaches that capitalism is fundamentally racist and requires workers to engage in an exercise to determine whether they are the oppressor or the oppressed. Activism by woke CEOs may be reaching its limits. The people of Florida are fighting back against Disney's Robert Chapek, who not only embraces the view that gender is a form of oppression, but that kindergartens must be forced to confront it. Mr. Buffett has praised the brand endurance of Disney's characters and the trust parents place in its content to be safe and appropriate for children. But now the company is adding warnings to Dumbo, Peter Pan, and Aladdin about the stereotypes they allegedly portray. And poor Prince Charming has been excised for kissing Snow White, quote, unquote, without consent. Warren Buffett is yet to address the crisis dripping corporate America, and I fear he never will. Yes, Berkshire may be a holding company, and Mr. Buffett may stay out of the way of managers. But what happens when these executives use their companies to wage a social revolution that most Americans don't want? Is he not responsible? He can't have it both ways. In this country, wealth has been admired and even celebrated because our system allows anyone to become rich. But what happens when Americans suddenly find their history and future under attack by corporate America? The social compact that permits such affluence will be broken. Mr. Buffett, if you are the face of the capitalism, why don't you do something to save it? Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Flaherty. <laughs> well, uh, if uh, there are any shareholders um, voting in person, they should now should mark their ballot on the motion. Ms. Amick, when you're ready, you may give your report. The ballot of the proxy holders in response to proxies that were received through last Thursday evening cast 72,298 votes for the motion and 421,000 181 votes against the motion. As, as, as the number of votes against the motion exceeds a majority of the number of votes of all Class A and Class B shares properly cast on the matter, the motion has failed. Thank you, Ms. Amick. The proposal failed. Um, the second proposal, second proposal re requests that the company publish an annual assessment addressing of the company manages physical and transitional climate-related risks and opportunities. The directors have recommended the shareholders vote against the proposal. I now, will now recognize Tim Humans, a representative of Federated Hermason, to present the proposal. EOS CalPERS and CDPQ co-sponsored a similar proposal last year, asking the company to commence climate-related risk reporting. Thank you. Um, I, I, I do think it's worth discussing just a little bit uh, who the actual um, the actual constituency is of public pension plans. It, uh, generally speaking, we hear from various it's not limited to California in the least, uh, but saying, you know, they're protecting their, their, the holders of the pensions and the retired people and all of that. And uh, therefore, they're, they're usually suggesting that something that we may or may not agree with in terms of whether it's actually in the economic interest. But, but they do, and they honestly feel, incidentally, that they are representing the pension holders. People are getting, going to get these checks every month now, they're getting them now, they may get them later. It's a very understandable position. But of course, in essence, that's not who they represent. Uh, the, the people that are promised the pensions, whether it's in California or any other state in the union, they're going to get their checks. 
It's, it's obvious. The United States, American people, people of California, are simply not going to stand for the fact that people don't get their checks. So one way or another, they're going to get their checks. And the, to the extent possible, the states will attempt to realize from the taxpayers of the state in the future enough money so they can pay the checks. I mean, that's why as states have adopted pension plans and that sort of thing, and many of the states have found their taxes to go up. I mean, in effect, no state government, uh, public opinion in the United States, they're not going to allow people not to get their pension checks. And the state does have the right to tax income and property and various things of people within their state, and they'll exercise the power or they'll look to the federal government for grants, or they'll do anything, but the one thing they aren't going to do is stiff the pensioners. So you're probably representing, if you're uh, on a public pension board, you're, you're, you essentially are, are representing the, the future taxpayers of the state. Now, there's one problem about future taxpayers, they can leave the state. And it gets awkward in certain states, particularly when people start leaving the state because the revenue that goes with those people from income taxes and sales tax and so on. So people have a fair amount of freedom of movement. They don't feel the same way about U.S. taxes. Not very many people are going to move from one place to another, but they may even be, in the United States, they move. And it's gradual. Sometimes it isn't so gradual. And of course, as the tax base goes down, the past pensions stay. So they become kind of like an aging steel company or something of the sort that, uh, whatever it may be, uh, where the pension pens may become insolvent, but they're going to keep paying the people, just like we're paying on, you know, we've adopted certain policies on, on multi-employer pension plans and so on in the country. The United States is not going to stiff a bunch of people, particularly people that vote, and, but they're, the moral feeling is to do it. So uh, the real, the people that are, that, that the trustees should be worried about because they, of course, is the future taxpayers. And if they really mess things up, uh, those taxpayers become more and more likely to leave, and it has a lot of effects. Interestingly enough, you know, one of the calculations that might go on in Berkshire's mind if we're going to build a plant someplace that's going to sit there for 50 years is whether there are going to be any people around that are going to pay the tax and we can't move our plant. <laughs> so all these invisible decisions go on all the time. And uh, 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 it, I don't think there's anything wrong with representing the, the taxpayers of the future. I don't think there's anything wrong with... Uh, uh, sitting on a pension board, but I, I do think you ought, they ought to actually figure out who really is, uh, they really are representing, and they're representing future, future taxpayers, and in some cases, they're creating some tremendous problems for future taxpayers, because they're like politicians. So, I mean, they, you know, they've got promises they're going to fill, fulfill, but they've got to do it from revenue that comes in in the future and they can't print money, and people can leave their state. So it's, it's an interesting set of, set of problems. And uh, uh, I can't resist mentioning, in 1991, you've seen that Sol Solomon tape, uh, when Solomon was essentially, might or might not have gone down the drain, and. Uh, and had a bankruptcy, which was, in my opinion, would have spread like wildfire. And uh, and uh, um, who knows what would have happened? Just like in 2008 and 9, you know, when Lehman fell on a few things. I mean, who knows what's going to happen after something like that? So Solomon was bigger, relatively by far, than, than Lehman was in 2008 and 9. And on a Sunday in August the Treasury Department, 
the Securities Exchange Commission, the Federal Reserve, all decided on a Sunday that something they did on Sunday morning really was a mistake and that they better change it on a Sunday or the whole economic system might go down the tubes. And in this book, which we have for sale out here, the other trillion dollar triage, in the first early page, it, it describes that period. I didn't know some of the stuff that's in the book even that was going on, but essentially the Federal Reserve, Alan Greenspan was brought in one time, uh, uh, Jerry Corrigan was there, Nick Brady was Secretary of the Treasury. They decided with various degrees of conviction, but they did decide, because they had to decide by roughly 2.30 in the afternoon whether something they did at 10 o'clock, which was kind of unprecedented, they were gonna reverse themselves. Now can you imagine trying to get institutions like Federal Reserve and the Treasury Department to reverse themselves, but they did realize that they had probably done something that was going to cause a huge bankruptcy, which could turn into a whirlwind in Wall Street. So they reversed themselves and tells the story in this trillion dollar triage. And I knew some of what was going on. There was other parts I didn't know what was going on. Anyway, all of those institutions reversed themselves very reluctantly. Big institutions do not like to reverse themselves, and they particularly not four hours later when some guy from Omaha is talking, if they, if, they, if they do this, we're gonna declare bankruptcy in, in Tokyo because we're gonna have a multi-billion dollar run and we can't pay it, and directors who, who approve preferential payments when they know the place is going bust, have all kinds of legal liability, and the whole thing was falling apart. And, and, and to their credit, enormous credit, you basically had the Fed and the SEC, uh, mostly it was the Fed and the Treasury, and they, they said, we just can't have this happen. It could pr produce an, uh, a national catastrophe. And for some weeks, we had about 100 and, 130 or 40 billion dollars of funding, and 130 or 40 billion dollars was a lot of money in those days. We were the, one of the three or four largest borrowers in the United States, and we borrowed daily, and we borrowed against government bonds. We had inventory there, but we only had four billion of equity, and we had 130 billion. And there was a guy, a wonderful guy, John McFarland. He was the treasurer. He slept down at the downtown. Uh, offices, or right near their offices of Solomon for days and days and days and days because a billion dollars a day was draining out. There was a run on Solomon, and it was a run that the Treasury and the Fed and the SEC did not want to have happen and it reversed themselves and everything. And a few days into it, uh, for whatever reason, but we, CalPERS was a big lender to us, and they decided they weren't going to do business with, with uh, Solomon anymore. So they were going to precipitate them. Uh, they were going to accelerate the run. On. And uh, they announced one day that they kind of approved of everything that was going on, but they just didn't want anything to do with us, even though we were giving them government bonds as security. And this was accentuating the problems for the Federal Reserve, the U.S. Treasury, and the SEC. And no one knew how it was going to come out. Uh, but they pulled and other people pulled and John McFarland st stayed downtown and kept trying to raise a billion dollars every day to pay all people in terms of ruin that was occurring. And the Fed did not want this run to get out of hand, but they couldn't give us the money. And the Treasury didn't want the run to get out of hand, but they couldn't give us money and so on. And it was, you know, it was a terrible problem. And, uh, uh, CalPERS, like you say, they, they said, well, we don't want anything to do with these guys, so we won't lend on government securities, even though the loan is good. And then, uh, a little later, 
it was sent, they sent word to me uh, that if I would come out to California and talk to the people, the trustees, that the thing would be considered. So that was, that was what they wanted uh, as part of their deal not to cause them keep participating in this run and, and take a different position. And I never would have done this for anything except for the fact that it was, it was solemn. I mean, so basically I, I got on a plane and I flew to California and I met with the CalPERS people, and I wasn't charging them anything. If I'd been charging them a lot of money, they would have paid attention, and, and they still paid attention. They were very nice to me when I went out there. And I talked to them, and, uh, and they were happy, and they clapped, and they paid, didn't pay any attention to what I said because I wasn't charging them a big fee or anything of sort. And I went back to New York, and then they started doing business with us and announced that really they had decided Solomon was fit to do business. So. I have a little bias <laughs> in terms of when they come around and they they present a present a proposal and and they say that in their proposal and this is in our proxy statement and we file this with the FCC we're not going to say it if it isn't true and basically they they make a mistake they and some other people that that uh, do this they make a mistake and say something about the the shareholders voting. Uh, it says, 2021 annual meeting, this is part of their supporting proposal, where a significant majority of non-inside shareholders supported a similar version of this resolution. Well, we say in our response, the proponent's assertion that at the 2021 annual meeting, a significant majority of non-inside shareholders supported a similar resolution is incorrect. In fact, a significant majority of such shareholders did not support the proposal. That's either true or false. And you know, I have the, the last report submitted by that same firm and that handles our material in Broadmoor, what is it, Broadbridge. And uh, it reports the number of shareholders. It's the, the last day before the voting or something like that. And it's got the, the number of, of shareholders that support us and are against us, and it's, it's four to one in our favor and something like that. And, and it just doesn't make any difference to them. I mean, it, it, it's fascinating to me that, <laughs> uh, and you know, it, it, uh, I, I, would, I would be willing to wager somebody if we could find an impartial judge, and if you go to any group you want to pick, Let's take the CEOs of the five leading utility companies in the United States, the CEOs of the 10 league, and ask them, you know, whether, whether Berkshire Hathaway Energy has been a, a leader in, in the field of renewables and so on. And they'd all say yes, but essentially you've got a, a group of people that, that uh, write us letters and say we want to be we want you to do things our way, and you've got three million other shareholders, but forget about them and spend some money on this and, and have a meeting with us, and here's our way of measuring it. And, and admittedly, we've got all kinds of information up about what we've done, and they can come out to Iowa and look around, and it is the, it is the, it is the renewables capital of the world, practically, and we're the ones that have done it. And, and uh, uh, they just, that isn't what they want. <laughs> So, I like, you know, I'm for shareholder democracy and all that sort of thing, but the answer is that the resolution, you know, they pay lots of money to somebody that probably works in these groups and they've got groups of, the, you know, they, they've got their way of doing, I get letters from, from institutions in Europe and they say, well, you know, You've got, you may have 40 pages or a history of going back to 2006 of explaining what you're doing, but here's what we, the way we want you to do it. And, you know, and, you know, how much energy is granimals, which we own, is, it, it, it's just, it, 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 you have to think, you know, as a person sitting here, and almost, you know, it, it's, 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 it's nutty, but it's, these are the rules. You get on the proxy statement under certain circumstances. Most companies, 
they don't want a lot of resolutions, so it's just easier for them to, you know, set up a department and, uh, you know, pay a bunch of people to pay attention to them, just like Warren did when he flew across the whole country because he had, it wasn't money. I just, I was worried about a, a company surviving that, that the people in Washington, the supervisor were worried about it surviving. And, and, uh, and uh, if I came, if I flew across country and, and uh, uh, paid them sufficient respect, I mean, it was kind of like the godfather or something, you know, I just bought out and then flew back. But, uh, so I, I have a certain reservation about, about uh, uh, shareholder proposals should have some meaning. I mean, I, I, it's kind of thing I argued for when I was younger, but, you know, basically it's become, uh, in my opinion, uh, there are certain items that you can put on the ballot and certain that you can't. And practically every executive in the country now, the chief executive wants to have a virtual meeting. The last thing he wants to have is shareholders and people stand up and propose things. And we'll just keep talking about it the way we see it is. And in the end, we will have a report as to the vote and uh, this time. And, and I can assure you, we're not, we're not stuffing the ballot box. This, you know, but we're not doing anything. I mean, voter fraud, you know, it, it, uh, it's not like Chicago in the old days where you waited for the cemetery vote to come in and or that sort of thing. <laughs> we, we don't count the votes. You know, we don't say where they come from. We don't know where they come from. But we can tell when two or three institutions that got huge amounts of shares, but they're one one or and they they vote a certain way and then they feel pure and they don't really what they care about is whether we check their boxes and the people that work for them a certain number of people are getting employed by them and and, and their hearts are pure but ours aren't impure <laughs> and uh, uh, with that i think we ought to uh, well I, I won't do this again but i i, I it, it just uh it's uh, it's a really interesting uh, development in terms of getting more a rules-based type of situation where basically every you know no company almost every company figures out how to negotiate with the people later and they all have con uh, a good many of the CEOs I mean they don't they just figure it's something that they endure in the business. And they, they set up a department to, to answer the questions and meet with the people and show them the proper respect and, and so on. And, and uh, you know, it's, it's um, being done to, to uh, carry through on something which I think the, uh, the substance of is, is, is pretty silly. If I thought, if I thought Berkshire Hathaway energy was behaving in a way that was bad for society, worse than other utility companies, but no company. And the reason, of course, is that we don't take dividends out of it. So we, we pub tens of billions of dollars into the business. Most, most, practically every utility pays out the dividends. And it's not the fault of the utility management. That's just a policy that's been the case in the utility industry. But they don't really have much cash left over. And we have plenty of cash, and we'll put in more cash, and we'll, we're willing to build, you know, whatever amount of transmission lines and all kinds of things that would be helpful to the country. And, and, uh, and we're doing a fair amount of it. We could do a whole lot more, and we're better positioned to do it, really, than, than any utility company in the country. And I think if you talk to other utility executives, I don't advise you to go and put them on the spot or anything, but... They would agree, but they also know that their life is easier if they just have somebody to take care of uh, people that want to be catered to, basically. And I catered to them in the time of Solomon in 1991 because 8,000 people were working there, and, and, and John McFarland was trying to raise a billion dollars a day in, in the Treasury and the Fed. And, SEC wanted us to stay alive, and in effect, uh, uh, that caused me to go and 
I pay my respects to the Godfather and I came back, but I do think a little background is kind of interesting on this. And with that, we'll, we'll ask Ms. Amick. Uh, can you give your report? The ballot of the proxy holders in response to proxies that were received through last Thursday evening cast 127,214 votes for the motion and 370,415 votes against the motion. As the number of votes against the motion exceeds a majority of the number of votes of all Class A and Class B shares properly cast on the matter, the motion has failed. Yeah, and I will just add that, you know, I got a report a day or two ago, the last report they sent me from, from this firm, and, and it's poor to wonder if I want to be glad to share it with anybody. By the way, in terms of the number of shareholders that are, number of shareholders that based on what these people in New Jersey tell me the vote was, uh, we're, we're against them. And, uh, you know, it's, and if they would reintroduce the proposal next year, I just hope they leave that line out because it, I would just uh, uh, suggest that uh, uh, somebody read what the proposal is. <laughs> <laughs> or what the facts are before they 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 spend they, they announce their proposals and all that sort of thing. Okay, well the third proposal requests that the company issue a report addressing if and if and how it intends to measure and disclose and reduce GHG emissions associated with its underwriting, insuring, and investing activities. The directors are recommended the shareholders vote against the proposal. I will now recognize Jalen Spen, representative of Whistle Stop Capital, to present the proposal. This proposal asks Berkshire to measure, disclose, and begin reducing the greenhouse gas emissions supported by its insuring, underwriting, and investment activities. In its most simple terms, the proposal asks Berkshire to take responsibility for its contribution to climate change. Thank you, Ms. Spen. The uh, motion is now ready to be acted upon. If there are any shareholders voting in person, they should now, how about a little light up here? They should now mark their proposal. <laughs> uh, their ballot on the, on the motion. Ms. Amick, when you are ready, you may give your report. My report is ready. The ballot of the proxy holders in response to proxies that were received through last Thursday evening cast 127,065 votes for the motion and 370,630 votes against the motion. As the number of votes against the motion exceeds a majority of the number of the votes of all Class A and Class B shares properly cast on the matter, the motion has failed. Thank you, Ms. Simon. Proposal fails. The fourth proposal requests the company report to shareholders on the outcome of the diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts. Directors are recommended that the shareholders vote against the proposal. I will now recognize Jalen Spann, representative of the Whistle Stop, to present the proposal. I formally move proposal number five, asking for Berkshire Hathaway to report on the outcomes of their diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts by publishing quantitative data on their workforce composition and recruitment retention, and promotion rates of employees by gender, race, and ethnicity. I certainly agree with you that, that uh, my sisters were better looking, smarter, had better personalities, and in 1930, uh, had a father and mother, teachers who love them like uh, they love me. And if I'd been born female, black, in various other countries, I would not have had remotely the life I've enjoyed. But uh, if what the people at the top believe is important in terms of how our subsidiaries behave, they certainly, there's everybody that runs any one of our subsidiaries knows how I feel. And they also know that they're in charge of their own business. And uh, that uh, we think we've got great leaders in every, virtually every company we have, every now and then, 
we find we've made a mistake, obviously. But uh, if uh, the idea that I should replace any of <laughs> the people that run run the businesses and they're doing it, I I I, uh, I just don't think that's the way to to operate. And uh, I will tell you just so that the question doesn't come up later. In terms of our shareholders, by again a four or five to one vote, vote so the owners of the Berkshire company, whether not forgetting about forgetting about A or B shares, you know, basically the big funds that uh, are worried about what their perception is, and but also may well believe it. Who knows what people's motivations are? Somebody said that the word motivation should never be used in the singular because you really don't know. But the one thing is that it's very hard to find people that uh, uh, are running big institutions that uh, you know are acting against their self-interest. Now, it doesn't mean they're acting for their self-interest necessarily. They're acting for a lot of reasons. But uh, it's something that I could... If, if you could change that in people, it would do a lot more for American Americans in the future. But you can't you basically can't change that. I mean, it's a situation of how people behave and protecting essentially their own interests and and their own interests. Forty or fifty years ago, was uh, uh, essentially to regard corporate America as a boys' club and. And that's not acceptable anymore, so they changed, but they haven't changed as much by a substantial margin in relation to to uh, to blacks. And it, uh, that's where we are as a society. But overwhelmingly, our shareholders don't don't agree with you, even though they had a chance to. Uh, you gave them a chance to express their view on it. So, uh, Ms. Amick, when you're ready, you may give your report. My report is ready. The ballot of the proxy holders in response to proxies that were received through last Thursday evening cast 123,614 votes for the motion and 373,925 votes against the motion. As the number of votes against the motion exceeds a majority of the number of votes of all Class A and Class B shares properly cast on the matter, the motion has failed. Thank you, Ms. Ammon. Proposal fails. I move that this meeting be adjourned. I second the motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn has been made and seconded. The meeting is adjourned.